Hi, my name is Nick Kennicott, and I am a humanities instructor with Kepler Education. I currently teach a course on academic research and writing, and also have a two-semester class for high school students entitled Liberty, the Great American Virtue. I first read the Aeneid many years ago in uh, my high school days, but uh, since then, in the last couple of years, uh, working on my PhD, I was able to pick up the Aeneid once again, and I'm very excited to be able to read Book 7 today. I will be using the uh, Yale University Press translation by Sarah Rudin. So this is the Aeneid, Book 7. Cayete, you as well, Aeneas's nurse, gave lasting fame in dying to our shores. The great west keeps your resting place today in glory, if there's glory in the grave. Loyal Aeneas rendered her due ritual, heaping a mound up. When the deep sea calmed, he spread his sails and left the port behind. The breezes blew past nightfall, and the white moon lit up their course. The gleaming surface trembled. They sailed close by the shore of Cirque's country. The sun's rich daughter makes secluded groves there, resound with constant singing, and in high halls at nighttime by the fragrant cedar's light, runs her shrill shuttle through the filmy weave. Groans can be heard, and roars of angry lions fighting against their chains in the late hours, and savage cries of bristly hogs and bears and pens, and howls from images of huge wolves. Once human, potent herbs from the fierce goddess gives them face and the fur of beasts saving the blameless Trojans from those grim spells, from landing in that port on deadly shores. Neptune now fills their sails with following winds, and they escape beyond the foaming shallows. Sunbeams reddened the sea. Yellow aurora shone in her rosy chariot from on high. The wind abated. Instantly, the breezes all calmed, and oars toiled in the sluggish smoothness. Now from this watery plain Aeneas saw a broad grove. There the pleasant Tiber burst through, darting with whirlpools, yellow with its sand load to the sea. All kinds of river birds and shore birds fluttered from branch to branch, around and over the channel, and their songs caressed the sky. He told his men to turn the prows toward land, and gladly started up the shady river. Arato, come, let me explain the times, the rulers, and what ancient Latium was when the foreign army first brought ships to land, in Italy, and how the quarrel started. Goddess, direct your poet. Savage warfare. I'll sing in kings whose courage brought their death, the Tuscan army. All Hesperia rallied to arms. This is a higher story starting a greater work for me. Latinus, old now, had reigned in long peace over towns and farmland. Faunus and a Laurentian nymph, Marica, we hear, begot him. Picus, father of Faunus, claimed Saturn as her father, the line's founder. By the god's will, Latinus had no male child. Sons born to him were taken in their first youth. An only daughter, sole hope of that great house, was now grown up and ready for a husband. Many from spacious Latium, from the whole of Italy, sought her. Handsomest was Tarnus, of a powerful dynasty. Latinus's consort was Arden, wild to have this son-in-law. But holy signs, each with its terrors, blocked her. A laurel, sacred-leaved, revered for ages, stood in the central high-roofed palace shrine. They say that when he built the town, the patriarch Latinus found it, offered it to Phoebus, and named its settlers after it Laurentians. Now a swarm of loud buzzing bees, amazing to speak of, crossed the clear air, occupied the treetop, quickly intertwined their feet, and in a mass hung from a leafy branch. An augur said at once, I see a column of foreigners coming, making for the same place, 
and from the same place new lords in your tower. And when pure torches smoked above the altar, and chaste Lavinia stood by her father, a fire, shocking, seemed to seize her long hair, and all her rich clothes crackled in the flame. Her regally bound hair, her crown with bright gems, kindled. She was wrapped up in a tawny light, and smoke and sparks were scattered through the palace. A frightening, marvelous sight, it was reported. Prophets foretold a glorious destiny for her, but for the people, a great war. The anxious king approached the oracle of his father, the seer Faunus, in the grove Albunia, pours down through. The king of woods, loud with its sacred spring, dark, breathing sulfur. Here all the tribes of Italy, when perplexed, seek answers. When a priest has brought his gifts, he lies on sheepskins from the sacrifices and goes to sleep beneath the still night sky. There he sees many eerie fluttering forms, hears voices of all kinds, consults with gods, and speaks to Acheron in Avernus's depths. Father Latinus sought advice in person. He sacrificed a hundred woolly sheep, then lay there resting on the spread out fleeces. Suddenly, from within the grove, a voice. My child, don't seek alliance with the Latins for your daughter, though a wedding is at hand. Foreigners will arrive, and intermarriage will raise our name to heaven. The descendants will fling the earth beneath their feet and rule it clear to both oceans that the sun rides over. Latinus didn't keep concealed the warning his father, Phanus, gave him in the still night. Rumor had winged it into all the far towns of Italy when the Trojan army moored their ships off Tiber's grassy, swollen bank. Aeneas, his lieutenants, and his fine son sprawled on the ground beneath a high tree's branches, prepared a meal, and, at Jove's prompting, sent spelled wafers on the grass to hold their food, a cereal base to pile with the woodland forage. All this was eaten. Hunger drove them further, to gnawing at the sheets of bread. Their hands, their bold jaws, now assaulted the baked discs, broad surfaces that fate had sent to them. Ulus said, Look at us, eating our tables. A mere joke, but those words were the first portent of hardship's end. His father seized on them and silenced him, stunned by the miracle, and cried at once, Hail, country, pledged by fate. Hail, faithful guardians, gods of Troy as well. This is your home, your country. Father, Anchises, now I recall, bequeath this faithful secret. My child, when you reach strange shores and your food is gone and hunger makes you eat your tables, then trust that home and rest are there. Be mindful, lay buildings out and raise defensive walls. This is that hunger, waiting till the end to put a limit to our exile. So at first light, Let's fan out eagerly from where we've landed and explore the country. What people live here? Where is their walled city? Now, poor Jove, a libation, send my father Ancus' prayers and bring more wine for feasting. Putting a verdant garland on, he prayed to the place's spirit and the firstborn goddess, Earth and the nymphs and rivers still unknown. Then night, her rising constellations, Jove on Mount Ida, the Phrygian mother in her turn, and his parents, one in heaven, one in Erebus. The Almighty Father, from the clear high heaven, thundered three times now, and his own hand struck to show a cloud that blazed with rays of gold. The word spread quickly through the Trojan ranks. The time had come to build their promised walls. Ecstatic at that great sign, they renewed the feasting, placing garlands on the wine bowls. The new day rose. The great lamp spread its light. They split up to explore the shore and borders and the city's site. Here was the Tiber. 
Here, Numicus's pooling spring. Here lived brave Latins. Ancasi's son now chose a hundred legates of various ranks and sent them to the proud walls of the king. They were to put on olive crowns and take him gifts, peace offering from the Trojans. They hurried to obey and strode there quickly. When walls would rise, Aeneas dug a low ditch on the shore and started their first settlement, with battlements and ramparts like a camp. The group arrived and saw the Latins' high homes and towers and came beneath the city wall. There, boys and flourishing young men rode horses and drill, trained chariot teams on dusty tracks, pulled tight-strung bows, hurled pliant javelins, or boxed and raced on foot in competition. A messenger rode ahead to the old king. Some towering men had come, their clothes were foreign. He ordered them, invited in, and sat on his ancestral throne in the hall's center. Laurentian Picus's huge, majestic palace soared on its hundred columns at the town's crest, revered with awe from old times in its forest. For the good omen kings took up their scepters and rods of office there. It housed the senate and sacred banquets. There the elders slaughtered a ram and sat at tables in a long row. Ancestral busts were in the vestibule. Old cedar faces, Italus and Sabinus, planter of vines, his sickle hung beneath him. The old man Saturn, Janus's double face, and all the other kings from the beginning with heroes wounded in their country's wars. On the sacred doorposts, many spoils of war hung. Curved axes, chariots in captivity with plumes from helmets, giant bolts from gates, spearheads and shields, and rams torn out of ships' holes. The famous Piku sat there, tamer of horses, shone in a short cloak with his quirinal staff, in his right hand, in his left the sacred shield. Cirque, his lust-crazed wife, armed with her gold staff and potions, changed him to a dappled bird. On his ancestral seat inside the temple, Latinus called the Trojans in to meet him and spoke to them serenely when they came. Trojans, we know your city and your race. We heard about you as you sailed this way. What do you seek? What need has brought your ships here through endless blue sea to Italian shores? If it's because you're lost or driven by storms, which many sailors on the deep endure, that you've broached our river, camped beside our port, Make us your refuge. Understand the Latins, Saturn's race. Don't do right through mere compulsion of law, but chooses to keep the old gods' ways. I do remember, though time dims the story, what old Arunican men said. Dardanus, born here, sailed through the Phrygian Ida's cities, and Thracian Samos, now called Samanthrace starting from Corythus, his Etruscan town. The starry sky's gold palace now enthrones him. He ranks among the gods and has his altars. When he had finished, Elonius answered, King, glorious child of Phanus, no black storms, no roiling waves have driven us to your land. The stars, the coastlines gave us no false guidance. We all came to your city readily, on purpose, exiles from the greatest kingdom, once, that the sun saw, voyaging from the sky's edge. Jove first begot our race in this our people, delight. From Jove's high kin our king was born. Trojan Aeneas sent us to your doorstep. How great a storm from pitiless Mycenae poured over Trojan fields when fate brought two worlds, Europe and Asia, battering together. The farthest people know this, who are cut off by the ocean with its tides or isolated in the harsh tropics centered of the five zones. Out of that deluge, though vast seas we've come, to beg a tiny home here for our gods, a harmless beach, water and air cost nothing. We will not shame your kingdom, no, your good deed will bring you lasting gratitude and glory. 
Italians won't regret embracing Trojans. By Aeneas' fate, I swear, by his strong right hand, proven in all his friendships and his battles. Many tribes, many nations have sought union or alliance with us. We approach you first with suppliant words and fillets, but don't scorn us. On the gods' prophetic orders, we have sought your country, which was Dardanus's. Apollo ringingly orders us back to the Tiber in Tuscany, to Numicus's sacred spring. Our leader sends you gifts, his poor remains of wealth saved from the flames of Troy. His father poured wine out on the altars with the gold bowl. Priam, proclaiming laws to gathered nations, held this rod, wore this holy crown, these clothes, the work of Trojan women. Elonius' words amazed Latinus. He sat unmoving, gazing at the floor, but his eyes moved in thought. Purple embroidery and Priam's scepter touched him less. He dwelt more on his daughter's wedding and her marriage. In his heart he turned old Phanus' forecast over. This was the foreign voyager fate pledged him as son-in-law. To join him as equal in ruling, his descendants would be heroes, and all the world would come beneath their power. At last he spoke in joy. Gods bless our project and their own prophecy. Take what you ask for, and I accept your gifts. While I am reigning, you'll have a rich land, you'll have wealth like Troy's. But if Aeneas has such eager longing to be my guest friend and be called my ally, then let him come. A friend's face holds no terror. I'll clasp your king's hand, make good this treaty. But you must take this message back to him. I have a daughter whom an oracle and many heavenly signs forbid me giving to a man of our race. Foreigners come to Latium, will be our sons through marriage, and the new clan will reach the stars. I think, I hope, it's this man that fate requires, if my foreboding's right. The Lord chose from the sleek three hundred horses housed in his high-roofed barn. He had one led to every Trojan there, down through their ranking, Swift mounts, and they had saddlecloths embroidered with purple and gold collars hanging down. Their trappings were of gold. They chewed gold bits. Aeneas was sent a chariot and team, a fire-breathing pair from heaven's stock. From mixed breeds, cunning Cirque had created by mating stallions stolen from her father with mortal mares. Aeneas's men rode back with Latinus's gifts and words and terms for peace. Now Jove's fierce wife was flying back from Argus, the home of Anacus in her chariot. From Pacnius in far Sicily, from the high air, she saw Aeneas happy with his fleet. They worked at building, settled trustingly, forgot their ships. She halted, pierced by grief, then shook her head, and this poured from her heart. That hated Phrygian race, their fate opposed to mine. They couldn't die on Sigrium's plain, couldn't stay conquered. Trojans couldn't burn when Troy burned. Through the fire and the onslaughts, they found a way. At last, I guess, my power lies slack and weary with its load of hatred. I even stooped to persecute their exile, harrying refugees across the ocean. The sea and sky have no strength left to fight them. What good! were the Syrtes, Cilia, vast Cherubdis. Trojans nest in their longed-for Tiber, fearing neither the deep nor me. Mars's strength destroyed the monstrous Lapithus. Jove himself surrendered Calydon, ancient town to Diana's rage. What great crimes merited such punishments? But I, Jove's mighty wife, have shrunk from nothing made every useless try, and now am beaten by Aeneas. But if my own power falls short, I'll find help anywhere I can. No scruples. If heaven resists me, I'll rouse Acheron. Fate grants them entrance to the Latin kingdom.
Lavinia must be Aeneas' wife. But I can put off these great happenings and crush the subjects of this pair of kings. Marriage, allying them, will have this price. Blood from both sides will be your dowry, child. Bellona will escort you. A fire bridegroom hasn't been born from Hecuba alone. No, Venus's child will be another Paris, a funeral torch to burn a reborn Troy. Terrible now, she sped to earth to summon Electo, the grief bringer from her dark home in hell among the Furies. In her heart are treachery, rage, grim war, atrocities. Her father, Pluto, and her hellish sisters loathe her themselves, the monster, all her dire forms and faces, all the black snakes spouting from her. Now Juno made this speech inciting her. Daughter of night, lend me your special service and safeguard my prestige. Keep it from yielding, and Aeneas's crew from buying off Latinus through marriage or besieging Italy. You can set brothers who were friends at war, destroying homes with hate, invading them with your whip, your flames of death. A thousand names are yours, a thousand torments. Rouse your genius, shatter their treaties, sow the seeds of war. War! Wish demanded started all at once. Electo, steeped in Gorgon poisons, rushed to the Latarian king's high halls of Latium and lurked there at the threshold of Amata, who smoldered with the woman's anxious anger. Trojans had come. Would they still Turnus's wedding? Dark snakes made up the fury's hair. She tossed one into the bodice and the heart it glided, monstrous and maddening to shake the whole house. Beneath her clothes it coiled around her smooth breasts. She couldn't feel it as it breathed its poison, her frenzy. As a gold chain, the huge serpent twined her neck, hung as ribbon from her headband, wove through her hair and slid around her body. The venom oozed in and the sickness started to storm her senses, wrapped her bones in fire. Before the flames engulfed her heart and mind, she spoke quite gently in a motherly way and wept. Her daughter married to a Phrygian. You'll give Lavinia to Trojan exiles, not pitying your daughter or yourself or me. At the first wind, he'll make for high seas with our girl, the lying pirate. This is how the Phrygian shepherd penetrated Sparta and hauled off Helen, lead his child to Troy. And your oath? The love you had once for your people? Your promises to Turnus, who is family? If the Latins need a foreign son-in-law, and it is fixed and ordered by your father, that every land that's free outside our power is foreign. I think, can't the gods mean that? And trace the house of Turnus from its start? Acrisius, Inacus, Mycenae's heart's blood. She found these words were useless, for Latinus was firm. And now the maddening venom slipped into her entrails, seeped all through her body. Now monstrous visions haunted the poor woman. Frenzied, she ran amuck all through the city like a top flitting under coiling whip blows. Boys in intent play in an empty courtyard send it in spacious circles. At the lash, it rushed on its curving course. The young group watches in wonder as their blows inspire the flying boxwood. No less fiercely driven, Amata ran straight through the haughty city. Pretending Bacchus goaded her, she dashed into the woods, a greater, wilder outrage, and hid her daughter in the leafy mountains to thwart, to steal her marriage to a Trojan. She roared, O oh, Bacchus, only you deserve her. She takes in hand your pliant thesis, dances around you, grows a lock of hair to give you. Word flew.
the other mothers caught her passion, which drove them from their homes out into new ones, hearts flaming, heads and necks bare to the wind, while others filled the sky with shivering howls, wore skins and carried spear shafts wound with vine leaves. Fevered Amata held a torch among them and sang her child's and Turnus's wedding song, rolling red eyes. She gave a sudden shriek. Oh, listen, mothers everywhere in Latium, if your good heart still cherish poor Amata, if the flouting of my mother rights disturb you, unbind your hair, take up these secret rites. Electo used such bacchic goads to harry the queen all through the grim, beast-haunted forest. Satisfied with the force of this first frenzy, wreck of Latinus's plans and all his household, the deathly goddess rushed on her dark wings to the brave Rutulian's town. They say that Danae, forced there by headlong south winds, founded it for Argive settlers. Ardia, it was called by the ancients, which is still a glorious name. Its wealth is gone, though. There in his high palace, Turnus was sleeping through the black of midnight. Electo stripped off her ferocious form and changed to an old woman, plowed her forehead with ugly lines, put on white hair, and bound it with a fillet and an olive twig to look like Celebi, priestess of the shrine of Juno. She came before the young man's eyes and spoke. Tunus, you let your efforts go for nothing. You watch your scepter pass to Trojan settlers. The king denies the bride your blood has paid for. He wants a foreigner to have his kingdom. They laugh at you. Take risks for nothing. Scatter Etruscan lines and end poor Latium's wars. Almighty Juno ordered me to say this plainly as you were resting in the still night. Up, then, and get the young men armed and moving from the gates to battle. Burn the painted ships and Phrygian lords who squat by your fine river. The god's great power demands that King Latinus, unless he does your will and grants your wedding, should find at last what you are like in battle. The young man answered, sneering at the prophet, The news has not escaped me as you think. The fleet has traveled into Tiber's waters. I don't need made-up panic. Royal Juna hasn't forgotten me. Your failing and oblivious old age torments you uselessly with these false fears and prophecies about the clash of kings. Your task is guarding the gods' effigies. Men who fight wars will deal with war and peace. The speech inflamed Electo. While still speaking, the young man felt a sudden terror seize him and gaped. So many snakes hissed on the fury, so monstrous was the sight. He stopped and stammered. She shoved him back, her flaming eyes assailed him. Two snakes reared from her head. She made the sound of whips, and with her frothing mouth she spoke. Just look at how oblivious I am with these false fears about the clash of kings. See, from the deadly sister's home I come with death and war in hand. She spoke and threw a smoking torch at him to lodge its black light in his youthful breast. Terror crashed through his sleep and sweat broke out to cover him and soak him to the bones. He roared for arms and searched his bed and rooms in savage lust for iron, depraved war, madness, and, most of all, rage, as a heap of twigs is lit to roar beneath a frothing cauldron. The water leaps and burns, inside their storms a smoky river and foam overflows, beyond its confines, shooting black steam skyward. Peace was profaned. He sent his young lieutenants to King Latinus, ordered arms prepared, Italy guarded, enemies thrust out. Latins and Trojans, he could face them both. He told the gods what he would give for victory. Rutulians egged each other on to fight. 
His fine and graceful youth moved some, and some his royal bloodline or his glorious warcraft. While Turnus filled his soldiers' hearts with fire, hell-winged Electo, with a new ploy, hurried to the Trojans. Scouting out the shore were Ulus, a handsome boy, stalked animals and chased them. The infernal virgins struck the dog with madness. She tossed a scent they knew before their noses to goad them on a deer's trail. This began the disaster, kindling rustic hearts for war. There was a splendid stag with widespread antlers. Together with his young sons, Tyrus, master of the king's herds and keeper of his broad plains, had taken it from its mother's teats and reared it. Sylvia, the boy's sister, lavished care on the tame thing, wove its antlers with soft garlands, combed it, and bathed it in a crystal spring. It ate its owner's food, put up with petting, and, though it roamed the woods, it made its own way back to their door, however late at night. Ulysses' ferocious dog now started it. It had strayed far from home and swum downstream, and rested from the heat beneath a green bank. Ascanius was fired by ambition and aimed an arrow out of his bent bow. A god directed his uncertain hand. The dart twanged out and sang through flanks and belly. The wounded beast took refuge at its home. Moaning and bleeding, limping to the barn, it filled the buildings with beseeching wails. Sylvia heard. She struck her arms in horror and called the hardy countrymen to help. The vicious fury hid in the still forest. Instantly, they were there, one with a charred torch, the next a club with swelling knots. What each found, rage made a weapon. Tyrus called these forces from quartering a log of oak with wedges. He turned and seized his axe in panting fury. On her lookout, the cruel goddess saw her chance for more harm. Moving to a barn's high rooftop, she sent her hellish voice out through a curved horn in the shepherd's call, which set the whole deep forest immediately echoing and trembling, clear to Diana's lake and the Nar River, white with its sulfur, and Valenus's spring. Mothers in fear pressed children to their breasts. The sturdy farmers swarmed from everywhere, answering that grim trumpet's call and seizing whatever weapons were at hand. The Trojans poured from their gates as well to help Asinius. Both sides lined up. It was no yokel brawl now with burnt stakes and hard cudgels, but a contest of two-edged blades. A blackly bristling crop of swords stretched far away. Bronze armor flashed, struck by the sun, the light shot to the clouds, as when the surface of the sea begins to whiten, slowly rising, shooting waves higher until its lowest depths heave skyward. Now at the front, the eldest son of Tyrus, young Almo, fell. A hissing arrow struck him and lodged below his throat to choke with blood the thin, soft passage of his voice and life breath. Around him many dead lay. Old Gallusus had stepped between to plead for peace, most righteous and wealthiest Italian of those days. Five bleeding and five lowing herds were driven over his soil. A hundred plowshares turned it. Equally matched, men filled the plain with fighting. The goddess's pledge was kept, war's first blood spilled. The first deaths were accomplished. Leaving Italy, she made her journey through the airy heavens and spoke to Juno haughtily in triumph. Here is your conflict sealed by dismal war. Invite them to be friends now with a treaty. I've spattered Trojans with Italian blood. I'll do more if you sanction it. With rumors, I'll spread that war is nearby towns and kindled the lust for frenzied Mars. They'll come to help from everywhere. I'll strew the land with arms. Enough deceit and fear for now, said Juno. 
They're fighting hand-to-hand with soiled motives. Chance offered weapons. Fresh blood sullies them. Venus's superior son and King Latinus can have this as a wedding and a marriage. But the father, High Olympus's king, would surely not want you wandering at will in heaven. Get out, then. I'll direct whatever action is called for now. So Saturn's daughter spoke. The other raised her wings, which hissed with snakes, and left the steep sky for her home in hell. In Italy's center, under lofty mountains, is the famous valley of Amsanctus, legend in many lands. Dark forests crowd both sides with their thick leaves. A torrent in the middle crashes through rocks and twists its frothing waters. They point a fearsome cave out there where cruel dis breathes from the holes, and Akron breaks through a poisonous pit. The fury, hateful power, slipped in, unburdening the earth and sky. Now Saturn's queenly daughter puts the last touch on the war. The shepherd's whole contingent ran from battle to the town and brought the dead. Young Almo and Galasus with his torn face, imploring gods, appealing to Latinus. To raging murder charges, Turnus added new alarms. Trojans asked to share the kingdom. Easterners, breeding in, himself expelled. The families of matrons running wild through trackless woods in Bacchic bands now gathered. For Amata's name had weight. Demanding war. Evil war. Everyone was now possessed. The omens, the decrees of fate, meant nothing. They avidly besieged Latinus's palace. Like a cliff above the sea, he stood unmoving. A sea cliff when the crashing of the storm comes. Firm in its bulk it holds. The waves throng roaring around it. Crags and frothing boulders moan, unmoving, pouring back the battered seaweed. The old king had no power to defeat their blind plans. Heartless Juno set things going. Often he called on gods in empty air. Fate wrecks our ship. A whirlwind whips us onward. Poor things, you'll make atonement with your blood. Turnus, your sin will bring harsh punishment. Too late, you'll pray and try to buy the gods off. But I've earned rest. I'm on the haven's edge and robbed of nothing but a happy death. He kept indoors and dropped the reins of state. There was a ritual in Hesperian Latium, which Alban's cities afterward kept sacred, and lofty Rome performs when war is launched, whether against Hercrinians or Gitians, or Arabs, or if it's an eastward march to claim our standard from the Parthians. There stand twin gates of war, as they are called, held sacred in the dread of savage Mars. Eternal iron and a hundred bronze bars seal them, and Janus is their guardian. When the senators resolve to fight, the council in person, in the quirennial robe of state and gabine belt, throws wide the creaking doors and gives the call to war. The fighting men follow, and bronze horns blast their harsh ascent, though ordered to declare war on the Trojans by their custom opening the deadly gates, Father Latinus shrank from touching them. He fled the hasteful task and hid in shadows. But then the Queen of Heaven, Saturn's daughter, flew down herself to force the iron war gates apart, and pushed until the hinges turned. Italy, calm and still before, now blazed. Some looked to march across the plains. Some reared wildly on dusty mounts. All called for weapons. Some used thick fat to polish shields and lances, and others ground their axes sharp on whetstones. The trumpet thrilled them. Carrying standards thrilled them. Five mighty cities made their anvils echo. Strong Atina, proud Tiber, Ardia, Christumium, 
Antime, with its towers hollowed out sturdy helmets and wove shields from bending wicker or shaped cuirasses from bronze or glossy greaves from pliant silver, forgetting their devotion to the plowshare and sickle, men reforged their father's blades. Horns blared, the watchword spread, the war had come. One snatched his helmet on the run from home. One strained to yoke his neighing team, put on his shield, gold-woven breastplate, trusted sword. Muses, throw open Helicon, stir my song. What kings were roused to war? What armies followed to fill the plains? What heroes bloomed already in that propitious soil? What arms grew hot there? You know it and can tell it, goddesses. Barely a breath can reach me of the story. From Etruria, wild Mezentius, who scorned the gods, first armed his troops and came to war. Lausus, his son, came with him. There was no one handsomer save for Turnus of Latium. Lausus, horse tamer, conqueror of wild things, who led a thousand men, what good to him, from Caeri, and deserved more in obeying his father. He deserved a better father. Next, Aventius, splendid child of Hercules, the splendid, strutted his prized chariot team on the grass. His shield displayed his father's emblem. The hydra grilled with a hundred snakes. On the wooded Aventine, the priestess Rhea secretly brought him to the shores of light. She'd mated with the god who came as victor from slaughtered Geryon to Latinian fields and bathed his Spanish cows in a Tuscan river. His son's men now were armed with spears and fierce pikes and polished swords and Sabine javelins. He went on foot himself, a lion's huge skin on his head and swept around him. Fearsome, matted, bristling, white-toothed, he came into the palace dauntingly in his cloak of Hercules. Next, from the walls of Tibur, came twin brothers, their clans named for their elder brother Tibur, Catillus and King Chorus. Youthful Argives ran at the front where spears and arrows swarmed, as a pair of cloud-born centaurs leave some high peak dashing down Homole, or snowy, Othyrus, at great speed. Towering forest yields a path. Crashing, the underbrush gives way to them. Caeclus, too, Prentice's founder, legend since then, was there. Born among herds to Vulcan, to be a king and found beside the hearth. An army came with him from far-flung farms, at high Praeneste, Juno's rural Gabi, the frigid Aeneo's bank, the stream-sprayed boulders of the Hernisi. Some rich Anagnian nurtured, some father Amesnius's river. Not all had armor or loud chariots or shields. Most of the men were slingers of pale lead. Some brandished two spears. Tawny caps of wolf fur covered their heads. With nothing on their left feet and crudely made right boots, they strode along. Mesopus, son of Neptune, tamer of horses, guarded by heaven's will from sword and fire, abruptly called to arms tribes long inactive, armies unused to war, and drew his own sword. From Fescinia's heights, Thalisci on the plain, Seractus's pinnacles, Lavinian fields, Mount Seminius, its lake, and Capena's groves. They marched in equal ranks and sang their king, like snowy swans among the liquid clouds on their way back from feeding, pouring sweet songs from their long necks to make the Asian marsh and river ring far off. No one would think bronze battle lines were massing from the great throng, but that a soaring horse cloud of birds swarmed from the ocean to the shore. Clausus, an ancient Sabine stock, led forward a huge force, 
He was such a force alone. It was his, his Claudian clan that spread in Latium after the Sabines gained a share in Rome. He led old Quirites, Amaternan's men from olive-rich Matusca and Eretium. Troops out of Valenus County walled Nomentium, Tertia's rough cliffs and Servus mountains, Casperia, Furuli, Himalaya's stream, cold Nursia. Some drank out of the Tiber and Feberus. Ortinian horsemen and whole Latin towns came, and those whose homes the Aelia cursed name passes. As many as a glittering Libyan waves when fierce Orion dips in winter seas, as many as the wheat ears scorched by spring sun on Lycia's field of gold or the plains of Hermus. Shields sounded and the earth was stunned with trampling. Halasius Agamemnon's crony, enemy of Troy, now yoked his chariot team and hastened to Turnus's side a thousand fierce troops. Tillers of fertile Massacan vineyards, men dispatched from high hills of Arunican lords, from flatlands of the Sedicini, from Kales, from the banks of Volturnus with its shallows. Rough Seticulans and an Oscan force were there. As was their custom, they had smooth throwing spears with pliant leashes, left-handed shields, and curved swords for close fighting. Nor will my poem pass over Obelus in silence. Talon in old age begat him on the nymph Sabethius, when the Telebo and Caprice were his subjects. The sun fretted in his father's realm and now had spread his power to Sarstinians and the plains of Sarnus waters, to Rufre, Batulum, and Salimni's farmers, and the apple land beneath Abella's walls. Like Germans, they had spears with barbs and weapons. Their heads were covered with bark of cork trees. Their small shields flashed with bronze, their swords with gold. Ufens was sent to war from Highland Nerse. He was illustrious, known for luck in battle. His wild Aquilian people were addicted to hunting in the woods. They lived on hard soil, plowed in their armor, constantly collected fresh loot, and liked to live on what they'd taken. From the Moravian people, valiant Umbro, the priest came also, sent by King Archippus. Lush olive leaves festooned the warrior's helmet. There was no breed of poison-breathing viper he couldn't put to sleep with chance and stroking. He soothed their rage and remedied their bites, and yet he couldn't cure a Trojan spear strike. Sleep bringing spells and herbs plucked in the mountains of the Marcians were useless for the wound. Glassy wave, Fushinus, the Angician forest, the clear pools wept for him. Verbius, splendid offspring of Hippolytus, marched there. Aricia sent her noble son, raised in Agraria's grove, around the moist shores where sumptuous gifts can win Diana's favor. When bolting horses tore apart Hippolytus through the cunning of his father's wife and paid in blood the price his father claimed, the legend holds that Diana's love and the healer's herbs raised him again up to the stars in heaven. Then the Almighty Father, in his angry at the mortal, brought from hell to light and life, struck Phoebus's son, and blasted to the sticks the inventor of a remedy so strong. But kind Diana hid Hippolytus in a home apart in the nymph Agraria's woods to spend his life obscurely in the forests of Italy with new name, Virbius. And so the goddess's sacred grove and temple bars horses with their hard feet. Horses panicked by monsters from the sea depth wrecked his chariots. His son, however, drove an eager team over the flat plain, hurtling into war. Turnus moved back and forth along the front, beautiful, armed ahead above the others. 
from his triple-plumed high helmet reared the emblem of a chimera spewing flames of Etna. Her ruinous breath grew wilder, her roar louder as battle grew more brutal and blood flowed. The golden blazon on his polished shield was Io, as a rough-haired budding cow. Such detail! Argus guarded her. Her father, Anakus, poured his stream from a silver urn. A storm of infantry came next. The whole plain was thick with shielded ranks. Argives, Arunicans, Ruthlians, and Sicilians long in Italy. Sarcanians, Labetians with painted shields, and men who plowed the uplands of the Tiber. Numicus's holy shore, Rutulian hills, and Cirque's ridge, domains of Job and Angser and Feronia, who revels in her green grove. Troops from Satura's black swamp and the valley, cold Ufian's threads the, to duck into the sea. Last came Camilla of the Volsi, with a cavalry array that bloomed with bronze. Her warrior hands were strangers to the distaff, and Minerva's task, although she was a girl, she endured combat and outran the wind. She could have skimmed the tips of grain that stood in a field and never hurt the tender heads, or glided clear across the swelling ocean and kept her swift feet dry above its surface. Men from the fields and matrons from their houses swarmed to look on in wonder as she rode. They gaped, astonished at the royal splendor of purple on smooth shoulders, the gold hair clasp. The Lycian quiver hangs at her back, the shepherd's staff of myrtle tipped with iron. My name is Emily Wells. I am one of the Latin teachers at Kepler Education. This year I will be teaching Latin 1 using Wheelock's grammar and Latin 3, which is a reader's course where students will be exposed to a variety of Roman and medieval authors. I will be reading Aeneid Book 8, translated by Robert Fitzgerald, and I'm excited about it because in it, Old King Evander takes Aeneas around and points out future sites of Rome to him. And at the end of the book, Venus brings Aeneas his armor, um, especially his shield, which has on it pictures of the future history of the Romans. So later in the Aeneid, when Aeneas goes into battle, it's like he's bearing the future destinies of all the Romans on his arms. All right, here we go. Aeneid, Book 8, translated by Robert Fitzgerald, Arcadian Allies. That day when Turnus raised the flag of war over Laurentum Tower, and his trumpets blared horse-throated, when he laid the whip on fiery teams, making bright armor clang, then hearts were stirred by fear, then all of Latium joined in distracted tumult, and young men grew bloody-minded, wild, the high commanders, Mesopus and Ufens, and that one who held the gods in scorn, Mezentius, from every quarter drew repeated levies and laid the wide fields waste of their field hands. Dispatched to Diomedes' distant city, Venulus went to ask for aid, to state that Trojans had a foothold in Latium, that, landing there, Aeneas had brought in his conquered gods and claimed to be a king called for by destiny, that many tribes made leagues with the Dardanian, and his name reverberated far and wide through Latium. What he might build on this first enterprise, what he desired as outcomes of the war, should fortune favor him. That would be clearer to Diomedes than to either king, Turnus or Latinus. Thus affairs took shape in Latium, and Laomedon's heir, who saw the whole scene, weltered in his trouble, wave after wave of it this way and that he let his mind run passing quickly over all he might do 
as wind from basins full of unstilled water struck by a ray of sun or the bright disk of moon, a flickering light plays over walls and corners and flies up to hit high roof beams and a coffered ceiling. Now it was night, and through the lands of earth deep slumber held all weary living things of bird and beast kind, when the Trojan prince, Aeneas, heartsick at the woe of war, lay down upon the riverside in the cold air, under the open sky, and gave his body at long last repose. Before him as he slept, the very god of that place, Tiberinus of fair waters, lifting his hoary head through poplar leaves, appeared all veiled in cobweb cloak of gray and crowned with shady sedge. He seemed to speak in these words to relieve the burdened man. Sir, born of heaven, in whose care Troy city now comes back to us from its enemies, and in whose keeping high and everlasting Pergama stands, you whom Laurentine soil and Latin countryside have long awaited, here is your home, your hearth gods fixed and sure. Now is no time to let go or give way to fear at threats of war. Angers that rose among the gods have passed. And I can tell you, lest you suppose this nothing but a dream, under the shoreside oaks a giant sow will be discovered, lying on the ground, with her new pharaoh, thirty young all told, a white sow with white sucklings at her teats. And by this portent, after thirty years, Ascanius will found the famous town called Alba, or White City. I foretell no doubtful matter. But just now, as to what lies ahead and how you may win through it, listen, and I'll explain in a few words. In this country, an Arcadian tribe, descended from a forebear called Pallas, colonists with King Evander, followers of his flag, marked out a spot and founded on the hills a town they named for Pallas, Palantium. Always at war with Latins as they are, join forces with them, make them your allies. I myself between my banks will take you straight upstream, so you'll make your way with oars against the current. Son of Venus, rise. Now, while the early stars of evening set, address your prayers in proper form to Juno. Melt with your pleas her menaces and anger. You'll make return to me when you prevail. I am that river in full flood you see, cutting through farmland, gliding past these banks, the sea-blue Tiber, heaven-delighting stream, my mansions here, my fountain head far north amid the hilltop cities. Having spoken, he sank away into the watery depths at the river bottom. From Aeneas, then nighttime and sleep departed, and he rose. Facing the light that fanned up in the east from the pure sun, he cupped his ritual hands to lift clear water from the stream, then spoke his heartfelt prayer to heaven. Nymphs of the springs, Laurentine nymphs, mothers of river kind, and Father Tiber with your sacred stream, take in Aeneas as your guest, at last shield him from peril. By whatever source the ponds lie that embrace you in your pity for our ill fortune, from whatever ground you well up in your loveliness, you'll be forever honored and adorned forever with gifts from me, O potent stream, great lord of waters in the west. Only be with me and give me confirmation of your will. He finished, then selected from a squadron two byremes and had them manned and armed, but something suddenly caught his eye, a sign to marvel at. Snow White in the green wood, snow white as her own litter, lay the sow upon the grassy bank where all could see. And grave Aeneas dedicated her to thee, Juno the Great, to thee indeed, lifting both sow and brood before the altar in sacrifice. Then all that night's long hours, the Tiber quieted his swollen stream, encountering his current with still water, slackened so, that like a tranquil pool or placid marsh, he smoothed his whole expanse and left no toil for oars. Once underway, therefore, cheered on, they made good speed upstream. Their tarry holes with bubbling wakes behind slipped through the water, and the waves were awed, the virgin woods were awed at this new sight, 
the soldier shields that flashed in distant air, the painted ships afloat upon the river. Oarsmen, out weary night and day in rowing, passed the long bends, shaded by differing trees and cleft green forests in the mirroring water. At that hour when the fiery sun had climbed to heaven's midpoint, distant still they saw a wall, citadel, a few housetops, the town built heavenward by Roman power, now, but meager then, and poor, held by Evander. In toward the settlement they swung their prows. By chance that day, the Arcadian king paid honor to Hercules, great son of Amphitryon, and to the other gods in festival outside the town in a green grove. With him were his son Pallas and his leading men and homespun senate. They made offerings of incense while hot blood fumed on the altars. When they caught sight of the tall ships and saw the strangers gliding through the woodland shade, rowing in silence, they were caught by fear at the sudden apparition, and all sprang up, leaving the feast. But Pallas, with high heart, forbade them to disrupt the ritual. Taking his spear, he ran toward the newcomers and called out, while still distant, from a mound. Soldiers, what brought you this strange way? Where bound? What is your nation? Where is your home? He said. Do you bring peace or war? Then Lord Aeneas from his high poop called back as he held out a branch of olive, signifying peace. You see before your eyes men born in Troy, enemy lances to the Latins, those who arrogantly attacked us in our exile. We come to find Evander. Take this message. Say chosen captains of Dardania have come proposing partnership in war. Struck by that far away great name, young Pallas called, Disembark, whoever you may be, and speak directly to my father. Come, you'll be the guest of our hearth gods tonight. He took Aeneas' hand in a strong grip, and up the grove they went leaving the river. Then, for the king, Aeneas had friendly words. Most noble son of Greece, fortune would have me make my appeal to you with suppliant bows. I have not feared you as Arcadian, or captain of Danaeans, or blood kin of the Atridae. No, my own manhood and heaven's holy words our ancestry in common and your fame through all the world have brought me here by destiny and gladly to join my strength with yours. The Greeks maintained Electra bore the founding father of Troy, old Dardanus, who sailed to the Teucrians. Electra was the child of that prodigious Atlas who upholds the heavenly sphere on a snowy shoulder. Father of your line was Mercury, whom snow white Maya bore on the cold summit of Silene. Maya, fathered, if we can trust these tales, by that same atlas, pillar of starry sky. So both our lines are branches of one blood. Putting my trust in this, I sent no legates, made no roundabout approaches to you, but have exposed myself and my own life in coming as a suppliant. The Downians, the race that harries you, now harries us in savage war. If they defeat and rout us, Nothing, so they believe, stands in the way of their subduing all Hesperia, ruling the seas that bathe her north and south. Trust us as we trust you. We have the stamina for warfare and we have the spirit for it. In difficulties, our men have proved themselves. Here Aeneas paused. For all this time, Evander's gaze had slowly swept the speaker, his eyes his countenance, and his whole figure. Now he replied, Most gallant Teucrian, how happily I welcome you and know you, how you remind me of your father's speech, the voice of great Anchises, and his look. For I remember how Prince Priam, son of old Laomedon, Salamis bound to the kingdom of Hesione, his sister, visited the cold Arcadian land. The bloom of youth was on me, I admired the Trojan leaders and admired Priam, but tallest in that company by far your father passed. With a boy's adoration, I longed to speak to him, 
to shake his hand, so I approached. Then, all aglow, I led him into Phineas Town. His parting gifts were a fine quiver full of Lycian arrows, a gold brocaded cloak, and two gold bits, those that my palace owns now. Well then, here is what you ask, my right hand in a pact, and when first light returns to earth tomorrow, I'll send you back with a fresh increment of troops to gladden you and fresh supplies. Now, since you come as friends, be kind enough to join us at our feast, one held each year and not to be postponed. Become acquainted, even so, with how your allies fare. On this, he called for dishes and wine cups already taken off to be brought back, as he himself gave the guests grassy seats and led Aeneas to the place of honor, a maple chair cushioned with lion skin. Then picked men and the priests who served the altar vied with one another to bring roast meat, to load bread baskets with the gifts of Ceres, milled and baked, and to pour out the wine. Aeneas with his Trojans feasted then on a beef chine and flesh of sacrifice. When they were fed, their appetites appeased, royal Evander spoke. No empty-headed superstition blind to the age-old gods impose this ritual on us and this feast, this altar to a divine force of will. No Trojan guest, we carry out these rites renewed each year as men saved from barbaric dangers in the past. Look, first of all, at this high overhanging rocky cliff. See how rock masses have been scattered out leaving a mountain dwelling bare, forsaken where the crags fell an avalanche. Here was once a cave with depths no ray of sun could reach, where Caucus lived, a bestial form, half man, and the ground reeked forever with fresh blood, while nailed up in vile pride on his cave doors were men's pale faces, ghastly in decay. Vulcan had fathered this unholy brute, who, as he moved about in mammoth bulk, belched out the poisonous fires of the father. After long prayers, time brought even to us a god's advent and aid. The great avenger, Hercules, appeared, still flushed with pride and spoils he took when slaughtering Geryon, the triple-bodied giant, and as conqueror he drove the giant's bulls this way before him, while the mild herds grazed in a river valley. Caucus' bloodthirsty mind, madly aroused to leave no crookedness untried, no crime unventured, turned four bulls out of their grounds, four heifers too, all of the handsomest. But, not to leave their hoof tracks going away, he held their tails and pulled the cattle backward, traces of passage thus reversed, and hid the stolen beasts in the cave's rocky darkness. Caveward, then, no sign would lead a searcher. Now when Amphitryon's heroic son had got his well-fed cattle on the move out of their pasture, ready to depart, the oxen bellowed at this leave-taking, filling the wood with protest, crying loud to the hills they left. One answer came, one heifer out of the cave depth load, out of her prison, foiling Caucus hopes. For now indeed the affront of it set Hercules ablaze with black bile of anger. Taking arms, taking in hand his knotted massy club, he ran for the mountaintop. Our people then saw for the first time fear in Caucus' eyes, as faster than the east wind he made off to reach his cave, and terror winged his feet. He shut himself inside, breaking the chain wrought there in iron by his father's hand to keep a boulder hanging. Down it crashed to block the entrance. None too soon. Imagine Hercules of Tyrans in his fury facing that wall. This way and that he turned and stared to measure every access point and ground his teeth and in his rage three times went over all Mount Aventine. Three times in vain pitted himself against the rock and rested three times, wearied in the valley. But from the ridge over the cave arose a flinty pinnacle, sheer on all sides, a towering home for nests of carrion birds. As to the left this leaned over the river, the hero strained against it from the right and shook it, till the rock-embedded roots were loosened, then torn free. 
and all at once he heaved it over. At that fall, great heaven thundered, river margins leaped apart, and the shocked stream and flood surged backward. Then the cavern, Caucus' huge domain, unroofed, lay open to its gloomy depth, as though earth, by some force cracked open to its depth, unlocked the underworld and brought to view the ghastly realm the gods hate, the abyss now visible from above, and ghosts that tremble at the daylight let in. Caught by the light and looked for, and closed in by stone, the giant bellowed as never in his life before, while from above with missiles Hercules let fly at him, calling on every mass at hand to make a weapon, raining down dry boughs and boulders like millstones. But then the monster, seeing no escape was left, wonderful to relate, belched from his gullet clouds of smoke, blanketing all the place in blinding haze that took sight from the eyes and thickened in the cave to smoky night, profound gloom laced with fire. Hercules' great heart could not abide this trick, but down he plunged headlong in one leap through the flames where the smoke billowed thickest and the cavern seized in that black cloud. Down there he caught and pinioned Caucus as the monster belched his fires in vain. Fastening on his throat, he choked him till his eyes burst out. His gullet whitened and dried up with loss of blood. Soon the black den was cleared, the doors torn off, the stolen cattle, loot their tracks denied, revealed in the light of day and the misshapen carcass dragged out by the heels. Our people could not be sated by the spectacle, but gazed long at the dreadful eyes, the face, the shaggy, bristling chest of the half-beast, his gorgeous, fiery breath put out. Since then, this feast is held, and younger men are glad to keep the memory of that day. In chief, Potitius, the founder, and the house of the Pinarii, custodians of rights to Hercules. Here in the grove, he placed this altar, ever to be called the greatest by ourselves, and be the greatest. Come then, soldiers, honor that great feat. Garland your heads with leaves, hold out your cups, invoke the god we share, and tip your wine most heartily. At this, with poplar leaves of shifting color, Herculean shade, he veiled his hair, and the leafy braided wreath hung down as the blessed wine cup filled his hand. Tipping their wine at once over the table, the others made their prayer. Meanwhile, Olympian heaven downward turned. Evening came on, and soon the priests, led by Potitius after their ancient mode, belted in furs, went round with torches. They renewed the feast, bringing a welcome second course, and heaped the altar tops with dishes. For him, at the lit altars came the salii, all garlanded with poplar, files of dancers, here of the young, there of the elder men, who praised and sung the feats of Hercules, his story, how he grappled monsters first, choking his stepmother's twin snakes, and how, again by might, he ruins tall towns in war, Troy town and then Oikalia, and endured a thousand bitter toils under Eurystheus, doomed to these by Juno's enmity. O thou unconquered one, who slew the centaurs, Pholus and Hylaeus, born of cloud, and broke the terror of Crete by thy right hand, and killed the lion under Nemea's crag. Before thee shook the Stygian lakes, the keeper of Orcus shook, sprawled in his gory cave on bones partly devoured. No monstrous form affrighted thee, even Typhoeus' self, though mountainous in arms. And Lerna's hydra, coiling about thee with a swarm of heads, attacked no guileless warrior. Hail to thee, true son of Jove, new glory of the gods. With friendly stride come join us, join thy feast. So ran the hymns they sang, and crowning all, a song of Caucus cave and breath of fire, voices that filled the leafy wood, and rang, and sprang back from the echoing hillsides. When they had carried out the ritual, they turned back to the town, and, slowed by age, the king walked, keeping Aeneas and his son close by his side, with talk of various things to make the long path easy. Marveling, Aeneas gladly looked at all about him, delighted with the setting, asking questions, hearing of earlier men and what they left. Then King Evander, 
founder unaware of Rome's great citadel, said, These woodland places once were homes of local fawns and nymphs together with a race of men that came from tree trunks, from hard oak. They had no way of settled life, no arts, no skill at yoking oxen, gathering provisions, practicing husbandry, but got their food from oaken boughs and wild game hunted down. In that first time, out of Olympian heaven, Saturn came here in flight from Jove in arms, an exile from a kingdom lost. He brought these unschooled men together from the hills where they were scattered, gave them laws, and chose the name of Latium from his latency of safe concealment in this countryside. In his reign were the golden centuries men tell of still, so peacefully he ruled, till gradually a meaner, tarnished age came on with fever of war and lust of gain. Then came Ausonians and Sicanians, and Saturn's land now often changed her name, and there were kings, one savage and gigantic, Thybris, from whom we afterborn Italians named the river Tiber. The old name, Albula, was lost. As for myself, in exile from my country I set out for the sea's end. But fortune that prevails in everything, fate not to be thrown off, arrested me in this land. Solemn warnings came from my mother, from the nymph Carmentis, backed by the god Apollo, to urge me here. Just after this, as he went on, he showed the altar and the gates the Romans call Carmental, honoring as of old the nymph and prophetess Carmentis, first to sing the glory of Palantium and Aeneas' great descendants. Then he showed the wood that Romulus would make a place of refuge, then the grotto called the Lupercal under the cold crag, named in the Arcadian fashion after Lycaean Pan. And then as well, he showed the sacred wood of Argilidum, Argos, Argus death, and took oath by it, telling of a guest, Argus, put to death. From there, he led to our Tarpeian site in Capitol, all golden now, in those days tangled, wild with underbrush, but awesome even then. A strangeness there filled country hearts with dread and made them shiver at the wood and rock. Some god, he said, it is not sure what god, lives in this grove, this hilltop thick with leaves. Arcadians think they've seen great Jove himself sometimes, with his right hand shaking the aegis to darken sky and make the storm clouds rise, towering in turmoil. Here, too, in these walls long fallen down, you see what were two towns, monuments of the ancients. Father Janus founded one stronghold, Saturn the other, named Gen Janiculum and Saturnia. Conversing of such matters, going toward austere Evander's house, they saw his cattle lowing everywhere in what is now Rome's forum and her fashionable quarter, Carinae. As they came up to the door, Evander said, in victory, Hercules bent for this lintel, and these royal rooms were grand enough for him. Friend, have the courage to care little for wealth, and shape yourself, you too, to merit Godhead. Do not come disdainfully into our needy home. Even as he spoke, he led under the gabled narrow roof Aeneas' mighty figure, and made him rest, where on strewn leaves he spread a Libyan bearskin. Swiftly night came on to fold her dusty wings about the earth. Now Venus, as a mother sorely frightened, and with good reason, moved by the menaces of the Laurentines and their hostile rising, turned to Vulcan. In her bridal chamber, all of gold, putting divine desire in every word, she said, While Argive kings lay their due victim, Pergama, waste, her towers doomed to fall and fires her enemy set. Never did I demand for the desperate any relief at all, no weapons forged by your skill and your metal. Most dear husband, I never wish to tax you, make you toil in a lost cause, however much I owed to Priam's sons, however long I wept over Aeneas' ordeals. Now, however, by the command of Jove, he has made good his landing on the Rutulian shore, and so I do come now, begging your sacred power for arms, a mother begging for her son. 
the daughter of Nereus moved you, and Tithonus consort moved you by her tears to this. Look now, and see what masses throng together. See what cities lock their gates, and wet the sword against me to cut down my own. The goddess spoke, and wrapped her snowy arms this way and that about him as he lingered, cherishing him in her swan's down embrace. And instantly he felt the flame of love invading him as ever. Into his marrow ran the fire he knew, and through his bones, as wind sometimes, ripped by a thunder peal, a fiery flash goes jagged through the clouds. His wife, contented with her blandishment, sure of her loveliness, perceived it all. Lord Vulcan, captive to immortal passion, answered her. Why do you go so far afield for reasons? Has your trust in me gone elsewhere, goddess? If concern like this had moved you in the old days, even then I might have armed the Trojans lawfully. For neither Jove Almighty nor the fates forbade Troy to endure, Priam to live, ten further years. If you are ready now to arm for war and have a mind to wage it, all the devoted craft that I can promise, all that is forgeable in steel and molten alloy by the strength of a blast fire, you need not beg me for these gifts. Have done with doubting your own powers. He said no more, but took her in his arms as she desired and gave himself, infused in her embrace, to peace and slumber. When his first repose came to an end in the mid-course of night, now on the wane, and waked him, at that hour when a poor woman whose hard lot it is to make a living by her loom and spindle pokes up the embers, wakes the sleeping fire, adding some nighttime to her morning's work, and by the firelight keeps her household maids employed at their long task, all to keep chaste her marriage bed and bring her children up. At that same hour, no more slothful than she, the Lord of Fire rose from his bed to labor at the smithy. Near the coast of Sicily and Aeolian Lipari, a steep island rises, all of rock and smoking. Underneath, a mammoth cave and vaulted galleries of Etna, burned away by blast fire from the Cyclops Forge, rumble and thunder. Mighty blows are heard, re-echoing and booming from the anvils. Calibian bars of iron hiss in the caverns. Vulcan's workshop, named for him Vulcania. To this the Lord of Fire came down from heaven. Working with iron in the enormous cave were Cyclops thunderclap and anvil fire and flash, stripped to the waist. They had a bolt in hand, such as from open sky the father often hurls to earth, this one part done, part still unfinished. First the smiths had added twisted hail, three rays, three rays of rain cloud, three of red fire and the flying south wind. Now they were mixing in terrifying lightning, fracas and fear, and anger and pursuit with flares. Elsewhere, they strove to finish a chariot of Mars and flying wheels on which he might stir fighting men in cities. Then to an Aegis, cuirass bringing dread of Pallas when aroused, they gave a polish, vying to shine the golden serpent scales the knot of vipers and the gorgon's head, for the goddess' very breast, with severed neck and ruling eyes. Put all these things away, commanded Vulcan. Cyclops under Etna, drop the work begun. Here is our task. Armor is to be forged for a brave soldier. Now we can use your brawn and your deft hands, your craft, your mastery. Shake off all reluctance. Vulcan said no more. But they, for their part, buckled down as one, allotting equal tasks to each. In streams the molten brass and gold flowed. Iron that kills turned liquid in the enormous furnace heat. They shaped a vast shield, one that might alone be proof against all missiles of the Latins, fastened it layer on layer sevenfold. Some smiths drew pulsing in and blasted out the air with bellows. Others plunged the metal screeching in fresh water, and the cavern groaned under the avils they set down. Now this, now that one, for a mighty stroke, brought up his arms in rhythm as they hammered, shifting the metal mass with gripping tongs. 
While in Aeolia Vulcan, lord of Lemnos, pressed that fiery task, mild morning light with birdsong under eaves awoke Evander, and the old man arose. He slipped his arms into his tunic and bound on his trim Tyrrhenian sandals, then by shoulder and flank slung his Arcadian blade. A mantling hide of panther, where it hung down on the left, he tossed back. Then his two awakened watchdogs preceded him out of the entranceway and kept close to their master. He went on to visit the secluded place his guest, Aeneas, occupied, and he remembered what had been said, what favors he had promised. Just as early, Aeneas had come outside, and one man had his son beside him, Pallas, the other had Achates. Just as early, Aeneas had come outside, and one man had his son beside him, Pallas, the other had Achates. When they met, they joined hands and sat down in the open court to enjoy the talk at last permitted them. The king began, saying, Greatest of Trojan captains, never while you live shall I consider Troy to be conquered and her kingdom gone. But, though our name is great, our power is slight to strengthen you in war. We are confined on this side by the river, and on that the Rutulians bring pressure on our wall with noisy forays. No, I plan for you a league with a great host, an army rich in many kingdoms. Here, by unforeseen good fortune, your salvation now appears. Fate called for your coming. No long way from here, men live in the city of Agila, built of ancient stone. The Lydians, renowned in war, in the old days settled there on the Etruscan ridges, and for years the city flourished, till an arrogant king, Mezentius, ruled it barbarously by force. How shall I tell of carnage beyond telling, beastly crimes this tyrant carried out? Requite them gods on his own head and on his children. He would even couple carcasses with living bodies as a form of torture, Hand to hand and face to face, he made them suffer corruption, oozing gore and slime in that wretched embrace and a slow death. But at long last the townsmen, sickening of his unholy ways, took arms and laid siege to the madman and his house. They killed his henchmen and threw fire on his roof, but in the midst of slaughter he escaped took refuge in Rutulian territory and got himself defended by the arms of Turnus, host and friend. On this account, Etruria's people have risen as one man in righteous anger, threatening war at once, demanding the king back for punishment. Now, I will make you leader of these thousands, Aeneas, for in fact, while ships of theirs are crowded on the shore and fret for action, calling for ensigns to go forward. Still a soothsayer of great age holds them all back, forewarning them. Picked men of Maonia, flower and heart of an old heroic race, though justly moved by your past suffering against your enemy, and though Mezentius fires you with rightful anger, no Italian may have command of this great people's cause. Choose leaders from abroad. Taking alarm at heaven's warning, the Etruscan ranks rest on their arms here in this plain, and Tarkon sends me envoys with his crown and scepter, badges of regal power. He asks that I go up to camp and take the Tyrian throne. But slow and cold old age, weakened by years, forbids command. An old man's vigor falls behind an action. I should urge my son to accept if he were not of mingled blood through a Sabine mother heir to her fatherland. No, you are he whose age and foreign birth the fates approve, and whom the gods desire. Enter on your great duty now, great heart, commander of Trojans and Italians both. I shall, besides, commit to you my palace, all my comfort and my hope, to learn with you as master how to weather battle, Mars dead serious work. May he become familiar with your actions. Look to you as his exemplar from his early years. 
I'll add two hundred horsemen, all Arcadians, picked for rug- ruggedness. In his own name, Pallas will give two hundred more. In silence after this speech, Anchises' son, Aeneas, and faithful at his side, Achates, sat with downcast eyes. They would have pondered long and grimly on the many trials to come, had not the Cytherean queen from open heaven given a sign, one utterly unforeseen, a quivering flash out of the upper air, a thunder crack, and in that instant all the sky seemed falling, as it seemed on high, a tearing trumpet gave a rumbling blast. They all looked up. Again and yet again tremendous crashes came. Between the clouds and sunlit air they saw a red glare of armor clashing, thundering at the shock. The others sat still, mystified. But Troy's great captain recognized the sound and knew the promise made by his goddess mother. Then he said, My friend, you need not, truly need not ask what new events portended. I am the man whom heaven calls. This sign my goddess mother prophesied she would send if war broke out and said, too, she would bring out of the sky arms made by Vulcan to assist me. Aye, what carnage is at hand for poor Laurentines, what retribution you will make to me, Turnus. Many a shield, many a helm, and many brave men's bodies you'll take under, Father Tiber. Let them insist on war, let them break treaties. After saying this, he rose from his high seat and first revived the fires for Hercules on slumbering altars, gladly revisiting, as yesterday, the guardian Lar and humble household gods. Likewise, Evander and the men of Troy made sacrifices of chosen ewes. Thereafter back to his ships and comrades went Aeneas, and chose among them soldiers known for bravery to follow him to war. The rest were carried effortlessly downstream on the current to bring Ascanius news of these affairs and of his father. Those Etruria bound were now supplied with horses. For Aeneas, they led a special mount, all blanketed with a lion skin, gleaming with gilded claws. Then suddenly a rumor flew about the little town that horsemen were departing quickly for the Etrurian king's domain. Mothers in fright doubled their prayers. Fear brought danger nearer, and the specter of war grew larger in their eyes. But Lord Evander clung to the hand of his departing son and could not have enough of tears. He said, If only Jupiter would give me back the past years, and the man I was, when I cut down the front rank by Prynesty Wall, and won the fight and burned the piles of shields. I had dispatched to hell with this right hand King Erulus, to whom Feronia, his mother, gave three lives at birth, a thing to chill the blood, three sets of arms to fight with, so that he had to be brought down three times. Yet this hand took his lives that day, took all, and each time took his arms. I should not now be torn from you and from your dear embrace, my son, and neither would Mezentius have shown contempt for me, his bordering power, putting so many cruelly to the sword and widowing his town of citizens. But, O high masters, and thou, Jupiter, supreme ruler of gods, pity, I beg, the Arcadian king, and hear a father's prayer. If by thy will my son survives and fate spares him, And if I live to see him still, to meet him yet again, I pray for life. There is no trouble I cannot endure. But, fortune, if you threaten some black day, now, now let me break off my bitter life while all's in doubt, while hope of what's to come remains uncertain, while I hold you here, dear boy, my late delight, my only one, and may no graver message ever come to wound my ears. These were the father's words, poured out in final parting. He collapsed completely, and the servants helped him in. And now, indeed, through open gates, the horsemen left the town, Aeneas at their head, Achates at his right hand, then the others, Trojan officers and Pallas himself mid column in short cloak with blazoned arms, 
a sight as brilliant as the morning star, whom Venus loves above all stellar fires, when from the bath of ocean into heaven he lifts his holy visage, making night dissolve and wane. Mothers with quaking breasts were standing on the walls, watching the cloud of dust, the burnished gleams of cavalry, as the armed riders picked their way through scrub cross-country toward their goal. A shout went up, and, forming into column, they rode on, hoofbeat of horses shaking the dust of the plain. Near the cold stream of Cairo, there is a grove, immense and deep, awesome to our forebears. The hills encircle it with dark fir trees. The tale goes that the old Pulaskians, who held the slatted country who knows when, made grove and feast day sacred to Sylvanus, god of the fields and herds. Not far from there, Tarkon and his Tyrrhenians had encamped on favorable ground, and one could see from a high hill the tents of all the army on the wide plain. Now Lord Aeneas came to this place with his soldiers picked for battle. Here they refreshed their weariness and gave their horses pasture. Venus, the gleaming goddess, bearing her gifts, came down amid high clouds, and far away still, in a veil apart, sighted her son behind, beside the ice-cold stream. Then, making her appearance as she willed, she said to him, Here are the gifts I promised, forged to perfection by my husband's craft so that you need not hesitate to challenge arrogant Laurentines or savage Turnus, however soon, in battle. As she spoke, Cytherea swept to her son's embrace and placed the shining arms before his eyes under an oak tree. Now the man in joy at the goddess' gifts, at being so greatly honored, could not be satisfied, but scanned each piece in wonder and turned over in his hands the helmet with its terrifying plumes and gushing flames, the sword blade edged with fate, the cuirass of hard bronze, blood red and huge, like a dark cloud burning with sunset light that sends a glow for miles, the polished greaves of gold and silver alloy, the great spear, and finally the fabric of the shield beyond description. There the Lord of Fire, knowing the prophets, knowing the age to come, had wrought the future story of Italy, the triumphs of the Romans. There one found the generations of Ascanius' heirs, the wars they fought, each one. Vulcan had made the mother wolf, lying in Mars' green grotto, made the twin boys at play about her teats, nursing the mother without fear while she bent round her smooth neck, fondling them in turn, and shaped their bodies with her tongue. Nearby, Rome had been added by the artisan, and Sabine women roughly carried off, out of the audience at the circus games. Then suddenly a new war coming on, to pit the sons of Romulus against old Tatius and his austere town of Cures. Later, the same kings, warfare laid aside, in arms before Jove's altar stood and held libation dishes as they made a pact with offerings of swine. Not far from this, two four-horse war cars, whipped on back to back, had torn Metis apart. Still, man of Alba, you should have kept your word. And Roman Tullus dragged the liar's rags of flesh away through woods where brambles dripped a bloody dew. There, too, Porsena stood, ordering Rome to take the exiled Tarquin back, then bringing the whole city under massive siege. There, for their liberty, Aeneas' sons threw themselves forward on the enemy's spears. You might have seen Porsena image there to the life, a menacing man, a man in anger at Roman daring, Cocles, who downed the bridge, Cloelia, who broke her bonds and swam the river. On the shield's upper quarter, Manlius, guard of the Tarpeian rock, stood fast before the temple and held the capital, where Romulus' house was newly thatched and rough. Here, fluttering through gilded porticos at night, the silvery goose warned of the Gauls approaching. Under cover of the darkness, Gauls amid the bushes had crept near, and now lay hold upon the citadel golden locks they had, and golden dress, glimmering with striped cloaks, 
their milky necks entwined with gold. They hefted alpine spears, two each, and had long body shields for cover. Vulcan had fashioned na naked Luperci and Salii, leaping there with woolen caps and fallen from heaven shields, and put chaste ladies riding in cushioned carriages through Rome with sacred images. At a distance, then, he pictured the deep hell of Tartarus, Disa's Highgate, crime's punishments, and, yes, you, Catiline, on a precarious cliff, hanging and trembling at the Fury's glare. Then, far away from this were virtuous souls, and Cato giving laws to them. Mid-shield, the pictured sea flowed surging, all of gold, as whitecaps foamed on the blue waves, and dolphins, shining in silver round and round the scene, propelled themselves with flukes and cut through billows. Vivid in the center were the bronze-beaked ships and the fight at sea off Actium. Here you could see Lucata all alive, with ships maneuvering, sea glowing gold. Augustus Caesar leading into battle Italians, with both senators and people, household gods and great gods. There he stood, high on the stern, and from his blessed brow twin flames gushed upward, while his crest revealed his father's star. Apart from him, Agrippa, favored by winds and gods, led ships in column, a towering figure, wearing on his brows the coronet adorned with worship speaks, highest distinction for command at sea. Then came Antonius with barbaric wealth and a diversity of arms, victorious from races of the Donlands and Red Sea, leading the power of the east, of Egypt, even of dis distant Bactra of the steppes. And in his wake, the Egyptian consort came so shamefully. The ships all kept together, racing ahead, the water torn by oar strokes, torn by the triple beaks and spume and foam, all made for the open sea. You might believe the Cyclades uprooted were afloat, or mountains running against mountain heights when seamen in those hulks pressed the attack upon the other turreted ships. They hurled broadsides of burning flax on flying steel, and fresh blood reddened Neptune's fields. The queen amidst the battle called her flotilla on with a sistrum's beat, a frenzy out of Egypt, never turning her head as yet to see twin snakes of death behind, while monster forms of gods of every race and the god dog Anubis barking held their weapons up against our Neptune, Venus, and Minerva. Mars, engraved in steel, raged in the fight, as from high air the dire furies came with discord, taking joy in a torn robe, and on her heels with bloody scourge, Bellana. Overlooking it all, Octian Apollo began to pull his bow. Wild at the sight, all Egypt, Indians, Arabians, all Sabaeans put about in flight, and she, the queen, appeared crying for winds to shift just as she hauled up sail and slackened sheets. The Lord of Fire had portrayed her there amid the slaughter, pallid with death to come, then borne by waves and wind from the northwest while the great length of morning Nile awaited her with open bays, calling the conquered home to his blue bosom and his hidden streams. But Caesar then, in triple triumph, rode within the walls of Rome, making immortal offerings to the gods of Italy, three hundred princely shrines throughout the city. There were the streets, humming with festal joy and games and cheers, an altar to every shrine, to every one a mother's choir, and bullocks knifed before the altars strewed the ground. The man himself, enthroned before the snow-white threshold of sunny Phoebus, viewed the gifts the nations of the earth made, and he fitted them to the tall portals. Conquered races passed in long procession, varied in languages, as in their dress and arms. Here Mulcaber, divine smith, had portrayed the nomad tribes, and Offrey with ungirdled flowing robes. Here Lelegus and Carians, and here Galonians with quivers. 
Here Euphrates, milder in his floods now. There Morini, northernmost of men. Here bull-horned Rhine, and there the still unconquered Scythian Dahai. Here, vexed at being bridged, the rough Araxes. All these images on Vulcan's shield, his mother's gift, were wonders to Aeneas. Knowing nothing of the events themselves, he felt joy in their pictures, taking up upon his shoulder all the destined acts and fame of his descendants. Hi, my name is Helen Howell and I am teaching a senior thesis class with Kepler Education this fall and spring. I am reading book nine from the Fagel's translation. Now, while off in the distance much was underway, Saturnian Juno hurried Iris down from the sky to Turnus, brash in arms, seated then by chance in a hallowed glen, his forebear Palumnus's grove. The messenger with her rosy lips bestirred the king. Turnus. What no god would dare to promise you, the answer to your prayers, time in its rounds has brought you all unasked. Yes, Aeneas has quit his camp, his comrades and his fleet, he's lighted out for the Palatine Hill, Evander's royal home. But, still not satisfied, he's made his way to the farthest towns of Corythus, arming a band of Tuscans, country folk he's mustered. Why hold back? Now's the time for horse and chariot. Away with delay, attack their shattered camp. She towered into the sky on balanced wings, cleaving a giant rainbow, flying beneath the clouds. And Turnus knew her and raised both hands to the stars, calling after the goddess, trailing her flight with cries, Iris, pride of the sky, who has sped you here to me, swooping down from the clouds to reach the earth? Why this sudden radiance lighting the heavens? I can see the clouds parting, the stars riding the arching skies. I follow a sign so clear, whoever you are who calls me into action. In that spirit he went to the river's edge, drew pure water up from the brimming banks, and prayed to the gods, over and over, weighing down the heavens with his vows. And next his entire army was moving out across the plain, rich in cavalry, rich in braided cloaks, bright gold. Messippus heads the column, the rear is brought up by the sons of Tyrus, Turnus commands the center. A force like the Ganges rising, fed by seven quiet streams, or the life-giving Nile ebbing back from the plains, to settle down at last in its own banks and bed. Suddenly, far off, a massive dust cloud rises, black as night, darkness sweeping across the plain. The Trojans spot it, and first from the landward wall, Caicus calls out, What's that mass, my countrymen, blackness rolling toward us? Quick, take arms, pass out weapons, mount the walls, the enemy's all but on us, battle stations! With a deafening roar, the Trojans all come pouring in through the gates for shelter, mount the ramparts now. So ran his parting orders, Aeneas, best of captains. If any crisis comes while I am away, don't risk a pitched battle, no, don't trust to the open field, just guard the camp and ramparts safe behind the walls. So, though shame and anger spur them to all-out war, still they bar the gates, they follow their orders, armed to the hilt, protected inside the turrets, bracing for the foe. But Turnus, flying on ahead of his slower column, flanked by a picked troop of twenty horsemen, gains the town in no time, borne by a Thracian charger blazed with white, and helmed in his golden casque with crimson crest. "'Who's with me, men? Who's first to attack the enemy? "'Just watch!' he cries, and hurls his javelin into the sky, "'the opening shot of war, and high in his saddle races down the plain and "'as his shouting comrades speed him on, "'riding in his wake with their war cries striking terror, "'amazed at the Trojans' bloodless hearts, and calling, "'No trusting themselves to a level field of battle, "'no braving our infantry grappling hand to hand, "'the cowards cling to camp.' "'Wildly, back and forth, Turnus gallops along the walls. "'A way in?' no way in, as a wolf prowling in wait around some crowded sheepfold, bearing the wind and rain in the dead of night, howls at chinks in the fence, and the lambs keep bleating on, snug beneath their dams. The wolf rages, desperate. How can he maul a quarry out of reach? Exhausted, frenzied with building hunger, starved so long his jar jaws parched for blood. So wildly, Turnus, scanning the camp and rampart, flares in anger. Brute resentment sears him to the bone. What tactic to try, to make a breakthrough, how to shake those penned-up Trojans clear of their walls and strew them down the plain? The armada, there, hard by the camp it lay tied up, riding at anchor, shielded round by the high redoubts and river currents, 
Here he attacks, shouting to his cheering comrades, Bring up fire! A man on fire, he seizes a blazing pine tar torch in his fist, and now, watch, his men pitch into the work as Turnus urges them on in person, and whole battalions equip themselves with smoking brands. They've plundered the hearth fires. Sooty torches ignite a murky glare, and the god of fire hurls at the skies a swirl of sparks and ash. What god, you muses, warded off such savage flames from the Trojans? Who drove from the ships such raging fire? Tell me. Trust in the tale is old, yet its fame will never die. In the early days, on Phrygian Ida's slopes, when Aeneas first built his fleet, gearing up for the high seas, they say the Berecynthian mother of gods herself appealed to powerful Jove with pleading words. Grant this prayer, my son, that your loving mother makes to you, since now you rule on Olympus's heights. I had a grove on the mountain's crest, where men would bring me gifts, a pine wood loved for long, dark with pitch pine, shady with maple timber. These woods I gladly give the Dardan prince when the prince lacked a fleet. Now dread and anguish have me in their grip. Dissolve my fears. Let a mother's prayers of it prevail. May these galleys never be wrecked on any passage out or overpowered by whirling storms at sea. Let their birth on our mountains be a blessing. Her son, who makes the starry world go round, replied, Mother, what are you asking fate to grant? What privilege are you begging for your ships? Think. Should keels laid by a mortal hand enjoy an immortal's rights? Should Aeneas go through scathing dangers all unscathed? Aeneas? What gods command such power? Nevertheless, one day, when their tour of duty is done at last and they moor in a western haven, all the ships that survived the waves and bore the Trojan prince to Latium's fields, I will strip them of mortal shape and command them all to be goddesses of the deep, like Doto, Nereus's daughter, and Galatia, too, breasting high, cleaving the frothing waves." Jove had spoken. Sealing his pledge by the sticks, his brother's stream, by the banks that churn with pitch-black rapids, whirlpools swirling dark, he nodded his assent, and his nod made all of Mount Olympus quake. And so the promised day had arrived, and the fates filled out the assigned time, when Turnus's rampage warned the mother to drive his brands from her consecrated ships. And first a strange radiance flashed in all eyes, and a great cloud appeared out of the dawn, came sweeping down the sky trailed by the goddess's dancing troops from Ida. Then an awesome voice descended through the air, surrounding the Trojan and Rutulian ranks alike. No frantic rush to defend my ships, you Trojans, no rising up in arms. Turnus can sooner burn the ocean dry than burn these sacred pines of mine. Run free, my ships. Run, you nymphs of the sea. Your mother commands you now. And all at once, each vessel snapping her cables free of the bank, they dive like dolphins, plunging headlong beaks into the bottom's depths, then up they surface, turned into lovely virgins, wondrous omen, each a sea-nymph sweeping out to sea. The Rutulians shrank in panic. Messapus himself was stunned with terror, his stallions reared, and the river roaring checked its currents. Tiber summoned his outflow back from the open sea. But dauntless Turnus never loses faith in his daring. He flares up more at his men, inflaming their spirits more. All these omens threaten the Trojans. Jove himself has whisked away their trusted line of defense. No waiting for us, for Rutulian sword and torch to strike their ships. So now the open sea is blocked to the Trojans. No escape, no hope. They robbed of half the world, and the other half, dry land, is in our grasp. So many thousand Italians take up arms. All their fateful oracles, words from the gods these Phrygians bandy about, alarm me not at all. Let it be quite enough for fate and Venus both that Trojans reach the green, rich green land of Italy. Trojans. I have my own fate, too, counter to theirs, to stamp out these accursed people with my sword. They've stolen away my bride. Atreus's sons, they're not alone in suffering such a wound. Not only Mycenae has a right to go to war. To die once is enough. The crime they committed once should be enough, if only they hated most all womankind so deeply. These Trojans who borrow courage, build their trust on the walls they raise, the ditch they dig between us. What a flimsy buffer to shield them all from slaughter. Haven't they seen Troy's ramparts, built by Neptune's hands, collapse in flames? But you, my elite ones, who is ready to ha hack their ramparts down with a sword, to join me now and storm their panicked camp? I have no use for all the armor Vulcan forged, nor for a thousand ships to go against these Trojans. Let all the Etruscans join them at once as allies. They need not fear our stealing up on them in the dark like skulking cowards to rob them of their palladium, butcher their sentries posted on the heights. No hiding ourselves away in a horse's blind dark flanks. 
In naked daylight, I am determined now to ring their walls with fire. I'll make certain they never think they're fighting Greek and Pelasgian boys, the recruits that Hector warded off ten years. But now, my comrades, seeing the best part of the day is done, for the rest, refresh yourselves, hearts high. You've done good work. And trust to it now, we're heading for a battle. All the while, Messapus is ordered to cordon off the gates with a sentry line and gird the walls with fire. Fourteen Rutulians are picked to guard the ramparts, each commanding a hundred troops, their helmets crested with purple plumes, their war gear glinting gold. They scatter to posts and man the watch by turns, or stretching out on the grass enjoy their wine, tilting the bronze bowls while the fires burn on and the watchmen dice away a sleepless night. Scanning all of this from the walls aloft, the Trojans hold the heights with men at arms, while edgy, anxious, they reinforce the gates, building bulwarks, joining ramps to the outworks, bringing weapons up. Menestheus, fierce Serestus, are spurring on the work, the men whom Captain Aeneas charged should Chrysus call to marshal troops and ranks and take command of the outpost. The whole army's on guard, tense along the walls. With perilous posts assigned, they stand watch by turns, each fighter defending what he must defend. Now Nisus guarded a gate matchless in battle, Hyrtacus's son, Aeneas's comrade. Ida the huntress sent him, quick as the wind, with spears and winging arrows, and right beside him came his friend, Euryalus. None more winning among Aeneas's shoulders, none who strapped on Trojan armor, a young boy sporting the first down of manhood, cheeks unshaved. One love bound them, side by side they'd rush to attack, so now, standing the same watch, they held one gate. Euryalus, Nisus asks, do the gods light this fire in our hearts, or does each man's mad desire become his god? For a while now a craving's urged me on to swing into action, some great exploit, no peace and quiet for me. See those Rutulians? What trust they put in their own blind luck! Watchfires flickering far apart, men sprawling, sunk in their wine and sleep, dead silence all around. Now listen to what I'm mulling over, what new plan is shaping in my mind. The people, the elders, all demand that Aeneas be recalled and men dispatched to tell him how the land lies. If they promise you my reward, the fame of the work's enough for me, I think I can just make out a path under that hill to Palantium city walls. Euryalus froze, his heart pounding with love of praise, and he checks his fiery friend at once. So, Nisus, grudging your friend a share in your fine exploit, I'm to send you out alone into so much danger? That's not how father, the old soldier Opheltes, brought me up in the thick of the Greek terror, the death throes at Troy. Nor has it been my way, soldiering on beside you, following out the fate of great-hearted Aeneas right to the bitter end. Here is a heart that spurns the light, that counts the honor you're after cheap at the price of life. No, Nisus insisted, I had no such qualm about you. How wrong I'd be! Just let great Jove, or whatever god looks down with friendly eyes on what we do, carry me back to you in triumph. Ah, uh, but if, and you often see such things in risky straits, if anything sends me down to death, some god, some twist of fate, you must live on, I say. You're young, your life's worth more than mine. Let someone commit my body to the earth, snatched from battle or ransomed back for gold. Or if fortune, up to her old tricks, denies me rights, pay them when I am gone and honor me with a hollow tomb. Nor would I cause your mother so much grief, dear boy. She alone, out of so many Trojan mothers, dared to follow you all the way. She had no love for great Acestes' city. Euryalus countered. You're spinning empty arguments. They won't work. No, my mind won't change, won't budge an inch. Let's be gone. With that, he stirs the sentries, and up they march to take their turn on watch. Leaving his post, he and his comrade Nisus stride off to find the prince. Across the earth... All other creatures were stretched out in sleep, easing their cares, their spirits blank to hardship. But the leading Trojan chiefs, the chosen men of rank, were holding a council now on grave affairs of state. What should they do? Who will take word to Aeneas? There they stand, out on the open campgrounds, leaning on spears, hands at rest on shields, when in rush Nisus and Euryalus side by side, clamoring for admittance, being heard at once. We've something urgent, well worth your while. So intense that Eulus was first to welcome both, inviting Herticus's son to speak, and so he did. Men of Aeneas, hear us out with open minds. Don't judge what we say by our young years. The enemy's sunken, deep in sleep and wine, dead to the world. There's a place for mischief, we've seen it ourselves, an open fork in the road at the gate that fronts the coast. It's dark there, gaps in their watchfires, smoke blackens the sky. Give us this chance to make our way to Aeneas, Palantium too, and you'll soon see us back, loaded with spoils, some bloody killing done. 
The road won't play us false. Hunting the dark glens day after day, we've scouted the city's outposts, reconnoitred every bend in the river. Aletes, bowed with the years, a seasoned adviser, cried out, Gods of our fathers, Troy's eternal shield! So, you're not about to destroy us, root and branch, not if you plant such courage, such resolve in our young soldiers' hearts. He grasped them both by the hands and hugged their shoulders, tears rivering down his cheeks. For you, good men, what reward can I find to equal the noble work you're set on? First and best the gods will give, and your own sense of worth. The rest a thankful Aeneas will repay at once, and young Ascanius too. As long as he lives, he'll never forget such meritorious service. Never, Ascanius steps in. My life depends on father's safe return. By our great household gods, by Asericus's hearth god, and white-haired Vesta's shrine, I swear to you both, Nisus, all my hope, my fortune, lies in your laps alone. Just call father back, bring him back to my eyes. If he returns, all griefs are gone. Two cups I'll give you, struck in silver, ridged with engraving. Father took them both when Arisba fell, and a pair of tripods, two bar large bars of gold, and a wine bowl full of years, Dido of Sidon's gift. But if, in fact, we capture Italy, seize the scepter in triumph, allot the plunder, you've seen the stallion Turnus rides, the armor he sports, all gold, the mount, the shield, the blood-red plumes I exempt from the lot, your trophies, Nisus, now. Also, father will give twelve women, beauties all, and a dozen captive soldiers, each in armor. More, whatever lands there King Latinus claims for himself. But you, Euryalus, you who have stripped me by a year, I admire you, I receive you with all my heart, through thick and thin embrace you as my comrade. Never without you when I am bent on glory, whether in word or action, peace or war, you have my trust forever. Euryalus replied, no day will show me unequal to such brave work, if only the dice of fortune fall out well, not badly. But topping all your gifts, I beg you just one more. My mother, of Priam's ancient stock, poor woman. Neither the land of Troy could hold her back, setting sail with me, nor King Acestes's city. Now I leave her, unaware of the risk I run, whatever it is, with no parting words, because, I swear by the night and your right hand, I cannot bear the sight of my mother's tears. But you, I beg you, comfort her in her frailty, brace her in desolation. Let me carry this hope of you, and all the bolder I go to face the worst. The Trojans were moved to tears. Handsome Ulysses, the most of all. Touched by love for his own father, this image stirred his heart. Trust me, he said, all I do will be worthy of your great exploit. Your mother will be mine, in all but the name Creusa. No small thanks awaits the one who bore such a son. Whatever comes of your exploit, I swear by my life, the oath my father used to take. All I promise you on your return to in glory, the same rewards await your mother and your kin. He weeps as he speaks, and draws from his shoulder strap a sword of gold, forged by one Lycaon of Crete, marvelous work, fitted with ivory sheath and set for action. Menestheus hands Nisus a fine shaggy hide stripped from a lion, and trusty old Elates exchanges helmets with him. Now, both armed, they move out at once, and as they go, an escort of ranking Trojans, warriors, young and old, sees them off at the gates with many prayers. Yet first the handsome Ulysses, beyond his years, filled with a man's courage and a man's concerns as well, gives them many messages to carry to his father. But the winds scatter them all, all useless, fling them into the clouds. Now out they go, crossing the trench and threading through the dark, heading toward the enemy camp, destined to die but make a bloodbath first. Bodies everywhere, they can see them stretched in the grasses, sunk in a drunken stupor, chariot poles tipped up on shore, bodies of fighters trapped in the wheels and harness, weapons and wine cups too are strewn about, and Nisa speaks up first, Euryalus, now for the daring sword hand, now the moment calls, here's the way, you keep guard at our back so no patrol can attack us from the rear, you be on the alert, a hawk's eye all round, I'll make a slaughter, cut you a good clean swath. Nisus breaks off as he plants his sword in lofty ramnes, propped up by chance on a pile of rugs, his chest puffed out and heaving, dead asleep. A king himself, King Turnus's favorite prophet, but no prophecy now could save him from his death. Three aides at his side the Trojan killed, off guard, sprawled in a snarl of arms, then Remus's armor-bearer, then his charioteer, he caught him under the horse's hoofs. He hacks their lolling necks and lops the head of their master, leaves the trunk of him spouting blood, the earth and bedding warmed with the wet black gore. He cuts down Lemuris, too, Lamus and Serranus, 
well-built soldier he'd gamed away till late at night and now lay numb in a drunken haze. Lucky man, if only he'd stretched his gambling through the night and played it out till dawn. Nisus, wild as a starved lion, raging through crowded pens as the hover hunger drives him mad, and he mangles sheep, dumb with terror, rips to shreds their tender flesh and roars from bloody jaws. No less bloody Ure Urealis's work. The man's on fire, storming down on the common ruck before him, Fadus, Herbasis, Roetus, Abaris, quite unconscious now. But Roetus, waking, witnessed it all and cowered, crouching behind an enormous mixing bowl. But Euralis pounced as, Ro as Roetus rose. He rushed him, drove a sword in his heart up to the hilt, then wrenched it back, dripping death. Roetus vomits his red lifeblood, spewing out gore and wine mixed with the man's last gasp. But still Euryalus glowed with a killer's stealth. He was stalking nearer Mesippus's henchmen now. He could spot the outer campfires flickering low and horses tethered securely, grazing grass, the cavalry, when Nisus, sensing his comrade run amuck with bloodlust, cuts him short. Call it quits. The dawn's at hand, our old foe. Enough revenge. We've hacked a path through enemy lines. Enough. And they leave behind a hall of soldiers' armor struck in solid silver, mixing bowls in the bargain, gorgeous rugs. But Euryalus tears off Ramnes's battle emblems and gold-studded belt, gifts that lavish Caedicus once sent Remulus of Tiber, hoping to seal a pact with a friend then far away, and Remulus, dying, passed them on to his grandson, and once he died the Latins commandeered them in battle, spoils of war. Euryalus seizes them, fits them onto his gallant shoulders all for nothing. He dons Mesippus's helmet, crested with tossing plumes. The raiders quit the camp and race for safety. But just then, a troop of cavalry sent on ahead from the Latin city, the rest of the army waits, poised on the plain, comes riding in with messages for King Turnus. Three hundred strong, all men bearing shields with Vulcans in command. Just nearing the camp, just coming up to the earthworks, when they spot at a distance two men swerving off to the left. The helmet, Euryalus forgot, it glints in the dark, it gives him away, it's caught in a shaft of moonlight. A sight not lost on Vulcans, shouting out from the vanguard, Soldiers, halt! Why on the road, in armor? Who are you? Where are you headed? No answer given. Off they scurry into the woods and trust to night. But the troopers fan out left and right, blocking the well-known paths, the sentries ringing all ways out. The dense woods spread far, the thickets and black ilex bristle. Briars crowd the entire place with a rare track showing a faint trace through the thick blind glades. The dark branches, the heft of the plunder, all way down Euryalus. Fear leads him astray in the tangled paths. But Nisus gets away, unthinkingly flees the foe to a place called Alban later, named for Alba then, a spot where Latinus kept his sturdy sheepfolds. Here Nisus halts, looking back for his lost friend. No use. My poor Euryalus, where did I lose you? Where can I find you now? Nisus already picks his way, wheeling, groping back through the whole deceptive wood, retracing, scouring his tracks through the silent brush. He hears hoofbeats, hears a commotion, orders, hot pursuit. The next moment a cry hits his ears, and look, Euryalus, caught by the full band, undone by the dark, the place, the treachery, sudden crashing attack. He's overwhelmed, they're dragging him off, struggling, desperate, doomed. What can Nisus do? How can he save his young friend? What force, weapons, what bold stroke? Pitch himself at the swords and die at once? Race through wounds to a swift and noble death? Quickly cocking his arm, his lance brandished high, he cranes up at the moon and prays his heart out. You, goddess, Latona's daughter, stand by me now. Help me now in the thick of danger, glory of stars, guard of the groves. If Father Herticus ever gave you gifts in my name to grace your altars, if I have ever adorned them with hunting trophies, hanging them from your dome, fixing them to your roofs, help me rout my enemies, wing my spears through the air. With that he hurled his spear, his whole body behind it. Whirring on through the dark night, it flies at Solmo and strikes his turned back, and striking his turned back, it splits. Crack! And a splinter stabs his midriff through. He twists over, vomiting hot blood from his chest, chill with death, his flanks racked with his last gasps. The Rutulians wheel, looking about, but now Nisus, all the bolder, watch, cocking another spear beside his ear as the enemy panics, hurls, and the shaft goes hissing right through Tagus's brow, splitting it, sticking deep in the man's warm brains. Vulcans burns with fury, stymied. Where can he find the one who threw it? Where can he aim his rage? No matter, he cries. Now you'll pay me in full with your hot blood for both my men. 
With that, he rushes Euryalus, sword drawn as Nisus, terrified, frenzied, no more hiding in shadows, no enduring such anguish any longer. He breaks out, Me! Here I am! I did it! Turn your blades on me, Rutulians! The crime's all mine! He never dared, never could do it! I swear by the skies up there, the stars, they know it all! All he did was love his unlucky friend too well. But while he begged, the sword goes plunging clean through Euryalus's ribs, cleaving open his white chest. He writhes in death as blood flows over his shapely limbs. His neck droops, sinking over a shoulder, limp as a crimson flower cut off by a passing plow that droops as it dies, or frail as poppies, their necks weary, bending their heads when a sudden shower weighs them down. But Nisus storms the thick of them, out for Vulcans, one among all, Vulcans his lone concern. His enemies massing round him, trying to drive him back, left, right, but he keeps charging, harder, swirling his lightning sword, till facing Vulcans he sinks his blade in his screaming mouth, Nisus dying just as he stripped his enemy of his life. Then, riddled with wound on wound, he threw himself on his lifeless friend, and there in the still of death found peace at last. How fortunate, both at once. If my songs have any power, the day will never dawn that wipes you from the memory of the ages. Not while the house of Aeneas stands by the capital's rock unshaken, not while the Roman father rules the world. Triumphant, the Rutulians gathered their battle plunder, weeping now as they bore the lifeless body of Vulcans back to camp. There they wept no less, finding Ramnes bled white and so many captains killed in one great slaughter. Serranus, Numa, too, and a growing cloud cluster around the dead and dying men, and the ground lies warm with the recent massacre, rivulets foam with blood. Together they recognize the trophies of war, Messapus's burnished helmet, and many emblems retrieved with so much sweat. By now, early dawn had risen up from the saffron bed of Tithonus, scattering fresh light on the world. Sunlight flooded in, and the rays laid bare the earth as Turnus, fully armed himself, calls his men to arms. And each commander marshals his own troops for battle, squadrons sheathed in bronze, and wets their fury with mixed accounts of the last night's slaughter. They even impale the heads on brandished pikes, the heads a grisly sight, and strut behind them, baiting them with outcries, Euryalus and Nisus. On the rampart's left wing, the river flanks the right. The hardened troops of Aeneas group in battle order, facing enemy lines and manning the broad trench, or stationed up on the towers. Wrung with sorrow, men stunned by the sight of men they know too well, their heads stuck on pikestaffs gripping gore. That moment, rumor, flown through the shaken camp, wings the news to the ears of Euryalus's mother. Suddenly warmth drains from her grief-stricken body. The shuttle's flung from her hand, the yarn unravels, and off she flies, poor thing. Shrilling a woman's cries and tearing her hair, insane, she rushes onto the high walls, seeking the front rakes posted there. Without a thought for the fighters, none for the perils, the spears, no, she fills the air with wails of mourning. You, is this you I see, Euryalus? You, the only balm of my old age, how could you leave me all alone? So cruel, when you set out on that deadly mission, couldn't your mother have said some last farewell? What heartbreak, now you lie in an unknown land, fresh game for the dogs and birds of Latium. Nor did your own mother lead her son's cortege, or seal your eyes in death, or bathe your wounds, or shroud you round in the festive robe I wove, speeding the work for you, laboring day and night, lightening with the loom the pains of my old age. Where can I go? What patch of ground now holds your body cut to pieces, your mutilated corpse, this head? It's all you bring me back, my son. It's all that I followed, crossing land and sea. Stab me through, if you have any decency left. Whip all your lances into me, you Rutulians. Kill me first with steel. Or pity me, you, great father of gods, and whirl this hated body down to hell with a bolt. The only way I know to burst the chains of this, this brutal life. Her wails dashed their spirits. A spasm of sorrow went throbbing through them all. They were broken men, their lust for battle numbed. As she inflames their grief, Idaeus and Actor, ordered by Elonius and Eulus, weeping freely, cradle her in their arms and bear her back inside. A terrific brazen blast went blaring out from the trumpets far and wide, and war cries echo the horns and the high sky resounds. And now the Volscians charge, ranks of them, packing under a tortoise shell of shields, bent on filling the trenches, tearing down stockades. Some press hard for an entry, scaling the walls with ladders wherever a gap shows in the thin defensive ring and light breaks through. The opposing Trojans fling down missiles, any and all, thrusting off the assault with rugged pikes, 
expert from their years of war at defending city ramparts. Great boulders they trundle down on the raiders, huge weights trying to break their shielded troops, but under the tortoise shell they gladly take their blows. Yet they can't hold out. Wherever Rutulians mass for attack, the Trojans roll up immense rocks and heave them, hurtling down, cracking their armored carapace, crush them, send them reeling, and now the bold Rutulians lose all zest for battle under a blind defensive shell. They struggle out in the open, flinging spears to clear the enemy ramparts. Here, in another sector, Mezentius, grim sight, is shaking a Tuscan pine beam, hurling fire and smoky pitch at the foe as Mesippus, breaker of horses, Neptune's son, is ripping open a rampart, shouting, Ladders! Scale the walls! I pray you, Calliope, muses, inspire me as I sing what carnage and death the sword of Turnus spread that day, what men each fighter speeded down to darkness. Come, help me unroll the massive scroll of war. Now a tower reared high, a commanding salient point with rampways climbing up to it. All the Italians fought to storm it, full strength, straining to drag it down, full force, while Trojans, jammed inside, fought to defend it, barricaded with stones, hurling salvos of spears through great gaping loopholes. Turnus, first to attack, whirled a flaming torch that stuck in the tower's flanks, and whipped by the wind it quickly seized on planking, clinging fast to the doorway's posts it ate away. Inside, panic, chaos, soldiers fighting to find some way out of the flames, no hope. Men went cramming back to the safe side, back from the killing heat, but under the sudden lurch of weight the tower came toppling down, making the whole wide heaven a thunder back its crash. Fighters writhe in death, crushed on the ground, the enormous wreckage right on top of them, yes, impaling them on their own weapons, stabbing splintered beams through their chests. Only Helenor and Lycus slipped to safety, just. Helenor still in the flush of youth. A slave, Lycimnia, bore him once to Maeonia's king in secret, sent him to Troy light-armed in forbidden gear, a naked sword and a shield still blank, unblazoned. Now he found himself in the thick of Turnus's thousands, Latin battalions crowding, pressing at all points, as a wild beast snared in a closing ring of hunters, raging against their weapons, flings itself at death, staring doom in the face, leaping straight at the spears. Just so wild the young soldier leaps at the enemy's center, rushing at death where he sees the spearhead's densest. But Lycus, far faster, escapes through enemy lines and spears to reach the wall, clawing up to the coping, trying to grasp his he comrade's hands when Turnus, chasing him down with a lance, shouts out in triumph, Fool! You hoped to escape my clutches? Seizing him as he dangles, tearing the man down along with a hefty piece of wall. As the eagle that bears Jove's lightning snatches up in his hooking talons a hare or snow-white swan and towers into the sky, or the wolf of Mars that rips a lamb from the pens and its mother, desperate to find it, fills the air with bleating. War cries, rising, everywhere. On and on they charge, packing the trench with earth, some men hurling fiery torches onto the rooftops. Ilionius, heaving a rock, a huge crag of a rock, brings down Lucetius, just, as a, just assaulting the gates with a flaming torch in hand as Liger kills Amathion. Asilas lays out Corineus, one adept with javelin, one with arrows blindsiding in from a distance. Caeneus kills Ortigius, Turnus, triumphant, triumphant Caeneus. Turnus cuts down Itus, Clonius, Deoxippus, and Promolus. Sagarus, Idus, posted out from in front of the t steepest towers. And Capus kills Pravernus. Themelus's spear grazed him first. He dropped his shield, the idiot, raised his hand to the gash as the arrow flew, and digging deep in his left side, deeper, burst the ducts of his life-breath with a deadly wound. There stood Arkenza's son, decked out in brilliant gear and a war-shirt stitched blood-red with Spanish dye, a fine, striking boy. His father reared him once in the grove of Mars, where Symmetheus's waters swirl and a shrine to the gods of Sicily stands, the Palachi, quick to forgive, their altar rich with gifts, and he sent his son to war. Mezentius's hissing sling, keeping its strap taut and dropping his spears, three times he whipped it around his head, let fly, and the lead shot, sizzling hot in flight, split his enemy's skull, and splayed him out head first on a bank of sand. Then, they say, Ascanius shot for the first time in war the flying arrow he'd saved till now for wild game, routing, terrorizing them. Now his bow hand cut down strong Numinus, Remulus by family name, just lately bound in marriage to Turnus's younger sister. Numinous, out of the front lines he swaggered, chest puffed up with his new-found royal rank, and he let loot it loose an indiscriminate string of ugly insults, flaunting his own power to high heaven. What? Have you no shame? 
You Phrygians, twice enslaved, penned up twice over inside blockaded ramparts, skulking away from death behind your walls. Look at the heroes who would seize our brides in battle. What god drove you to Italy? What insanity! No sons of Atreus here, no spinner of tales, Ulysses. We're a rugged stock. From the start we take our young ones down to the river, toughen them in the bitter icy streams. Our boys, they're up all night, hunting, scouring the woods. Their sport is breaking horses, whipping shafts from bows. Our young men, calloused by labor, used to iron rations, tame the earth with mattocks or shattered towns with war. All our lives are honed to the hard edge of steel. Reversing our spears, we spur our oxen's flanks. No lame old age can cripple our high spirits, sap our vigor. No, we tamp our helmets down on our gray heads, and our great joy is always to haul fresh booty home and live off all we seize. But you, with your saffron braided dress, your flashy purple, you live for lazing, lost in your dancing, your delight, blowsy sleeves on your warshirts, ribbons on bonnets. Phrygian women, that's what you are, not Phrygian men. Go traipsing over the ridge of Dindima, catch the songs on the double pipe you dote on so. The tambourines, they're calling for you now, and the boxwood flutes of your Berecynthian mother perched on Ida. Leave the fighting to men, lay down your swords. Flinging his slander, ranting taunts, Ascanius had enough. Facing him down and aiming a shaft from his bowstring, horse gut tense, he stood there, stretching both arms wide, praying first to Jove with a fervent, heartfelt vow. Jove Almighty, nod assent to the daring work I have in hand. All on my own I'll bring your temple yearly gifts. I'll steady before your altar a bull with gilded brows, bright, bright white with its head held high as its mother's, butting its horns already, young hoofs kicking sand. And the father heard, and thundered on the left from a cloudless sky. The instant the lethal bow sings out, and the taut shaft flies through Remulus's head with a vicious hiss, and rends his empty temples with its steel. Go on, now mock our courage with high and mighty talk. Here's the reply the Phrygians, twice enslaved, return to you, Rutulians. That's all he says. The Trojans echo back with a roar of joy, their spirits sky high. By chance, Apollo, god of the flowing hair enthroned on a cloud in the broad sweeping sky, was glancing down at Ausonia's troops and camp, and called to Ulysses, flushed with triumph now. Bravo, my boy, bravo, your newborn courage. That's the path to the stars. Son of the gods, your father gods to come. All fated wars to come will end in peace, justly, under Asericus's future sons. Troy can never hold you. In the same breath, the god Apollo dives from the vaulting skies and, cleaving the gusty winds, searches for Ascanius. He assumes the form and features of old beauties, armor-bearer once, to Dardan and Chyses, trusty guard of his gates until Aeneas made him Ascanius's aid. So Apollo approached like booties head to foot, the man's age, his voice, the shade of his skin, white hair, weapons clinging grimly, and counsels Ulysses now in his full glow of triumph. Son of Aeneas, stop! Enough that Numinous fell to your flying shafts, and you've not paid a price. Apollo has granted this. Your first flush of glory. He never envied your arrows a match for the archer's own. For the battles to come, hold back for now, dear boy. This order still on his lips, Apollo vanished from sight into empty air. But the Trojan captains recognized the god, his immortal arms, and heard his arrows rustling in his quiver as he flew. So they restrain Ascanius, blazing for battle. Pressing on him Apollo's will and last commands, but they themselves go rushing back to fight and expose their lives to peril. Cries rock the ramparts up and down the walls, their tensing murderous bows, whipping spear straps, weapons strewing the ground, shields and hollow helmets ringing out under impact, fighting surges ra raging strong as a tempest out of the west when the kids are rising great with rain that lashes the earth, and thick and fast as the hail that storm clouds shower, pelting headlong down on the waves when Jupiter, fierce with south wind, spins a whirlwind, thunderheads exploding down the sky. Pandarus and Bitius, Alcanor of Ida's offspring born by the nymph Yara, once in Jupiter's grove, men like pines and peaks of their native land, who trusted so to their swords they fling wide the gate their captain entrusted to them, all on their own inviting enemy ranks to breach the walls. There they loom in the gateway, left and right like towers, armored in iron, crests on their high heads flaring, tall as a pair of oaks along a stream in spate, by the Po's banks or the Adige's lovely waters, re rearing their uncropped heads to the high sky, their twin crowns waving tall. 
But in they charge, the Rutulian forces seeing the way wide open now. In an instant, Quercans, a Quickilus, striking in armor, Tamaris, daredevil heart, and Hymen, son of Mars, with all their squadrons routed, turn tail and run, or throw their lives right down right at the gateway's mouth. And the more they fight, the hotter their battle fury grows, and now the Trojans mass, regrouping to storm the site, clashing man to man, daring to foray farther out. Turnus, the great captain, is blazing on in another zone, stampeding the Trojan ranks when the news arrives. The enemy, flushed with the latest carnage, offers up their gates flung open now. And Turnus wheels, dropping the task at hand and full of fury, speeds to the Trojan gate to face the headstrong brothers. But first, Antiphates, he was the first to charge, Sarpedon's bastard son by a mother born in Thebes, but Turnus cuts him down. His Italian cornel spear shaft wings through the melting air and piercing the man's stomach thrusts up into his chest, and froth from the wound's black pit comes bubbling up as the steel heats in the lung it struck. Then Merops and Eremus die at his hands. Then Aphidnus, even Bitius, eyes ablaze, all rage at heart, and not by a spear, he'd never give up his life to a spear. A massive pike with a giant blade comes hurtling, roaring into him, driven home like a lightning bolt, and neither the two bull's hides of his shield nor trusty breastplate, double-mailed with its scales of gold, can block its force. His immense limbs collapse, and earth groans as his giant shield thunders down on his body. Huge as a masoned pier that falls at times on the shore of Euboean Bay, first they build it of massive blocks, then send it crashing over, dragging all in its wake, and it crushes down on the ocean floor as the waves roil and black sand goes heaving into the air, and Prokita Island quakes to its depths, and the craggy bed of Inarame waiting Typhus down by Jove's command. Here, Mars, power of war, injects new heart and force in the Latins, twisting his sharp spurs in their chests and loosing flight and dark fear at the Trojan ranks, and the Latins swarm in from all directions, seize the moment for all-out assault as the war-god strikes their spirits. Pandarus, seeing his brother's body spread on the ground and sensing how fortune falls, disaster rules the day, with all his might he rams his massive shoulder into the gate and wheels it shut on its hinges, shuts out many comrades now outside the ramparts, facing an uphill battle, and shuts in many others ushering fighters home as in they rush, along with himself the crazy fool, not to have spotted Turnus charging in with the crowds, and all unwittingly shut him up inside the walls like a claw-mad tiger among some helpless flock. Suddenly, strange light flares from Turnus's eyes, and his armor clangs, horrific. The blood-red plumes shake on his head, and his shield shoots bolts of lightning. They know him at once, his hated face, his immense frame, and Aeneas's troops are stunned. But enormous Pandarus breaks ranks, afire with rage at his brother's death, and shouts, No palace here, your dowry from Amata! Look! No fortress Ardia hugging her native Turnus! What you see is your enemy's camp! You can't escape! And Turnus replied with a cool, collected smile, On with it now! If you have backbone in you, let's trade blows! You'll tell the ghost of Priam you found an Achilles, even here! No more talk! Putting all his strength behind it, Pandarus hurls his spear, unpolished, knotted, bark still rough, but the breezes whisk it away. Saturnian Juno flicks aside the approaching wound, and the weapon stabs the gate. "'But you won't escape my blade whirling in my right hand,' cries Turnus. "'No, this sword and the man who wields it, the wounds they deal are fatal.' Rearing to full height, sword high, the steel hacks the brows, splitting the temples, gruesome wound, and it cleaves the soft, unshaven cheeks." A great crash. Under his huge weight the earth quakes, his limbs fall limp, his armor splattered with brains, he sprawls on the ground in death. In perfect halves over both his shoulders, right and left, his head goes lolling free. The Trojans swerve and scatter in panic, and if the conquering hero had thought at once of smashing the gate bolts, letting his cohorts in, this day would have been the last day of the war, the last of the Trojans, too. But Turnus's hot fury, his mad lust for carnage, drives him against his foes. First he seizes Phalaris, cuts the knees from under Gyges. Snatching their spears, he whips them into the backs of men who break and run as Juno builds his courage, his warlust. Hallus next. He sends him packing along with comrades. Phegeus, too, as a spear impales him through his shield. Then men on the ramparts keen for combat, blind to Turnus who picks them off. Alcander and Hallius, Pratanus and Noemon. Lynceus swings to attack, shouting his comrades on, but first, from the right-hand rampart, Turnus spins with one stroke of his dazzling sword, 
Close up that brings down Lynceus, slashes his head off, head and helmet tumbling far away. Next he brings down Amicus, gifted killer of wild game, no hand more skilled at dipping an arrow's point or capping a lance with poison. Then Clytius, Aeolus' son. Then Cretheus, friend of the muses, the muses' comrade. Cretheus, always dear to his heart, the song and lyre, tuning a voice to the taut string, always singing of cavalry, weapons, wars, and the men who fight them. At last, the Trojan captains hear of the massacre of their troops. Menestheus, fierce Serestus, both come rushing in and seeing their ranks in panic, ranks of enemies lodged inside the gates. Menestheus shouts out, Where are you heading? Where are you flying now? What other walls, what other ramparts have you got? My countrymen, can one man, penned up in your fortress on all sides, spread such slaughter through the city? Send such a rout of first-rate fighters down to death and never pay the price? You feckless craven, have you no pity, no shame for your wretched land, your gods of old, for great Aeneas? That ignites them, stiffens their spines, and closing ranks they halt. As Turnus pulls back from the melee, heading step by step for the banks where the river rings the camp. All the more fiercely Trojans swarm him, war cries breaking, ranks packed tight as a band of huntsmen bristling spears, attacking a savage lion. Terrified, true, but glaring still, ferocious still as he backs away, but his heart, his fury keep him from turning tail. Yet for all his wild desire he still can't claw his way through spears and huntsmen. Just so torn, so slowly but surely, Turnus backs away, his spirit churning with anger. Twice he charged the thick of his foes, twice he broke their lines, stampeding the Trojans down their walls at speed. But a whole battalion marching out of the camp comes massing hard against him. Not even Juno dares reinforce his power to counterattack. No, Jove sped Iris down from the high heavens, winging strict commands for his sister Juno if Turnus did not quit the Trojans' looming walls. So now no shield, no sword arm helps the fighter stand up under the onslaught, overpowering salvos battering down on him left and right. Over and over the helmet casing on his hollow temples rings out shrill, the solid bronze of it splits wide open under the rocks, the plumes are ripped from his head, the boss of his shield caves in to the hammering blows. And the Trojan ranks, with lightning bolt Menestheus out in the lead, unleash an, unleash an immense barrage of spears, and sweat goes rippling over Turnus's entire body, rivering down, black with filth. Kent catches breath, gasping, weak knees quaking, bone tired, until he at last dives, head first, plunging into the river, armor and all. And Tiber swept him into its yellow tide, catching him as he came, then bore him up in its soothing waves, and bathing away the carnage, gave the elated fighter back to friends. Hi, my name is Joshua Kiefer. I'm here to read Book 10 of Virgil's Aeneid. The translation I'll be reading from was done by James Rhodes somewhere during the first half of the 20th century. It's a bit of an older translation. It happens to be the one that was sitting on my bookshelf um, in the collection of great books um, edited by Mortimer Adler and Company, <clears throat> published in 1952. So if you'll bear with me as I read through some of the strange phrasing and a couple of um, archaic English terms, I think you'll enjoy this particular book where we find um, Aeneas engaging in pitched combat and a lot of valiant men falling in battle. So, <clears throat> without further ado, here's book 10 of the Aeneid. Now is thrown wide the almighty house of heaven, and lo, the sire of gods and king of men summons a council to his starry court. Whence from on high he doth all lands of earth, the Dardan camp and Latium's folk behold. Within the double-gated hall they sit, himself breaks silence. Mighty sons of heaven, why is your purpose turned back, or why so strive with rancorous hearts, that Italy with Troy should clash in onset I forbade? What is this feud defiant of my ban? What terror hath seduced, or these or those, to rush on battle and provoke the sword? War's rightful hour, forestall it not, will come. What time fierce Carthage on Rome's heights shall hurl mighty destruction and the opened Alps? 
then hate for hate, then rapine shall have sway, but now give o'er and cheerfully confirm the peace decreed. Thus Jupiter in brief. Not briefly, golden Venus makes reply. O sire, O sovereign power, etern of men and all things, for what else is left us yet to pray to, dost thou mark how insolent the rutules, and how Turnus, chariot born, vaunts him in mid career, and speeds amain, flushed with war's triumph? Their close walls no more now shield the Teucrians. Nay, within their gates, even on the mounded ramparts, hand to hand they grapple, and all the trench o'erflows with blood. Aeneas is unaware, far off. Wilt thou ne'er yield us respite from the leaguer's ring? Over the walls of newborn Troy once more a foe is hovering, and once more a host, and from Aetolian Arpi as of old, up springs against the Teucrians Tydeus' son. My wounds, methinks, await me yet, and I, thine offspring, but delay some mortal spear. If unapproved and all unwilled of thee, the Trojans have sought Italy. That sin let them atone, nor speed them with thine aid. But, if obedient unto call on call from heaven and Hades, how can any now reverse thy bidding and write fate anew? Why call to mind the fleet on Eric's shore burnt up with fire? Why of the lord of storms and his mad blasts roused from Aeolia tell, or Iris sped from heaven, now too she stirs, tracked unattempted yet, the shades below, and on the upper world launch suddenly Electo riots through the Italian towns. Of empire not I reck, that hope was ours while fortune stood, win whom thou wouldst have win. If realm be none which thy relentless spouse can spare the Teucrians, by Troy's overthrow and smoking ruins, O sire I thee conjure, suffer me pluck Ascanius from the fray, Scathless, my grandson, suffer him to live. Aeneas on unknown waters may be tossed, and follow fortune whatso path she point. Let me this life avail to shield and filch from war's dread peril. Amethyst is mine, mine lofty Paphos and Cythera's isle, and fair Idalia's home, there let him pass his days unarmed and glorious. With proud sway bid Carthage curb Ausonia, not from thence shall balk the Tyrian cities. To have scaped the plague of war what boots him, to have fled clean through the Argive fires and drained so oft dangers of sea and desert, while Troy's sons seek Latium's shore and Pergamus re-risen? Were it not better to have sat them down amid their land's last ashes, and the soil where once was Troy? Ah, hapless give them back, Xanthus and Simoas. Let the Teucrian sire unroll afresh the tale of Ilium's woe. Then royal Juno by fierce frenzy spurred. Why, my deep silence, drivest thou me to break, and vent abroad in words a hidden pain? Aeneas hath any man or god compelled to fly to arms and launch him as a foe on King Latinus? At the call of fate he sought the shores of Italy, so be it. Urged by Cassandra's raving, was it we bade him quit camp, trust to the winds his life, to a boy's guidance commit walls and war, stir treason in Etruria's peaceful folk? What god, what cruel tyranny of ours impelled him to his bane, Say where in this was Juno's hand, or Iris sent from heaven. Tis shame for Italy's sons to gird with fire your newborn Troy, and on his native soil Turnus set foot from old Pilumnus sprung, Vanilia for his mother nymph divine. What for the Trojans then with smoking brands to fall on Latium, crush beneath the yoke, ravage and plunder lands that knew them not, pick wives at will, tear bride from lover's breast? Hands craving peace, and vessels lined with war? Thou canst Aeneas from Greek hands filch away. Mist and void air present them for a man. Into as many nymphs canst turn their fleet. That we to Rutul's too some aid should bring, counts it for crime? Aeneas is unaware, far off, thou sayest. Far off and unaware let him remain. Paphos, Sedalium are thine, and tall Cythera. Why provoke fierce bosoms and a town that teems with war? Think you tis I who labor to o'erthrow the crumbling power of Phrygia? I or he who on the hapless Trojans first drew down the Achaean onslaught? Wherefore, say, to arms did Europe rise, and Asia with a rape the cords of peace unravel? Did I lead the adulterous Darden to storm Sparta's hold? 
I find him weapons or fan war with love? Fears for thy children had become thee then. Now, all belated and with baseless plaints, rising thou flingest thy fierce taunts in vain. So pleaded Juno, and the assembled gods murmured approval with divided voice. As rising blasts that in the forest caught, murmur and rolling a dull roar along, bode storm to sailors. Then the almighty sire, prime potentate, break silence, as he speaks, Hushed is the god's high palace, and the earth from her base trembles. The deep vault is still. The winds are dropped, the sea smooths flat his floor. Hear then, and graft within your heart my words. Ausonian, Teucrian, since no league may join. Nor your own jars have end. Howe'er today thrive either, cleave what path of hope he will, or Trojan or Rutulian shall by me be deemed alike indifferent. Whether now the destinies of Italy or Troy's own baneful error and ill counsel hold her camp beleaguered, nor herefrom loose I the rutules, each shall his own sowing reap, or toil or triumph, Jupiter is king alike for all, the fates will find a way. He spake, and by his Stygian brother's stream, banks that with pitch and a black whirlpool boil, nodded assent, and with the nod made all Olympus tremble. Here their parley had end. Then Jupiter from off his golden throne rises, escorted to his palace doors by all the companies of heaven. Meanwhile at every gate the Rutules press round to deal red death and ring the walls with flame. But fast within their palisades are penned Aeneas' leaguered host, no hope of flight. Forlorn upon the lofty towers they stand in vain, and with a scant ring crown the walls. The first rank Asius, son of Imbrasus, and Hicetaon's son Thymoetes, then the twain Asaraki and Thimbris, old and Castor, brothers of Sarpedon both. Clarus and Themon at their side are ranged from lofty Lycia. Straining his full bulk, Lyrnesian Acmon bears a monstrous rock, no mean part of a mountain. Lesser thewed he nor than Clytius, from whose loins he sprang, nor his own brother Mnestheus. Some with darts strive to ward off the foemen, some with stones, or hurl the firebrand, or fit shaft to string. Midmost the press, for Venus care most meet, behold, the Dardan boy, his comely head uncovered, glitters like a gem that cleaves the red gold round it, to deck head or throat, or as gleams ivory cunningly inlaid in boxwood or Orician terebinth. The milk-white neck his showery locks receives, upgathered in a ring of pliant gold. V too, O Ismarus, the great-hearted folk, saw aim the wound and arm the reed with bane, high-born of house Maonian, where men till rich furrows by Pactolus washed with gold. There too was Menestheus, whom his late renown in routing Turnus from the rampart's height exalts to heaven and Capus there, from whom the great Campanian city draws her name. These in the grip of stubborn war had closed. Aeneas was cleaving now the midnight sea. For from Evander parted and arrived the Etruscan camp, soon as he meets the king, and to the king relates his race and name, Boon asked or offered, and reveals what arms Mezentius wins to aid him, and therewith the unbridled heart of Turnus, warning him how mutable things human, and with pleas mingling entreaties. Without more ado, Tarkon joins forces, and strikes treaty. Then, fate-free, the Lydian folk at heaven's behest, beneath an alien's banner leap aboard. The good ship of Aeneas leads the van, the Phrygian lions yoked beneath her prow. O'er them hangs Ida, a boon sight to see for Teucrian exiles. Great Aeneas here sits and revolves in his own heart, the while war's changeful issues, to his leftward side cleaves Pallas, and now asks him of the stars, the roadway of dark night, anon of all his jeopardies endured by land and sea. Now open Helicon, ye goddesses, and wake the strain, what hero company, following Aeneas from the Etruscan strand, array the decks for war and ride the deep. First in his brass-beaked tiger, Massacus cleaves the sea billows, beneath whom are ranged a thousand warriors from walled Clusium come, and Cosse's city. Arrowmen are they, 
girt with light quiver and death-bearing bow. With him grim Abbas, his whole band aflame with glorious arms, Apollo gilded bright upon the stern. Six hundred of her sons had Populonia lent him, proved in war. But Ilva's isle three hundred, whose rich womb teems with the Calibs' unexhausted minds. Third, that interpreter twixt gods and men, Asilus comes, obedient to whose will are victims' entrails and the stars of heaven, and tongues of birds and bodeful lightning fires. A thousand speeds he on in close array, and with spears bristling to his banner bid by Pisa, city of Alphian birth, on soil Etruscan. Follows in their wake thrice beauteous Astyr, Astyr on his steed and gay wrought arms relying, along with him, all of one heart to follow, hundreds three from Cares home, or who in Minio's fields and ancient Pyrgi dwell, and fever fraught Gravisce. No, nor thee must I pass over, Liguria's bravest chieftain, Siniras, or thee, Cupavo, with thy scanty train, springs from whose crest the plumage of a swan. Love your reproach, for cognizance ye bear your father's form. For sickness, as folk tell, bemoaning his loved faith on, what time amid those sisters' shadowy poplar leaves he sings, with music solacing love's woe. Donned downy feathers for the snows of age, left earth behind and starward soared in song. The sun, embarked with all his warlike peers, urges with oars the mighty centaur on, who leans above the flood and menaces with monstrous rock the billows towering high, and furrows with long keel the watery deep. Summons a war host from his native shores, great Ochnus too, from Manto prophetess sprung, and the Tuscan river, who to thee gave walls, O Mantua, and his mother's name. Mantua now rich in noble sires, but not all of one stock. A threefold race are they, four several states in each. O'er all the states herself the head, her strength of Tuscan blood. Hence two Mezentius arms to his own bane, five hundred, whom the form of Mincius, crowned with grey-green rushes, sire Benicus child was seaward leading in their pine of war. Aulestes, laboring onward, smites the flood, with hundred tree-stems rising to the stroke. The sea-floor is upchurned, the waters foam. Him monstrous Triton bears, and with his shell frights the blue billows. Downward to the flank, his shaggy front shows human as he swims, ends in a fish the belly neath his waist. Half bestial the wave gurgles as it foams. Such was the tale of chosen chiefs who came in thrice ten vessels to the aid of Troy, cleaving with brass the fields of brine. And now, kind Phoebe, daylight from the sky withdrawn, smote mid Olympus with night wandering car. Aeneas, for care, denied his limbs repose, soul sitting guides the helm and tends the sails. When a fair band of once his way fellows, see, meet him in mid course, the nymphs, whom kind Cybebe bade have worship of the sea, and turned to nymphs from vessels toward him swam. Cleaving the floods together, each and all, that had as brazen prows stood moored to shore, their king they know from far with solemn dance surround him, but their skillfulest of speech, Simodosia following in his wake, grasps with her right the stern, shoots shoulder high, and with her left hand oars the silent wave. Then thus she accosts him, though he knew not her. Wakest thou, son of heaven, Aeneas, wake and slack the sail-sheets. Lo, thy fleet are we, pine-trees of Ida from his sacred crest, now ocean nymphs. When us the rutule false with sword and fire urged headlong, we thy bonds unwilling snapped, and seek thee o'er the main. The mighty mother, pitying this our form, rewrought, and gave us to be goddesses, and under ocean all our days to spend. But young Ascanius, wall and trench confine, mid Latium's darts and bristling front of war, the Arcadian horse and stout Etruscan stand even now together at the appointed spot. With interposing host to block their path, and bar from camp is Turnus set resolve. Up then, at earliest dawn bid rouse to arms thy friends, and take the shield the lord of fire gave thee himself of adamantine might, and edged the rims with gold. Tomorrow's sun... If vain my words thou deem not shall descry vast heaps of rutule slaughter, she had said, 
and with her right hand pushed the lofty stern, at parting no wise witless of the way, swifter than javelin or wind-winged shaft, it skims along the waves. Thereat the rest quicken their course. The Trojan prince himself, son of Anchises, stands amazed, yet takes heart from the omen. Then with eyes upturned, to the high vault of heaven he briefly prays. Kind queen of Ida, mother of the gods, whom Dindymus and cities turret crowned, and lions coupled to thy reign delight, be thou my guide in battle, and this sign bring to fair issue, and with favoring foot attend the Phrygians' goddess. There he ceased. Meanwhile returning dawn sped round apace, to broad day ripening and had banished night. First to his comrades he gives charge that all obey the signal, brace their hearts to war, and fit them for the fray. And now he holds the Teucrian host and his own camp in sight, upon the high poop standing. Suddenly, on his left arm, the blazing shield he rears. The Dardans from the wall raise shouts to heaven. Hope comes to heighten wrath. Their darts they shower. As cranes from Strymon under murky clouds give signal and skim clamorously the air and scud before the south with trailing cry. But to the Rutul prince right marvelous, and to Ausonia's captains seemed the thing. Till looking back the vessel's stems they spy, turned shoreward the whole main one moving fleet. Blazes yon helm top, from the crest above spouts fire, the gold boss belches floods of flame, as on a clear night glows the baleful glare of blood-red comets, or as serious heat, fraught with disease and drought for suffering men, rises and saddens heaven with light malign. Yet baits not gallant Turnus his bold hope to seize the shore and beat the invaders back. Here is the hap ye prayed for, sword in hand, to shatter them. The war god's very self is in the hands of heroes. Now let each of wife and home be mindful now recall the great deeds and the glories of your sires. Up let us meet them at the brink, while yet confused and tottering as their feet touch land. Fortune befriends the bold. So saying he mused inly whom best to lead against the foe, or to whose charge the leaguered walls confide. Meanwhile, with gangways from each lofty stern, Aeneas unships his comrades. Many wait the slack seas ebb and hazard a bold leap into the shallows, some with aid of oars. Tarkon espies a beach where shoals nor pant nor roars the broken billow, but unchecked ocean glides onward with advancing tide. Anon steers thither and calls upon his men. Now, chosen crews, bend to your sturdy oars. Lift and bear in the barks, cleave with their beaks this hostile land, and let the keel's sheer weight plough its own furrow. In such a roadstead I shrink not from shipwreck once we clutch the shore. So Tarkon spake, and all his mates at once, rise on their oar blades and to Latium's plain, bear in the foaming vessels, till their beaks now grip the dry, and every keel anon lies safely bedded, but not Tarkon thine. For dashed amid the shallows, while she hangs upon a treacherous ridge, long poised in doubt, and wearies out the waves, she splits, and casts her crew among the billows. Broken oars and floating thwarts entangle them, their feet the while dragged backward by the water's ebb. No laggard sloth checks Turnus, swift he hurls his whole line at the Teucrians on the beach, halts and confronts them. Then the trumpets sound. First leapt Aeneas on the rustic ranks, fair augury of fight, and trampled down the Latins and slew Theron, mightiest Thude, who dared assault Aeneas. The sword driven through links of brass, through tunic stiff with gold, drank of his gaping side. And next he strikes Lycus, once ripped from his dead mother's womb, and sacred to thee, Phoebus, as a babe, suffered to scape the perils of the steel. And rugged Sisius and huge Gaius, too, while leveling with their clubs the ranks hard by, he smote to death. No wit might these bestead the arms of Hercules, or their stout hands, and sire Melampus, erst Alcides' mate, long as the earth yielded him his travails sore. While Ferris, see, flings deedless words abroad, the hero brandishes and plants a spear full in his bawling mouth. Thou, Sidon, too, in luckless quest of Clytius thy new joy, the young down yellowing on his cheek, hadst lain stretched neath the Darden's hand a piteous sight, heedless of youthful loves thy lifelong care, had not thy brethren a close-banded throng, offspring of Forcus, crossed the foeman's path. 
Their number seven, and seven the darts they fling. From shield and helmet some bound idly back. Some by kind Venus turned aside, his limbs graze merely. Then Aeneas thus bespeaks, trusty Achates. Bring me a store of darts. None of all those shall my right hand for naught launch at the rutules which on Ilium's plain in Grecian flesh stood planted. Therewithal a mighty spear he grasps and hurls. It flew and shattering through the brass of Maon's shield, cleaves plate alike and breast. To his brother's aid up comes Alcanor, props him as he falls, with right hand brotherly. But through his arm the spear sped onward wins its bloody way, and from his shoulder by the sinews, lo, the hand hung dying. Then from his brother's corpse, snatching the weapon, Numitor assails Aeneas, yet might not strike him full, and graze tall-limbed Achates on the thigh. Thereat Clausus of Curies, in his youthful frame, trusting, drew near, and with a javelin cast, smote Dryops neath the chin, and urging home the tough shaft, pierced his throat, and in mid-speech reft life and voice, his forehead strikes the earth, and from his lips he vomits out thick gore. Three, too, from Thrace of Boreas' lofty line, and three by their sire Idas sent to war, and Ismarus their country, he lays low by diverse deaths. Helesus to the fray hastes with the bands Aurunken, and up speeds Mesippus, child of Neptune, steed renowned. Now these, now those, strive to fling back the foe, and on Ausonia's very verge contend. As in the vast of air, when wrangling winds rise to do battle, matched in wrath and might, none to the other yields, wind, cloud, or sea, long sways the combat, all stand locked in strife. So Trojan ranks and Latin, each with each clash, foot to foot clings, and man crowds on man. But yonder, where a torrent far and wide had sent rocks rolling and torn bush from bank, when Pallas, his Arcadians, saw, unused to foot encounter, fly the hot pursuit of Latium, for the rough ground counseled them their steeds to abandon, now with prayers and now with taunting words, sole refuge in his strait, he fires their courage. Whither fly, ye friends? By your brave deeds, by Chief Evander's name and his triumphant wars, I, by the hope that springs in me to match my sire's renown, trust not to flight, it is the sword must cleave through foes our passage. Where yon warrior throng press thickest, your proud country calls you back, Pallas to lead you, no gods bear us down. Mortals by mortals are we driven, who yet boast lives and hands as many. Behold, the deep with its vast bar confines us, and land fails for flight. Shall ocean be our aim or Troy? So saying, he dashed amid the hostile press, First meets him Lagus, led by fate's malign, whom, tugging at a huge and ponderous stone, with javelin hurled, he pierces, where the spine twixt ribs and ribs made severance, and plucks back his weapon whence it clave amid the bones. Yet his bow from above surprised him not, though surely hoping, for as on he rushed, blinded with rage for his friend's bitter fate, Pallas forestalls him in his swollen lung plunging the sword blade. Next on, Sithenius he hurls him, and Ancimolus, derived from Rotus' ancient stem, who dared defile his stepdame's bridal chamber, and ye too, twin sons of Daucus, on the Rutul plain, fell, timber, and Larides, wearing both one likeness, e'en to your own parents' eyes a sweet, insoluble perplexity. But bitter difference now hath Pallas wrought betwixt ye, for thy head the Evandrian sword... <clears throat> But bitter difference now hath Pallas wrought betwixt ye. For thy head the Evandrian sword hath shorn, O timber, and thy lopped right hand gropes for its lord, Larides, and half quick the fingers quiver and clutch the sword anew. Fired by the hero's chiding and at sight of his resplendent deeds, twixt rage and shame the Arcadians steel their hearts to face the foe. Then Pallas pierces Rotius as he sped past in his chariot, Respite and delay thus much gat Illus, for at Illus he had aimed a doughty javelin from afar. But Rotius, intercepting it midway, from thee right noble Tuthras as he fled, and from thy brother Tyres, rolled from car, hammers with dying heel the Rutul plain. As at his wish when summer winds have risen, some shepherd fires the forest here and there, 
All in a moment the mid-spaces catch, and o'er the wide plains an unbroken line sweeps the grim flickering edge of Vulcan's war. He, perched triumphant, marks the reveling flame. So all thy comrades wax in valor won, and glad thee, Pallas. But to meet them moves Halasus, brave in onset, the whole man behind his shield upgathered, and hews down Ladon and Fares and Demodocus. Strymonius' right hand raised against his throat, with flashing blade he shears, then smites with a rock the face of Thoas, and batters in the bones, blood mixed with brain. Halasus in the woods had by his prophet sire been hid, when now the old man's eyes failed and were glazed in death, fates claim their own, and to Evander's darts devote the sun. At him now Pallas aimed, first praying thus, O father Tiber, grant now to this weapon which I poise for fight, a prosperous way through stout Halasus' heart, so shall thine oak his arms and spoils possess. This heard the god, Halasus, while he shields Emaean, to the Arcadian dart lays bare his luckless breast. But Lausus of the fight main champion brooks not that his ranks be scared by all the heroes' slaughter. At their head, encountering, he slays Abbas, a tough knot and barrier of the battle. Then goes down Arcadia's manhood, down the Etruscans go, and ye, whose frames defied the slaughtering Greeks, O Teucrians, matched in leaders as in might, host rushes upon host. The rearward ranks close up and crowd the battle, hand and spear wedged beyond wielding. Here is Pallas, see, pressed and straining. There, confronting him, Lausus and age his equal, both alike, peerless in beauty, but by fortune's ban doomed to no home return. Yet were they not suffered by great Olympus' lord to close in conflict, each beneath a mightier foe waits his impending destiny. Meanwhile his gracious sister now bids Turnus bring relief to Lausus, and on flying car he cleaves the ranks between them. When his friends he spied, Ho now, cease fighting, I alone go to meet Pallas. Pallas is my due, mine only. Fain were I his sire himself stood here to see. So spake he, and his friends withdrew them from the space proclaimed. But when the Rutules had made room, the noble youth, much marveling at the haughty mandate, stares amazed at Turnus. Over the vast frame lets roll his eyes, and with fierce glance afar scans him at every point, then speech for speech makes answer to the monarch. Now shall I be praised as winner of the splendid spoils, or of... <clears throat> <clears throat> now shall I be praised as winner of the splendid spoils, or for a famous death, and either fate my sire can face, away with threats. So saying, he strides into the arena's midst. About the Arcadian's heartstrings the blood curdles cold, Turnus has leapt from chariot and on foot prepares for close encounter, as a lion, that from his lofty outlook hath espied a bull far off, erect upon the plain, brooding on battle flies upon the prey, even such the look of Turnus as he came. But Pallas, when he deemed the foe would be now within spearcast, hastens to begin, so some kind hap might help the bold essay of ill-matched powers. Then thus to the great heaven he cries, by my sire's welcome and the board whereto thou camest a stranger, I thee pray, Alcides, aid me in my vast emprise. Let him behold me from his limbs, yet quick strip off the blood-stained arms, and Turnus' eyes, dying, endure a conqueror. The youth's prayer Alcides Al heard, and stifling a deep groan within his heart, shed unavailing tears. Then with kind words the sire bespake his son, Each hath his term appointed, brief the span of all men's life and irretrievable. But by great feats to lengthen fame, here lies the task of valor. Neath Troy's lofty walls fell many a god begotten. Nay, with them perished Sarpedon, mine own offspring. I and Turnus his fates summon, now arrived, the goal of age allotted. Thus he spake, and from the Rutul plain his eyes withdrew. But Pallas launches with main strength a spear, and plucks from hollow sheath his flashing sword. On flew the shaft, and where the shoulder plates... <clears throat> On flew the shaft, and where the shoulder plates rose to their highest, lit and forced its way through the shield's edges, and glanced off at length, even from the mighty frame of Turnus. 
Then Turnus, long poising a steel-pointed spear, hurls it at Pallas, crying, Look you now whether my dart pierce deeper. He had said, but crashing through the center of the shield, iron upon iron welded, brass on brass, wound all about with bull's hide manifold, with quivering impact the point tore, and pierced the corslet's barrier and the mighty breast. He plucks the warm dart from the wound in vain, outburst one way the lifeblood and the life. Prone on the wound he sinks, and over him loud clanged his armor as the dying lips, blood dabbled, smote upon the foeman's soil. Then standing o'er him, Turnus spake and said, Arcadians heed, and to Evander's ear, bear this my message. Say that in such plight as he hath earned him, I send Pallas home. What grace a grave, what solace burial hath, freely I grant. <clears throat> right dearly will he rue his welcome of Aeneas. Thus he spake, and with his left foot pressed the lifeless corpse, seizing the belt's vast burden with the crime engraved there, in one nuptial night a band of youths slain foully, and the bride-bower drenched in blood, which Clonus, son of Eurytus, had traced upon thick gold. <laughs> but of the prize Turnus now boasts him, glorying in the spoil. Ah, mind of man, to fate and coming doom blind, and that knows no bridle, when elate with prosperous fortune. There shall come a time when Turnus, fain at a great price, would buy Pallas back scathless, and will yon proud spoils loathe, and the day he won them. But his friends with many a groan and tear throng round and set Pallas on a shield, and bear him from the fray. O grief and mighty glory to thy sire anon returning! This one day begins and ends alike thy warfare. None the less huge heaps of rutul dead thou leav'st behind. Now no mere rumor of so dear a loss, but wait here witness to Aeneas' highs, his friends but a bare span from death, tis time Troy's routed ranks to succor. With the sword he reaps what's nearest, and through serried foes like fire a wide path hews him thee to seek, Turnus, exulting in new deeds of blood. Pallas Evander on his very eyes flashed the whole scene, the board whereto he came then first a stranger, and the pledged right hands. Four warriors hereupon from Sulmo sprung, as many reared by Ufens he takes quick, to slay as offerings to the shade, and drench the blazing funeral pyre with captive blood. Next from afar at Magus he had aimed a deadly spear, but he comes crouching up slyly, while o'er him the shaft quivering flew, then clasped the hero's knees and suppliant spake, By thy sire's soul I pray thee, by thy hopes ripening with young Iulus, spare my life for son and sire. A stately house have I, where talent waits of silver fair embossed lie buried deep, and massy gold is mine, wrought and unwrought. Nor hinges here upon the Teucrian's triumph, nor one life alone can work so vast a difference, he had said. <clears throat> to whom Aeneas thus spake in answer, All thy boasted store of silver and of gold save for thy sons, such trafficking in arms Turnus forecancelled in that hour when he smote Pallas dead. So deems among the shades my sire Anchises and Iulus so. He spake, and with his left hand grasped the helm, and bending the neck backward as he prayed, plunged in his sword-blade to the hilt. Hard by the son of Haemon, priest of Phoebus, stood, and Trivia chapleted about the brow with sacred fillet bands from head to heel one splendor of white raiment glittering arms. Him then he meets and drives adown the plain, stands o'er him slipped and fallen, and slaughters him and in vast darkness whelms. The warrior's arms upgathered, Sarastus shoulders and bears off. Trophy to thee, Gradivus, lord of war. Now Caeculus from the stock of Vulcan sprung, and Umbro, who from Marsian mountains came, repair the battle ranks. Against them storms the Dardan. With the sword he had lopped off Anxor's left arm, and with the arm his shield's whole circle. The man had uttered some big boast, and thought with deed to match it, and belike was even exalting his proud soul to heaven, with promise of hoar eld and length of days. When in bright arms exulting Tarquitus, whom Dryope the nymph erewhile had borne to woodland Faunus, crossed his fiery path. He, drawing back his spear, pins fast in one the corslet and huge burden of his shield. Then as he vainly prays with many a word still ripe for utterance, 
hurled to earth his head, and rolling in the dust the yet warm trunk, in bitter mood spake o'er it. Now lie there, redoubted warrior, no kind mother's hand in earth shall hide thee, or heap above thy limbs ancestral soil, but to the ravenous birds shalt thou be left, or gulf shall drown and wave bear thee, and hungry fishes lip thy wounds. Antaeus next, and Lucas, foremost ranks of Turnus he o'ertakes, and Numa brave, and tawny Camers, noble Volscan's son, richest in land of all Ausonia's folk, who ruled in hushed Amicle. Even as when Aegion, fabled of a hundred arms, a hundred hands, and from whose fifty mouths and breasts blazed fire against the bolts of Jove, clashed on like shields as many, as many swords drew, so Aeneas over the wild plain rages his fill victoriously, when once his blade waxed warm. Nay, see, he moves to meet Nepheus' four-horse team in threatening front. Soon as they saw him striding with huge steps and fiercely muttering, the steeds wheeled for fear, rushed backward, and flung forth their lord and whirled the chariot shoreward. Lucagus, meanwhile, with twain white war steeds dashed amid the throng, he and his brother Liger. Liger reins and guides the horses, Lucagus waves fierce his circling sword blade. There so fiery rage, Aeneas brooked not, but upon them rushed, towering conspicuous with opposing spear. To whom spake Liger, Here dost thou behold, nor Diomede's coursers, nor Achilles' car, nor Phrygia's plain. The last of war and life now on this soil awaits thee. Such wild words fly from mad Liger's lips. But not in words Troy's hero shapes his answer. At the foe a dart he launches, and when Lucagus, low-leaning as to smite them, with the steel his team had chidden, and now left foot advanced, plants him for battle, through the nether rims of his bright buckler entering, the spear pierced his groin to leftward. Tumbled from the car, dying, he rolls upon the plain. To whom in bitter accents good Aeneas spake, Thy chariot, Lucagus, no coward flight of steeds betrayed, nor foe-flung shadows vain turned backward. Leaping from the wheels, thyself the car forsakest. So saying, he caught the team. Down from the chariot, stretching helpless hands, slid to the unhappy brother. By thyself and by the twain who framed thee that thou art, great Trojan leave me life, and to my plaint lend pitying ear. Yet more he would have prayed, when thus Aeneas, Not such the words erewhile thou utterest, Die, nor brother be divorced from brother. Thereat with the sword's point his breast he cleaves, and lets the life-breath from its lair. Thus through the plain the Dardan chief dealt death, raging like torrent wave or black typhoon. At length the young Ascanius and his host break forth, quit camp, and foil the leaguer's ring. Meanwhile to Juno thus high Jove begins. O sister mine, and sweetest wife in one, tis Venus as thou deemst, nor heirs aught thy judgment. Who upholds the power of Troy? Not warrior's right hand throbbing for the fray, nor fiery soul that all, that can all danger dare. Quoth Juno meekly, Wherefore, fairest lord, vex a sick heart of thy stern words afeard? Had but my love that power it boasted once, and still should boast, I had not asked in vain of thine omnipotence to grant me this. Leave to filch Turnus from the fight, and keep unscathed for Daunus for his sire. But now even let him perish, and with that loyal blood pay forfeit to the Teucrians. He Nathless draws from the stock of heaven his name, and springs forth from Pilumnus, and his lavish hand hath oft thy threshold heaped with bounteous gifts. Briefly to her spake high Olympus lord, If but from present death reprieve be asked, and respite for the warrior ere he fall, and thou perceivest I rule it so, bear hence away, Pluck Turnus from the impending fate. Such scope is mine to pleasure thee. But if there lurk beneath thy prayer some ampler boon, as deeming that the war war's whole course may shift and suffer change, thou feedst an empty hope. And Juno answered, weeping, What, and if thy heart vouchsafed me what thy lips deny, and pledge this loan of Turnus' life to last? Now some dread end awaits him innocent, or I drift void of truth. Yet oh to be by false fear cheated, and that thou who canst wouldst bend thy course to better. Having said, forthwith she darted from the welkin's height, 
and trailing storm through heaven and girt in cloud, sought Ilium's army and Laurentum's camp. Then out of hollow mist the goddess shapes a shade, thin, void of strength, in semblance like Aeneas, a monstrous marvel to behold, decks it with Darden gear and counterfeits the shield, the horse plume of the godlike head, gives unreal words, gives sound devoid of soul, and mocks the very motions of his stride, like phantoms that folk say flit after death, or visions that befool the slumbering sense. Now in the van of battle stalks the shade, exulting with its weapons goads the foe, with shouts defies him. Turnus rushes on it, and hurls from far a hissing spear. The shape wheels and retires. But Turnus, when he deemed Aeneas fled back, and with bewildered soul drank the delusive hope, cries, Whither fliest, Aeneas? Quit not thy plighted bridal bower. The soil thou hast crossed the waterways to find this hand shall yield thee. With such clamorous shouts, he follows and brandishes his naked blade, nor marks the light winds bear his boast away. Fast by a tall rock's base there chanced to stand, a vessel with steps set and gangway geared, which King Osinius bare from Clusium's coast. Hither the mock Aeneas hurrying fled, and plunged for shelter. Nor at slacker speed Turnus pursues, treads all that stays him down, clears the high bridge, and scarce had touched the prow, ere Saturn's daughter rends the rope and speeds o'er back-rolled billows the shore-sundered ship. Aeneas, meanwhile, defies a vanished foe, and many a warrior frame that crossed his path sends deathward. For no further shelter then seeks the light phantom, but took wing aloft, and with a dark cloud mingled. The rough blast, meanwhile, bears Turnus through the billow's midst. Blind to the cause, unthankful for escape, backward he gazes and lifts high his voice, with hands upclasped to heaven. Almighty sire, hast deemed me worthy of reproach so deep to pay such forfeit doomed me? Whither bound? Whence came I hither? What flight and in such guise wafts me from shore? Shall I again behold Laurentum's camp and bulwarks? What of those brave hearts, the followers of my sword and me? Whom one and all, ah, horror, I have left to nameless butchery. Yea, can see them now ranks scattered and hear groaning as they fall. What must I do? What land now deep enough can gape to hide me? Rather do ye winds take pity, and drive the ship on reef on rock. I, Turnus, from my heart implore, or cast on cruel quicksands, where no rutule foot, nor rumor that knows all may track me out. So saying, his soul rocks this way and rocks that, whether upon his sword, so deep the shame, madly to hurl him, and twixt rib and rib drive the stern blade, or plunge amid the seas, so swimming gain the curved beach, and fall once more upon the Teucrians. Either way thrice he essayed, thrice pitiful of heart, great Juno checked and held him. The ship skims, cleaving the deep, and sped by tide and wave, to his sire Daunus' ancient town is born. Fiery Mezentius, now by Jove's behest, takes up the battle and falls upon Troy's host amidst their triumph. The Etruscan ranks rally together, and on him alone, alone on him with gathered fury press and showering missiles, even as a rock that juts far out into the mighty main, bare to wind's brunt a target for the sea, all stress, all menace, both of sky and deep, out faces fixed abiding, so to earth he strikes down Hebrus, Dolcaon's son, and Latagus and Palmus as he fled. But Latagus, full in face and mouth surprised, with a huge fragment of hill-rock he smote. Hamstrung and helpless he let Palmus sprawl, and gave the arms to Lausus on his back to wear them, in his helm to fix the crest. Phrygian Euanthes too and Mimas, whom once friend of Paris and his peer in age, Thano bare to Amicus his sire, the selfsame knight that Sisius' royal child teemed with a firebrand and gave Paris birth. Paris within his father's city lies, Mimas unknown, Laurentum's coast doth keep. Lo, as a mighty boar by sharp-toothed hounds, driven from the mountain heights, which many a year pine-fruitful Vesulus hath sheltering held, many Laurentum's marshland, pastured fair within her reedy jungle, he, once come amid the meshes, halts with angry grunt, and bristles up his shoulders, none durst rage against him or draw nearer. At safe range with darts and shouts they harass him from far, he dauntless slowly to this side and that turns with teeth gnashing 
and shakes off the spears. So of all those who burned with righteous wrath against Mezentius, none durst draw the sword and close in onset, but with deafening shouts and far-sped shafts assail him. There had come from the ancient bounds of Corythus Greek, Akron, who, leaving half-done marriage rites, hath fled away, him seeing from afar amid the ranks deal havoc, gay with plumes, and in the purple of his plighted bride, as oft times ranging the deep forest lairs an unfed lion by mad hunger urged, if haply he hath spied a fleet-foot goat, or towering antlered stag exults and opes his monstrous jaws, uprears his mane, and hangs over the rent flesh couching, the foul gore drenches his cruel mouth, so eagerly upon the foeman's mass Mezentius leaps. Down goes the hapless Akron with his heels, hammers the dark earth, dying, and stains red the splintered spear shaft. He too deigned not smite Orodes flying, nor deal him a blind blow with javelin cast, but meets him face to face, and man to man encounters, by no stealth filching the vantage, but sheer force of arms. Then on the prostrate foe with foot and spear pressing he spake, here tall Orodes lies, my men, no paltry portion of the war. His comrades after him glad Paeon raise, with ebbing breath the other. Whoe'er thou art, not unavenged I fall, nor long shalt thou enjoy thy victory. For thee too, like fates, are watching, the same fields thou shalt soon press. <laughs> to whom Mezentius with wrath mingled smile, Now die, the sire of gods and king of men shall look to me. So saying, he drew the spear from out the hero's body, stern repose and iron slumber, slumber on his eyelids press, and their orbs close in everlasting night. Caedicus then cuts down Alcathus, Sacrator slays Hydaspes, Rapo's sword falls on Parthenius and the naughty strength of Orses. Clonius by Mesippus dies with Lyconian Erisites, one stretched prone by stumbling of his reinless steed, one foot to foot confronting him. Forth stood Aegis the Lycian, too, whom Valorous Nathless, not lacking of ancestral worth, smote to the dust. Then Thronius by the hand of Salius. Salius by Nealces falls, for javelin and far-stealing arrow famed. Fell Mavors now was meeting forth to each, like dole and mutual death. Both equally victors, both vanquished, slew and fell nor thought of flight had either. In Jove's hall the gods of these and those the fruitless rage lament, and that poor mortals should such toils endure. Venus on one side gazes, and on one Saturnian Juno. Pale Tisiphone raves on amid their thousands on the plain. But now Mezentius, shaking his huge spear, into the field strides stormily, and lo, vast as Orion when he cleaves a path, wading through middle Nereus' mightiest pools, and with his shoulder tops the waves, or when, bearing an ash, aged from mountain height, he stalks on earth and hides his head in cloud, so strode Mezentius onward, vast in arms. Aeneas adown the line of battle spies, and moves to meet him. He his noble foe dauntless abides, and plants his ponderous bulk, then measuring with his eyes a spear throws space, now let my right hand's godhead and the dart I poise for flight bestead me. Here I vow to make thee, Lausus, thee a living man, arrayed in spoils torn from the robber's corpse, my trophy of Aeneas. He had said, and hurled from hand a hissing spear. It flew and glanced from off the shield, and pierced afar noble Antores betwixt side and loin. Antores, friend of Hercules, who sent from Argos to Evander Clave, and found beneath Italian walls a home. But, ah, smit by another's wound he lies, and looks on heaven, and dying of his dear Argo streams. Then good Aeneas hurls a spear. It sped right through the hollow disk of threefold brass, through layers of linen, and the inwoven work of triple bull's hide, and lodged low in the groin, but pushed not home its passage. Swiftly then Aeneas drew sword, rejoicing to behold the Tuscan's blood, Forth plucks it from his thigh, and hotly presses on the staggered foe. Lausus, for love of his dear sire grown deep, at sight of it, and tears rolled o'er his face. Nor hear thy piteous doom, thy matchless deeds, if length of time e'er make believable, 
such exploits, nor thyself, brave youth, right meet to be remembered, while I leave unsung. He, thus defenseless and sore hampered now, was back retiring, trailing from his shield the foeman's dart. Forth leapt the youth, and thrust betwixt their points. And as Aeneas' right hand now rose to strike, ran in beneath his sword, and hindering stayed the striker. Loud his folk cheer him, and follow with their eyes, until the sire, sun-shielded, might win safe retreat, and hurl their javelins and bear back the foe with darts from afar. Aeneas storms with rage and keeps shield covered. As when, with boisterous hail, the clouds fall headlong, plow folk every one and country hinds fly scattered from the fields, and cowers the wayfarer in some safe hold or river bank, or high or arching rock, while rain still pelts the earth that they may task the daylight with returning sunshine, so Aeneas, o'erwhelmed with countless darts, endures the war cloud till it growl itself away. Still chiding Lausus, threatening Lausus, why rush upon death and overdare thy strength? Love fools thee into rashness. Not the less madly he riots, till in the Dardan chief fierce wrath rose headier, and the sister fates Lausus' last threads upgather. For now drives Aeneas his strong sword through the stripling's frame, till the whole blade is buried. His light shield, frail arms for one so threatening, the point pierced and pierced the tunic which of pliant gold his mother wove him, and blood filled his breast. Then life, regretful on its airy way, fled to the shades and left the body lone. But when he saw the dying look and face, the face so wondrous pale, Anchises' son uttered a deep groan, pitying him, and stretched his right hand forth, as in his soul there rose the likeness of the love he bore his sire. Poor boy, what guerdon for thy glorious deeds! Say what, to match that mighty heart of thine, shall good Aeneas yield thee? Those thine arms wherein thou gloriedst, keep them, and thyself, if such a care may touch thee, to the shades and ashes of thy fathers I restore. Unhappy, yet for thy sad end some balm be this, by great Aeneas thou art slain. Then hails he his attendants, chiding them, for loiterers, and uplifts their lord from earth, where he lay dabbling his trim locks with blood. Meanwhile the sire by Tiber's stream now staunched his wounds with water, and for ease lay propped against a tree trunk. On the boughs apart hangs the brass helmet, and his ponderous arms rest on the meadow sward. About him stand his flower of war, he panting and in pain foments his neck, and lets the flowing beard o'erspread his bosom. Many a time inquires of Lausus, and oft sends to call him back and bear the lad his sorrowing sire's command. But Lausus laid on shield a lifeless corpse, his friends in tears were bearing, mighty soul quelled by a mighty wound. The father's heart, ill-boding, recognized their wail afar. With showers of dust his hoary locks he soils, and spreads both hands to heaven and clasps his arms about the corpse. Did then such joy of life possess me, O my son, that in my stead I suffered thee, even thee whom I begat, to meet the foeman's stroke? Am I thy sire, saved through thy wounds, and living by thy death? Ah, to my sorrow now at last I know, what exile is, now is the wound pushed home. Yea, and I too with infamy, my son, thy name have spotted by men's hate of me, thrust from the throne and scepter of my sires. To mine own country and my people's spite I should have paid the forfeit, by all deaths freely have yielded up this guilty life. Now I live on, from men and light of day not yet departing, but depart I will. So saying at once upon his wounded thigh he raised him, and albeit from the deep wound his force flagged somewhat, with no downcast air called for his war steed. This was I his pride, and this his solace. Hereon was he wont from all his wars to ride victorious home. The sorrowing creature now, the, now he thus bespeaks. We have lived long, O Rabus, if aught long pertain to mortals. Or today shalt thou bear back in triumph the bloody spoils and head of yon Aeneas, and be of Lausus' pangs my co-avenger. Or, if all force fail our path to open, shalt beside me lie. No, nor wilt thou, methinks, my bravest, Dane brook stranger's bidding o'er a Teucrian lord. He said, and mounting on his willing back, as ever want bestrode him, and both hands charged with keen javelins, his head bright with brass, 
shaggy with horsehair plume. So galloping, he dashed amidst them. In one single heart upsurges a vast tide of shame and grief with fury mingled, and thrice o'er he called with mighty voice, Aeneas! Well, I trow, Aeneas knew it and prayed a jubilant prayer. May the great sire of gods so bring to pass, so Lord Apollo, fall on, begin the fray. Thus much he spake, and with his threatening spear moved on to meet him. But the other cried, Reft of my son, why thinkest thou, fierce man, to fright me now? Sole way was this whereby to work my ruin. I shudder not at death, no, nor spare any of thy gods. Now cease, I come to die, but bring me first these gifts. He spake and hurled a dart against the foe, then yet another and another plants, in a wide circle wheeling, but the boss of gold bides all. Thrice round the watchful foe rode he in rings to leftward from his hand launching the javelins. Thrice the Trojan prince bears round with him upon his brazen targe a dense spear forest, then wearying to prolong delays so many, so many darts to pluck, and by the unequal conflict sore bestead, much inly pondering, forth at last he springs, and in betwixt the war steed's hollow brows hurls his spear mightily. The beast reared up, lashed with his hooves the air, his rider flung, then following him head downward pinned to earth, and with his shoulder pressed the fallen man. Trojan and Latin shouts set heaven ablaze. Up speeds Aeneas and plucks sword from sheath, then o'er him. Where is bold Mezentius now, and all his heart's wild violence? Unto whom the Etruscan, as up glancing he drew in a draught of heaven, and to himself returned. Why, bitter foe, dost taunt and threaten death? In slaying is no sin. Nor with such thought came I to battle, nor did my lausus so pledge terms betwixt us. This alone I crave, by what so grace to fallen foes may be. Let earth my body hide. Girt round am I with bitter hate of my own folk, I wot. Fend me from this their rage, and with my son grant fellowship and burial. So he spake, welcomed the sword to his expectant throat, and o'er his arms let pour life's ruddy tide. My name is Carla Mehmet. I currently teach at Kepler Education in Literature. I also teach homeschool co-op classes in the Northern California area where we focus on critical reading, Socratic discussion, and critical writing. Today I am reading from Chapter 11 of the Aeneid by Virgil. I will be reading from the translation by Sarah Rudin, published by Yale University in 2008. Chapter 11. Dawn arose away from the ocean. Though Aeneas chafed to inter his friends, though he was tortured by grief, he took the time as morning broke to make his promised victory offerings. He lopped the branches from the huge oak, set it on a mound and decked it with shining armor of Mezentius the chieftain as a trophy for the war god. He attached the broken spear, the blood-soaked crest, the pierced and battered breastplate at its left side. The figure held the shield from the neck the ivory-hilted sword hung. Aeneas spoke to stir the Trojan leaders, all cheering in a close-packed crowd around him. We've achieved something great, men. Don't be anxious for the future. These first fruits are from a proud king. This is Mezentius, work of my hands, now will attack the Latin king and town. Prepare for war with bold anticipation, so ignorance, fear, and second thoughts don't slow you down, 
So you are ready with the God's consent to standards hoisted, troops led from the camp. Now we must give the earth our comrades' bodies. This is the only honor down in Acheron. Go, grant these final tribute to the great souls who won this country for us with their blood. But first, send Pallas to Evander City. How he will mourn. An earthly death, a black day, engulfed this warrior who was no coward. He spoke in tears, then walked back to his doorway where Pallas's corpse was laid out. It was guarded by old Echodes, squire to Evander in Arcadia, but ill-fatedly deputed to go with his dear foster child, around whom his entourage now stood with Trojan soldiers and Trojan women with their hair loose mourning. And when Aeneas came beneath the high gates, the people beat their breast and raised a moan to the stars, and heavy grief rang through the king's house. When he saw Pallas's ivory face, his head propped and the gaping wound from the Italian spear point in his smooth chest, Aeneas sobbed and spoke, My poor boy, were you all that changing fortune, fortune begrudged me? You will never see my kingdom or ride back to your father's home in triumph. This isn't how I pledged to care for you when Evander sent me off with his embraces to win a great realm. Warning that I'd fight a rugged nation and ferocious soldiers. Perhaps right now the king, a dupe of hope, heaps altars with his gifts, prays for your safety, while empty honor, we in grief escort this youth who now owes nothing to the gods. How cruel, how pitiful to see his son dead. Is this the glorious return we hoped for? Is my great trust fulfilled? Yet you, his father, will see no wounds of cowardice in his back or pray for death yourself because he's living. Italy, Ilias, what a shield you've lost. He ordered that the piteous corpse be lifted. Choosing a thousand men from all his forces, he sent them to attend the final honors and share the father's tears for such a great loss, small comfort, yet it was the poor man's due. Others worked hard to weave a wicker buyer out of the soft oak twigs and arbutus branches, built up the couched and make a leafy canopy. High on this rustic bed, they laid the boy out like a blossom that a young girl's hand has reaped, a drooping hyacinth or a tender violet. Its beauty and its brightness lingering, but without food or strength from Mother Earth. Then Aeneas brought out two robes, stiff with gold and purple dye, made long ago by Dido of Sidon. Happy in the task, her own hands had worked the fine gold threads into the weave. He chose one sad last gift and drew it up over the young man's hair, which soon would burn. He heaped up spoils from the Laurentian battle and had them taken in a long procession along with spears and mounts the boy had plundered. He'd bound the hands of captives, offering to the dead for the blood to sprinkle on the flames. He made his captains carry tree trunks labeled with enemy names and hung with enemy arms. Men led along Achaeotes, wrecked by old age, he clawed his face and bruised his chest 
with pounding and then fell forward, sprawling on the earth. Rutilian chariots filed by, soaked in blood, and then came Pallas's war horse, Atheon, stripped of insignia, his face wet with great tears. Then the youth's spear and helmet, Turnus claimed the rest. Trojans, Arcadians, Tuscans, their arms reversed, came in sad array. When this whole file had traveled out a long way, Aeneas stopped and gave a heavy sigh. War's same grim fates call me to other tears. Farewell, however, now my glorious palace. Bless you for all time. Now the man fell silent and strode back to the high walls of his fort. Ambassadors in olive wreaths were there from the Latin city asking for a favor that he give back the slaughtered bodies scattered on the plain for burial on a mound of earth. Lightless, defeated, they were not at war now. He ought to show past hosts and in-laws mercy. Aeneas the Good could not rebuff this plea. Graciously, he assented and continued. How have you been caught up in this war you don't deserve? Why do you run from friends? Now, for the sake of those who died in battle, you plead for peace. I'd give it to the living. I only claim the home fate grants me here. It's not your people, but your king I am fighting, who broke our guest bond, trusting Turnus's weapons, and he's the one who should have faced his death. If he had to fight this out and drive the Trojans from the country, why not meet me hand to hand and let swords or a god decide who lived? Go now and light the pyres of your poor people. The men were stricken by his words. Their eyes turned to each other and they held their peace. Old Drances, always hostile and a cursing toward the young Turnus, spoke up in reply. Hero of Troy, great in your fame, but greater in battle, how could I extol you more, first marveling at your warfare or your justice? We'll gladly take your message to our city and join you to our king, Latinus, fortune allowing. Turnus needs to make his own packs. We're happy to haul stones on our own shoulders and raise the destined walls of your new Troy. They all roared their assent when he had finished. They made a 12-day truce, and in its calm, Trojans and Latins roamed the woods and mountains unharmed together. Double axes rang on high ash trees, and soaring pines were toppled. Steadily, they split oak and fragrant cedar with wedges. Wagons groaned with mountain ash. Now, Rumor, who had just told of Pallas's triumph in Latium, in Latium, flew away with early news of anguish to blight Evander's heart and house and city. Snatching up torches for their ancient death rites, the Arcadians swarmed the gate. A row of flames stretched down the road. Light split the land in two. The retinue of Trojans joined their ranks of mourning. Matrons saw them reach the houses and set the town alight with shouts of grief. No one was strong enough to hold Evander. He pushed into the crowd where the buyer rested and fell on Pallas, crying, clinging, groaning. At last, his anguish let a few words through. Pallas, this isn't what you promised me. Caution in trusting wild Mars with your life. But I knew how a first campaign can be. The sweet allure of glory when it's new. Oh, Pitiful first offering, hard first lesson in war so close at hand. No one God heard my prayers and pledges. 
you, the blessed spirit of my wife, how lucky not to feel this pain. I've triumphed over fate, outlived my son. If only I had gone along and buried my own life in the spears of the Rutalians, and this procession brought me home, not palace. Trojans, you're not to blame, and not our friendship or treaty. This was fated for my old age. Though he was bound to die, there will be comfort. He killed so many thousands of the Volsians and fell while leading Trojans into Latium. And Pallas, I could wish no worthier rights than good Aeneas and the Trojan lords, the Tuscan captains and their whole force give you. They bring huge trophies of the men you've slaughtered. Turnus would stand here too, with a log of weapons here, were he as young as you, with your year's strength. But my grief mustn't hinder Trojan warfare. Go, tell your king that with my palace gone, I keep my hated life because he knows his sword owes Turnus to this son and father. His luck, his heroism are for this. My fate forbids me joy in life, but let me bring my son word among the dead below. Meanwhile, Dawn raised her nurturing light and summoned wretched mankind back to its work and hardship on the curved shore. Tarkhan and the Lord Aeneas built pyres where everyone might bring his dead according to tradition. Kindling black flames, they hid the towering sky in foggy darkness. In their bright armor, soldiers marched three times around the lighted pyres. Three times the horsemen circled the dismal fires and raised their wails. Their tears rained on the weapons and the earth and warriors cries and horns blasted struck the sky. Some threw in plunder torn from slaughtered Latins, helmets and fine swords, bridles, wheels that once seethed against their axles. Other men gave gifts the dead knew, their own shields and losing weapons. Oxen were sacrificed to death on all sides, bristled wild boars, and loot from every pasture bled from their throats into the fire. The beach was full of friends who watched friends burn and nursed the half-dead pyres and clung their damp night, wheeled round a sky bejeweled with burning stars. Elsewhere, the Latins, too, in desolation, built countless pyres. Out of the throng of bodies, some were interred, some carried to the country nearby, and others sent back to the city. The rest they burned. A heap of muddled carnage, uncounted and unhonored. Ravaged fields were glowing with the avid crowd of fires, a third dawn swept away the chill of darkness. The mourners leveled jumbled bones and ash piles and heaped the warm earth on them in a mound. But in the homes of rich Latinus city, the long drawn shrieks of mourning were the greatest. Here mothers and their sons, poor wives and sisters tenderly sorrowing and orphaned children cursed the disastrous war for Turnus's wedding. He ought to fight it out, since he demanded Italy's kingship and the highest honors. Drances was there to goad them on, attesting that Turnus had been challenged, no one else. Yet Turnus had his various supporters. He sheltered in the glory of the great queen and could rely on fame from his own trophies. And now, amid the flames of this contention, came this from Diomedes' famous city, 
The envoys brought an answer. The huge effort had failed. The fervid pleas, the gifts of gold did nothing. They must find another ally or ask the Trojan ruler for a truce. The massive blow crushed even King Latinus. The anger of the gods in the fresh tombs left no doubt. It was fate that brought Aeneas. Therefore he summoned all his people's leaders, his council, for a meeting in his halls. They streamed together to the palace, filling the streets, and the eldest and the king, grim-faced Latinus, took the central seat. He asked to hear what answer had come back from the Aetolian city, every detail from start to finish, then a call for silence, and Venelus obediently began. Citizens, we came safely through our journey to Diomedes in his Argive camp and clasped the hand that brought Troy's kingdom down. Where he'd conquered, he was laying out Argipa, named for his clan, near the Appian Garganus. They showed us in and gave us leave to speak. We proffered gifts and told our names and country and who made war on us and why we had come to Arpi. With a tranquil face, he answered, Oh, ancient, fortunate Italian races, kingdoms of Saturn, after your long peace, what lures you, what incites you into war? All of us who laid waste to, to Troy have paid horribly for our crimes throughout the world. And what of the warriors under Samoa's waters and our suffering beneath the lofty walls? Priam would weep for us. Witness the storm Minerva sent and the vengeful cliff Caphorus. We scattered to the world's end Menelaus clear out the Proteus columns and Ulysses to Cyclops in, at, at Edna, and the short reign of Neotomus, the shattered household of Idomenus, the Locretians in Libya, the Mycenaean leaders of all the Greeks arrived home for, for his evil wife to butcher. He'd conquered Asia, but her lover lurked. The gods begrudged me my ancestral altars, the wife I yearn for, Calydon in its beauty. I'm hounded even now by grisly visions of my friends changed into birds, roaming the streams and winging skyward, monstrous punishment. The cliffs re-echo with their sobbing calls, but what was I expecting since the moment I lost my mind and stabbed at a divine form, profaning Venus's right hand with a wound? No, don't urge more such battles, not on me. Since Troy was overthrown, I have no quarrel with the Trojans. I did not enjoy those struggles. These gifts you bring me from your country, take them to Aeneas. I have fought him hand to hand, faced his cruel weapons. I know, so believe me, how high he rears behind his shield, how fiercely his spear whirls. Had Mount Ida's country bred two more like him, Troy could have visited on the Greek towns in the morning meant for Troy. All that long siege of stubborn Ilium, ten years of victory stalling and retreating, we owed to Hector and Aeneas only, both known for bravery and skill in war, but one more pious. Clasp hands, make a treaty. You have the chance. Avoid a clash of arms. Sovereign, that sovereign sends you this reply and gives his view of this momentous war. Immediately, conflicting anxious words raced among the Italians like a roar of torrents choked by boulders, like the banks echoing back the clatter of the current. But when the nervous crowd again grew silent, the high-throned king called on the gods, then spoke. Latins, 
An early plan to meet this crisis would have been better than to call a meeting now when the enemy blockades our walls. How can we fight with children of the gods with these unwearying, unconquered heroes? They're beaten, but they've never put down their swords. Atolian allies? Give that hope up now. We all have hopes. You see what this one's worth. Everything else that's ruined in our cause, you have before your own eyes. You can touch it. I don't blame anyone. You've reached the limits of courage, fought with all our nation's strength. Now listen while I tell you in a few words the judgment that, through all my doubts, I've come to. I have an old track by the Tuscan River. It stretches west past the Sinkian border. Arunkans and Rutilians plow and sow its hard hills. On the roughest heights their herds graze. I'll give this and any strip of piney summit to the Trojans for their friendship. We must make fair terms with them and let them share the kingdom. If they're so eager, they can raise their walls and settle. If it's other land they want and they're allowed to leave our soil, we'll build them 20 ships from our own Italian oak. If they can man more, wood is on the coast. How many boats and what kind, they must say. We will supply the labor, bronze, and dockyards. I'll send the hundred noblest Latins to take the news and finalize the treaty. These will present the olive boughs of peace and gold and ivory in hundred weights and the robe and throne that signify this kingship. Confer together, save us from disaster. Drances, still hostile, rose. Half hidden, half hidden envy of Turnus's stature galled him. He was lavish with his goods and in his eloquence a hero, but not in war. A well-regarded counselor and a rabble rouser gloriously descended from his mother's side, obscurely from his father's. He now spoke, stroking up the fire of hatred. Good king, to all of us your plan makes sense. What can I add? Everyone should acknowledge our town's way forward, but they're all too frightened. He needs to stop his rants and let me speak. This man is evil, a disastrous leader. I'll say it, though he threatens me with death. All those fine captains died. We sank in grief when he attacked the Trojan fortress, shaking his sword at heaven, though prepared to run. And one gift to the many that you send and promise to the Trojan peerless king, you are a father Get a splendid son through your daughter's marriage. Don't let any threats deter you. Make the bond of peace eternal. And if we're terrified, let us make our pleas to turn us here and ask him as a favor to let this king and country have their rights. You are a curse on Latium. Why keep throwing your hapless people into open danger? Turn us. The war can't save us. We all beg you for peace, which has one guarantee, so give it. You say I hate you, shouldn't I? But see, I am the first to kneel. Pity your country, lay down your pride. You're beaten, you should go. We are routed, slaughtered, so much land is raised. If you want your fame and your will so hard, and if you need a palace as a dowry, then dare to meet the enemy face to face. 
But no, to get a royal wife or turn us, we'll scatter our cheap lives across the plain, unwept, unburied. If you have the strength or the courage that your fathers had, go face your challenger. This kindled the ferocity of Turnus. He growled, and these words broke from deep within him. Drances, your eloquence just overflows whenever war needs fighters. You arrive first at every senate. Your majestic words fill it while you stay safe. While earthworks bar the enemy and moats don't brim with blood. Thunder on in your usual way. Accuse me of cowardice when as many heaps of Trojans have died by your hand when your splendid trophies litter the plain. Try for yourself what courage and energy can do. We needn't look far. The enemies are all around our walls. Shall we go face them now? Or will your fighting stay limited to feet that run away and a gusty tongue? You worm. I'm beaten? Who could say that if he saw the Tiber swelling with the blood of the Trojans, the armor stripped from the Arcadians, and Evander's house brought down without an heir? Beaten? To giant Batais, to Pandarus, and the thousands I subdued and sent to Hades, though I was penned up in enemy walls? The war can't save us? Idiot. Give that warning to the Trojans and yourself. Go on, keep muddling our plains with terror, a twice beaten nation, so powerful, our Latin arms so frail. Myrmidon chiefs, Achilles from Larissa and Diomedes quake at Trojan warfare. Theophidus bolts uphill from the Adriatic. There's more. This cunning bastard, when I taunt him, shams fear. It gives his allegations force. My hand won't take a soul like yours. Don't worry. Keep it there, living in your worthless self. Now, to your great deliberations, Father. If you can place no further hope in fighting, if we've abandoned if from one retreat ruin prevails and fortune can't turn back, let's hold our weak hands out and beg for peace. I long for any trace of our past bravery, and I prefer the man who won't surrender, who'd rather bite the dust once and for all. He has the most heart. He's most blessed in hardship. But we still have supplies and men to call on, and allied towns and tribes in Italy, and the Trojans got their glory with a bloodbath. The same storm fell on them, and they have their losses. Why pitifully give in already, quaking down to our toes before the trumpet sounds? Often the changing work of shifting time brings good again. Commonly, fortune alters and sets her victims back on the steady ground. Arpi and its Aetolian king won't help us. Lucky Tolumnus, Mesopus leaders from many towns, will. The picked men of Latium and Laurentum farms will get no petty fame. And there's Camilla of the glorious Volsians, leading her mounted squadrons brought with bronze. If the Trojans challenged me to single combat, and you say yes, since I'm our stumbling block, I'm willing. Victory hasn't yet rebuffed me. Any risk that I have to take is worth it. He's greater than Achilles and wears armor like that Vulcan made. I will still face him. I'm Turnus. I'm the equal of my fathers to you all and my father-in-law, Latinus. I have vowed my life. I beg for single combat. I won't. I don't want Drance's pain with his death for the gods' rage or getting any glory so that they wrangled in this time of danger. 
Meanwhile, Aeneas moved his camp and forces. The news sped through the palace, spreading uproar. The city soon was overwhelmed with terror. The Trojans and the Tuscans had deployed at the Tiber, come sweeping down the plain. The common people were appalled and stricken and stung into even greater anger and the feverish calls for arms. Youths roared for arms, fathers wept in fear. A racket rose to the sky from everywhere, a storm of discord. As a flock clatters, settling in some tall grove, or swans call hoarsely over sounding shallows. Of the Pedusa River, filled with fish, Turnus then seized his chance. Yes, citizens, let's call a meeting and sit praising peace while they invade our land. He said no more, but rushed away out of the towering building. Volusus, call the Volsian bands to arm. Bring the Rutilians, Coras, with your brother, and Messapus. Spread your horsemen on the plain. Block the approaches, too, and man the towers. The rest can follow me in the attack. Immediately the town rushed to the walls, and even Lord Latinus fled to the meeting in the crisis and put off his great endeavors. Contrite that he'd not taken in Aeneas straight off as son-in-law and city sharer. They dug moats at the gates and hauled in borders and spikes. The trumpet hoarsely called for blood. Everyone came out. Mothers and their children stood on the walls in an uneven line. To Pallas's temple on the heights, the queen drove with offerings and matrons thronged around her. Beside her was the girl, Lavinia, cause of the crisis, looking down with fine eyes. Women climbed the shrine with gifts of incense, and their grief echoed from the lofty door. Strong, weaponed ruler of war, Tritonian virgin, shatter the Phrygian pirate's spear and stretch him on the earth, face down before our city gates. Fierce and impatient, Turnus dressed for battle. Already he had on a ruddy breastplate, bristling with scales and golden greaves. Through his head, though his head was still bare, and a sword hung on his side. Gleaming with gold, he raced from the high stronghold and thrilled anticipation of the fight. As a stallion breaks his rope, bolts from the barn and gains the open flatlands, finally free, and gallops to the mares that crowd the pastures or to the rivers that he used to bathe in, arching his neck exuberantly high while his mane plays across his neck and withers. Royal Camilla, with her Volsian force, hurried to meet him. Right outside the gates, she now dismounted. Her battalion, likewise, slid down on their feet before she spoke. If bravery brings the confidence it should, I'll undertake to face Aeneas's horsemen and ride alone against the mounted Tuscans. I'll go to meet the hazards of this war. You take a stand on foot and guard the walls. Turnus stared at the formidable girl. You are Italy's glory. Could I ever thank you or decently repay you? But we know your matchless spirit. Let me share your efforts. Rumors backed up by scouts tell us Aeneas has insolently sent ahead light horsemen to scour the plains, and he himself is coming to the city by a steep, unguarded ridge. I plan an ambush at a covered path of the forest with armed troops both ways out. Draw up your troops to meet the Tuscan horse charge with keen Messapus. Latin cavalry and Tiburtus's band, you take command as well. He roused Messapus and allied captains, likewise, and then sent off to meet his enemy. There 
is a twisting valley, a good trap, darkly and thickly overgrown. Two cliffs crowd from its sides. A wispy path leads in, and at both ends the jaws are grim and narrow. Above and among the towering lookout palaces, there is a hidden clearing, a good refuge to attack from, swooping from the left and the right, and boulders can be rolled down from the slopes. Swiftly by a familiar route, the young man arrived and took his lurking woodland post. Where the gods live above, Latona's child now spoke these words of sorrow to swift Opis, one of her sacred retinue of virgins. For all the good they'll do her, my Camilla puts on my arms and marches to cruel war. She is my favorite, and my love for her is no new charm or impulse in my soul. Deposed through hatred of his tyranny, Metabus left Pravernum's ancient city, escaping from rebellion into exile. He took his baby, who was called Camilla, a small change from her mother's name, Casmilla. He made for the bleak woods along the mountains with the infant in his arms. Volsian troops swarmed savagely sniping at him from all sides. The Amasinus foamed beyond its banks and trapped him. So much rain had burst the clouds. He was prepared to swim, but hesitated in fear of his dear burden. He was forced to make a rapid choice among his options. In the strong hand, the warrior had a huge spear of seasoned hard oak with a mass of knots. He wrapped his child in woodland cork tree bark and deftly tied her halfway down the shaft. Poised in his great fist and called to heaven, Latona's pure, kind daughter, forest dweller, a father vows his child to you. It's your spear she first holds. At your mercy, she's escaping. I trust her to the hazardous air, so claim her. His arm drew back. He sent the weapon hurling. The water roared. Above the rapid river flew poor Camilla on the hissing spear. And Metabas, as the enemy band drew close, dove in and, triumph, plucked Diana's gift, his daughter, from the grassy bank. No walls, no homes of the cities took him in, but such a savage wouldn't have submitted. In lonely heights where shepherds live, his life passed, and there, among the thickets and the beast lairs, he milked a half-wild brood mare from the herd into his daughter's tender lips to nurse her. And when the baby's first steps pressed on the ground, he placed a sharp spear in her hand and hung a bow and quiver from her tiny shoulder. Instead of a gold headband and a long robe, a tiger skin was on her head and back. Already her soft hand flung childish weapons and she could whirl a sling on its smooth leash to bring down the Stramonian crane or a swan. Throughout the Tuscan cities, many mothers wanted her for their sons. She was content with me and longed to stay a virgin huntress, untouched. If only she were not caught up in warfare and in challenging the Trojans, she would be with me still, a cherished comrade. Go, since a bitter fate is tracking her. Glide from these heights, visit the Latin country, where the pitiful ill omen fight is starting, and take this quiver, an avenging arrow, must claim as much blood from the soldier wounding her sacred body, Trojan or Italian. I'll take her poor corpse in a cloud, its armor unplundered, and entomb it in her country. Opus sailed lightly down through the airy heaven, veiled in a storm cloud, but her weapons rang. The Trojan company now approached the walls with Tuscan chiefs, 
and with all the cavalry, counted into their units. Horses pranced and neighed and swerved and yanked, resisting reins everywhere on the plain. Bristles of iron, a burning haze of spears hid the broad plain. The Latins and Messapas hurried forward. Camilla's wing and Chorus with her, his brother appeared among them, charging, thrusting spears forward and back and shaking javelins. The men and neighing horses blazed ahead, but stopped within a spear's throw of each other, then raised a shout and urged their stormy horses into the center. Weapons poured from all sides as thick as snow and wove the sky in shadow. Acontius, Tyrannus sped together with a shove of spears and were the first to fall. Their horses' breasts collided with a loud crack of broken bones and like a thunderbolt of catapulted rock. Acontius was hurled away. His soul seeped through the air. The Latin army turned in sudden panic, shields on their back, and galloped to the walls. Asilus led the Trojan squad that chased them. Nearing the gates, the Latins gave a war cry again and turned their horses' pliant necks. The Trojans now gave rein and fell far back as the surf swells back and forth in its assault, rushes to the land with foamy waves on high rocks, arches to the flood, the beach, to its far edge, and then retreats pulls the spinning stones into its froth. The water thins, the shore is bare. Twice, Tuscans drove Rutilians toward the city. Twice, they were sent back with their shields behind them. But the third encounter saw the whole front lines embroiled as every man fixed on another. Truly, the dying groaned then. In blood marshes rolled bodies, arms and half-dead horses mottled with human gore as bitter fighting surged. Orsilicus shrank from Remulus, but launched at his horse. The spear point lodged below its ear. The beast, in rage and agony, reared high, lashing its forelegs while its fallen master writhed on the ground. Catullus took down Aeolus, and then Hermeneus, great in weapons, bulk and spirit, his torso and his tiny head were naked, fearless. He left his giant body open to attack. The spear transfixed his massive soldiers, quivering he was doubled in pain. Black gore flowed everywhere. They fought, they stabbed, they killed, and in their wounds sought glorious death. Like an Amazon, Camilla, with her quiver and her one breast bared, revealed amid the slaughter now showering a hail of pliant spears, now with a strong axe in her tireless fist. On her shoulder clanged the bow of Diana, and when forced to give ground and pursued, she turned round and aimed her arrows backwards. Her retinue was choice. The girls Lorena, Tarpia and Tula, shaking her bronze axe, Italian's bright Camilla picked to serve her staunchly her ornaments in peace and war. Like Amazons who galloped in the shallows of the Thermidon and fight in painted armor with Hippolyta, or the ranks of women with crescent shields who wildly whoop the praises of Penthesilea as she comes from battle. Hard girl, who did you first unhorse? Who last? How many lay there dying from your blows? Clytius' son, Eunaeus, was the first. 
Her long fur shaft impaled his naked chest. He spewed blood, falling, gnawed the gory earth, and writhed and curled around his wound in death. Then she killed too. When Lyris's horse collapsed and threw him as he grappled for reins, and Pegasus stretched a bare right hand to catch him, both plummeted together. Then a mastress and Hippotas' son. She chased Harpoclus, Chromius, Terius, Demophon with hard flung missiles. For every spear hurled from the virgin's hands, a Phrygian warrior died. Arentius, far off, had an Apollonian mount and curious armor. To go to war, he covered his broad shoulders with a skin ripped from a bull and kept the head safe. In, an enormous, in a wolf's enormous gaping mouth and white teeth, his weapon was a country spike. He shifted through the middle of the throng, a head above it. She caught him easily amid the rout and spoke in hate above his skewered body. Tuscan, you thought you were in the woods hunting? This day a woman's weapons prove your boasts wrong. Yet Camilla's spear has killed you. You'll take this glory to your father's ghosts. Straight off, she killed the giant Trojan's beauties and Ursilicus, spearing beauties from behind on the gleaming white defenseless strip of his neck as he rode dangling his spear from his left shoulder. Chased by Ursilicus in a great circle, she doubled back inside it. Now she chased him, then rose to hammer with a sturdy axe through his armor and his bones, though he kept begging for his life. His warm brain spattered on his face. The warrior son of Anuus from the Apennines, a great Ligurian while fate kept him lying, stood frozen when he found himself before her. He knew he couldn't turn aside the princess or get away, however fast his mount. Quickly, he plotted what to do and spoke. What's so remarkable? A woman trusting her strong horse for escape? Send him away. Arm for a fair fight, hand to hand, on foot. You'll soon find out how emptily you boasted. Stung with a taunt, she handed off her horse in rage and took a bold stance, armed like him with a foot soldier's naked sword and a plain shield. The young man thought his trickery had worked. Without a moment's pause, he wheeled his horse and sped it in retreat with iron spurs. Ligurgian, full of nothing but yourself, the sick ploys of your country won't succeed here and take you home safe to the swindler's Annas, the young girl spoke. On foot, as swift as fire, she ran his horse down. Facing it, she seized the reins and took his hated blood in vengeance and easily as a sacred falcon soars from the cliffs pursues a dove in a lofty cloud, catches it tight, guts it with his hooked talons till blood and torn out feathers fall from heaven. The father of gods and mortals, sitting throned on Olympia's peak, observed the scene with keen eyes. The patriarch sharply spurred Etruscan Tarkin to fury and savagery of the battle. Through slaughter and collapsing lines, the man rode with various shouts to goad the squads. He called each by name, regrouping them for battle. Etruscans, will cowardice ever shame you? What terror grips your cringing hearts today? A woman drives our ranks in rout and chaos. Don't you know what to do with swords and spears? 
for love and your campaigns at night, you're eager for dances, Bacchus curving flute announces. The tables will be rich with food and wine, your guiding passions when an Argor sanctions our victory rites and fat offering calls you to the tall groves. He wheeled, he spurred toward the center prepared to die. He wildly charged at Venelus and tore him from his horse. He clasped his enemy with all his strength and sped away. A shout rose to the sky and all the Latins watched. Tarkhan blazed down the broad field with his captive arms and all, and he snapped the spearhead off and groped for some unguarded place to thrust it lethally. Venelus fought back and blocked stabs to his throat. Strength against strength, they grappled like a tawny eagle soaring with a snake, snatched from the ground and fastened in its claws. The wounded thing flails with its twisting coils, raises its spiky scales and rears its head, hissing its captor gouges at these struggles with a hooked beak while beating through the high air. So Tarkhan fetched his prize from Tiber's front lines, elated. When his Tuscans saw this exploit, they charged. Fate's hand had come to rest on Arun's. Craftily, he kept circling swift Camilla, clutching his spear and looking for his best chance. Wherever the girl raged through heavy fighting, Arun's came after her softly tracking her. Where she beat down the enemy and withdrew, the young man slyly turned his horse to follow. He tested this and that way all around, shaking his deadly spear unstoppable. Glorious Sibylle's votary, once her priest, happened to stand out in bright Phrygian armor. He spurred a foam-mouthed horse with his leather trappings, had bronze scales linked by gold in feather patterns. He wore exotic red and splendid purple and shouldered a gold Lycian bow with arrows from Sicily. The helmet of the priest was gold. A gold brooch caught the rusting folds of a saffron linen cloak. Embroidery covered his tunic and barbarian leggings. The huntress longing to nail Trojan weapons on the temple door or wear proud captive gold picked the man out of all the strife and tracked him blindly and recklessly across the flannix. On fire with a woman's love of plunder, this was when Aaron saw his chance to trap her at last. He raised his spear and prayed to heaven, Holy Socrate, keeper, great Apollo, Tuscans revere you most. We feed your fire from the pine heap and go barefoot through the flames and deep coals, trusting in our piety. All powerful father, let my weapon wipe out our army's shame. I want no arms, no trophy, no spoils at all. I'll get my glory elsewhere. If I can strike this bitch down, I'll return gladly obscure to the cities of my homeland. Apollo heard. Part of the prayer he granted. The rest he scattered to the fluttering breeze. He let him kill Camilla in an ambush, but not return again to his proud nation. That plea went gusting to the southern gales. So when the spear he launched snapped through the air, all of the Volsians, avidly alerted, looked toward their princess. But she didn't notice the air, the sound, the spear out of the sky till it reached its target under her bared breast, drove deep and lodged and drank her virgin blood. Dismayed, 
Her escort ran in as she fell to hold her up. Arun's alarm was greatest. Fear marred his joy. He fled, no longer willing to trust his spear or meet the young girl's weapons. As far ahead, a hateful armed pursers, pursuers, a wolf slinks, slick quickly off to trackless heights. He knows how rash he was to kill a shepherd or a large auk. His tail shakes between his legs and strokes his belly as he seeks the woods. And so Arun's, in his terror, slunk from view and merged with the armed crowd, content with safety. Dying, she yanked the spear, but in the deep wound between her ribs, the iron point was stuck. She bled. She slumped down, and her eyes were closing in death's chill. From her face, the blush was gone. Breathing her last, she singled Akka out and spoke to her. This was the most devoted of her comrades and her only confidant. Sister, my strength is gone. This bitter wound has finished me. It's darkening all around. Make your escape. Take Turnus one last message. Step in and keep the Trojans from the city. And now goodbye. The rains had dropped. She tumbled to earth and was released from her cold body slowly. She bent her head and laid it down, conquered by death, and let her weapons go. With an angry groan, her life fled to the shades. Then an immense shout rose and struck the gold stars. When Camilla fell, the fight grew raw. The whole force of Truscans, Tuscan chiefs, and Evander's horsemen from Arcadia stormed massively together. Opus, Diana's spy, had sat a long time on the mountaintop and calmly watched the battle. But when, among the far-off shouting frenzy of troops, a ruthless death struck down Camilla, she groaned and spoke from deep within her heart. This is too hard a punishment, poor girl, for your attempt to hound the Trucians. Useless, your lonely worship of Diana in the thickets and our quiver on your shoulder. But even at the end, your queen won't leave you unhonored. The whole world will praise your death and know you didn't shamefully lack vengeance. Whoever gave you that outrageous wound should die and will. Below the mountain, shadowed by holm oaks, was a massive burial mound of Dersenus, who once ruled in the old Laurentum. Swiftly and gracefully, the goddess leapt there and stood and gazed at Arons from on high. His armor glittered and he swelled with rash pride. Why did you go? Why did you turn and go? Come over here and get the prize Camilla's death has earned you. But you are worth an arrow of Diana. The Thracian goddess took a speedy shaft from her gold quiver. Full of rage, she drew the bow out till its curving ends converged. Her right hand on the string against her breast was leveled with the left at the iron point. In the same short moment, Arons heard the sizzle of the arrow's flight and felt its metal lodge. His comrades didn't notice him. They left him groaning his last breaths on the dusty plain. Opus flew off to heavenly Olympus. Camilla's light arm squadron fell back first, the Rutilians next, with Kinatinus routed. The leaders scattered from their regiments. Everyone galloped toward the walls and safety. Nobody could hold 
out against the onrush of deadly Trojan orms. No one could fight them, but through their unstrung bows on weary shoulders, the speeding hoofbeats shook the soft earth plain. Black dust rolled toward the walls, a murky tumult, and mothers on the watchtowers beat their breasts, and they raised a female cry clear to the stars. The enemy swarmed in, where they could hound the first who thundered through the open gates, trapped in their sorry deaths, right at the threshold, their snug homes and their nation's walls around them. They choked out life, impaled. Men closed the portals and didn't dare to let in their pleading comrades. Now there was butchery. As some defended the gates and others ran against their weapons. There was weeping parents, watched the locked out soldiers, shoved by the rout, roll headlong into the ditches or spur the slack of their reins to batter blindly. Yet the unyielding barriers of the gates, the very mothers on the walls who witnessed Camilla's love of country tried to match her. In their alarm, they hurled down posts of oak wood and stakes singed hard in place of iron weapons. They longed to die first in the town's defense. Akka found Turnus in the woods and gave him the brutal news of the tremendous havoc. The Volsian lines were smashed, Camilla fallen. The enemy swept along in pitiless triumph, unhindered, and the rout had reached the walls. In rage and by Jove's hard will, he deserted his station in the overgrown hill forest. He'd scarcely left his lookout for the plains when Father Aeneas reached the unwatched pass, emerged from the dark woods and crossed the ridge. Both hurried toward the town with all their forces and no long measure of gap between them. Aeneas spotted the Laurentian columns down the dust-smoking plain, and just then Turnus, hearing the tramp of feet and snort of horses, recognized fierce Aeneas under arms. They would have made an instant trial of battle, but rosy Phoebus plunged his weary team in the Spanish sea, and the day slipped into night. They camped before the town and built stockades. My name is Ed Straka. I'm with Kepler Education. And today, I will do a reading from the Aeneid, Book 12. I'm doing it because I enjoy the tale. As Homer picks up the story of the Greeks after the sack of Troy with the Odyssey, so Virgil picks up the story of the Trojans with the Aeneid, and the main character is, of course, Aeneas. Aeneas is interesting. Aeneas is a Trojan hero, the son of Prince Anchises and the goddess Aphrodite, or as the Romans know him, her Venus. His father was the first cousin of King Priam of Troy, making Aeneas a second cousin to Priam's children, such as Hector and Paris. He is a character in Greek mythology and is mentioned in Homer's Iliad. Aeneas received full treatment in Roman mythology, most extensively in Virgil's Aeneid, where he is cast as the ancestor of Romulus and Remus. He became the first true hero of Rome. And with that said, Book 12, Truce and Duel. When Turnus saw the line of the Latins broken, the battle going against them and their spirits flagging, 
when he realized that the time had come to honor his promises and that all eyes were upon him, no more was needed. He burned with implacable rage and his courage rose within him. Just as a lion in the fields round Carthage, who does not move into battle till he has received a great wound in his chest from the hunters and then revels in it, shaking out the thick mane on his neck. Fearlessly, he snaps off the shaft left in his body by the ruffian that threw it and opens his gory jaws to roar. Just so did the violent passion rise in Turnus. At last, he spoke these wild words to the king. Turnus keeps no man waiting. There is no excuse for Aeneas and his cowards to go back on their word or fail to keep their agreement. I am coming to meet them. Bring out the sacraments, Father, and draw out the terms of the treaty. Either this right hand of mine will send this Trojan who has deserted Asia down into Tartarus. The Latins can sit and watch. And one man's sword shall refute a charge brought against a whole people, or else he can rule over those he has defeated and have Lavinia as his wife. Latinus answered him, and his voice was calm. You are a great-hearted young warrior. The more you excel in first courage, the more urgent is my duty to take thought, to weigh all possible chances, and to be afraid. You have the kingdom of your father, Donus. You have all the cities your right hand has taken. I, too, Latinus, have some wealth and some generosity of spirit. In Latium and the Laurentine fields, there are other women for you to marry and of the noblest families. This is not easy to say. Allow me to speak openly and honestly. And as you listen, lay these words to your heart. For me, it would have been wrong to unite my daughter with any of those who came to ask for her in the past. It was forbidden by all the prophecies of gods and men. But I gave way to my love for you. I gave way to the kinship of blood and to the grief and tears of my wife. Breaking all the ties that bound me, I seized Lavinia from the man to whom she had been promised and took up arms in an unjust cause. For that moment you see the calamities of war that fall upon me and the suffering that you bear more than any other. Twice we have been crushed in great battles, and we can scarcely protect within our city the future hopes of Italy. The current of the Thybris is even now warm with our blood, and the broad plains white with our bones. Why do I always give way? Why do I change my resolve? What folly is this? I am ready to accept them as allies if Turnus is killed. Why not put an end to the war while he is still alive? What will your kinsmen, the Rutulians, what will the whole of the rest of Italy say if I betray you and send you to your death? Which fortune forbid when you are asking to marry my daughter? Remember the many accidents of war and take pity on your old father waiting with heavy heart far away in your native Ardea. These words had no effect on Turnus. The violence of his fury mounted. The healing only heightened the fever. As soon as he could bring himself to speak, out came his reply. This concerned you are so kind as to show for my sake. I beg of you for my sake, forget it, and allow me to barter my life for glory. We too have weapons, Father. We too have some strength in our right arm to throw the steel around. And when we strike a man, the blood flows from the wound. His mother, the goddess, will not be at hand with her woman's tricks lurking in the treacherous shadows and trying to hide him in a cloud when he turns tail. Terrified by this new turn in the fortunes of battle, Queen Amata began to weep. 
seeing her own death before her. She tried to check the frenzy of Turnus, the man she had chosen to be the husband of her daughter. By these tears, Turnus, by any respect for me that touches your heart, Amada begs of you this one thing. You are the one hope and the one relief of my old age. In your hands rest the honor and the power of Latinus. Our whole house is falling and you are its one support. Do not persist in meeting the Trojans in battle. Whatever fate awaits you in that encounter awaits also for me. If you die, I too will leave the light I loathe. I shall never live to be a captive and see Aeneas married to Lavinia. When Lavinia heard these words of her mother, her burning cheeks were bathed in tears and the deep flush glowed and spread over her face. As when Indian ivory had been stained with blood red dye, or when the white lilies are crowded by roses and take on their red, such were the colors on the maiden's face. Turnus was distraught with love and fixed his eyes on Lavinia, burning all the more for war. He then spoke these words to Amata. Do not, I beg of you, mother, send me to the harsh encounters of war with tears and with such an evil omen. Turnus is not free to hold back the day of his death. Go as my messenger, Idmon, and take these words of mine to the leader of the Phrygians, and little pleasure will they give him when tomorrow's dawn reddens in the sky, borne on the crimson wheels of Aurora's chariot, let him not lead Trojans against Rutilians. Let the Trojan and the Rutilian armies be at peace. His blood, or mine, shall decide this war. This is the field where the hand of Avinia shall be won. When he had finished speaking and rushed back into the palace, he called for his horses, and it gladdened his heart to see them standing there before him neighing. Orithea, wife of Boreas, had given them to Turnus's grandfather, Pilumnus, to honor him, and they were whiter than the snow and swifter than the winds. The impatient charioteer stood round them, drumming on the horse's chest with cupped hands and combing their streaming manes. Then Turnus himself drew over his shoulder the breastplate with scales of gold and pale copper and fitted on his sword and shield and his helmet with its red crests and horn sockets. The god of fire himself had made the sword for Turnus' father, Jonas, dipping it in white hot in the waters of the Styx. Then instantly... He snatched up his mighty spear, which was leaning there against a great column in the middle of the palace, spoil taken from Actor the Arunican, and brandishing it till it quivered, shouting, You, my spear, have never failed me when I have called upon you. Now the time is here. Mighty Actor once wielded you. Now it is the right of Turnus. Grant me the power to bring down that effeminate Phrygian, to tear the breastplate off his body and rend it with my bare hands, to fall in the dust the hair he has curled with hot steel and steeped in myrrh. Such was the blazing fury that drove him. Sparks flew from his whole face and his piercing eyes flashed fire. He was like a bull coming into his first battle bellowing fearfully and gathering his anger into his horns by goring a tree trunk and slashing the air, pawing the sand and making it fly as he rehearses for battle. Aeneas, meanwhile, arrayed in the arms his mother had given him, was no less ferocious. He, too, was sharpening his spirit and rousing himself to anger, rejoicing that the war was being settled by the treaty he had proposed. He then reassured his allies and comforted the fears and anxiety of Elouis, telling of the future that had been decreed, 
ordering envoys to return to firm answer to Latinus and lay down the conditions for peace. The next day had scarcely risen, sprinkling the mountain tops with brightness, when the horses of the sun first reared up from the deep sea and raised their nostrils to breathe out the light. The Rutulians and Trojans were measuring a field for the duel under the walls of the great city, setting out braziers between the two armies and building altars of turf to the gods they shared. Others, wearing sacrificial aprons, their foreheads bound with holy leaves, brought fire and spring water. The Ausonian legion advanced, armed with javelins, filling the gateways as they streamed out of their city in serried ranks. On the other side, the whole Trojan and Etruscan army came at the run in all their varied armor, drawing up with weapons at the ready as though it were the bitter business of battle that was calling them out. There too, in the middle of all these thousands, the leaders hovered in the pride of purple and gold. Mentheus of the line of Asarechus, brave Asilus and Massipus, tamer of horses, son of Neptune. The signal was given. They all withdrew to their places, planting their spears in the ground and propping their shields against them. Then in a sudden rush, the mothers, those who could not bear arms, and the weak old men took up their seats in the towers and the roofs of the city or stood high on the gates. But Juno looked out from the top of what is now the Alban Mount, in those days it had neither name, nor honor, nor glory. And saw the plain, the two armies of Laurentines and Trojans, and the city of Latinus. Immediately the goddess Juno addressed the goddess, who was the sister of Turnus, the ruler of lakes and roaring rivers, an honor granted by Jupiter, the high king of heaven, as the price of her ravished virginity. Nymph, pride of all rivers, dearest to our heart, you know how I have favored you above all the other women of Italy who have mounted the ungrateful bed of magnanimous Jupiter and have gladly set you in your place in the skies. Learn now the grief which is yours, Juturna, and do not lay the blame on me as long as fortune seemed to permit it, as long as the fates allowed all to go well with Latium, I have protected the warrior Turnus and your walls. But now I see he is confronting a destiny to which he is not equal. The day of the fates and the violence of his enemy are upon him. My eyes cannot look at this battle or at this treaty. If you dare to stand closer and help your brother, go. It is right and proper. You suffer now. Perhaps a better time will be come. Um. She had scarcely spoken when the tears flooded from Juturna's eyes, and three times and more she beat her lovely breasts. This is no time for tears, said Juno, daughter of Saturn. Go quickly, and if you can find a way, snatch your brother from the death, or else stir up war and dash from their hands this treaty they have drawn up. You dare, I sanction. With these words, she urged her on, and then left her in doubt and confusion and wounded to the heart. Meanwhile, the kings arrived. Latinus mighty in his four-horse chariot, with twelve gold rays encircling his shiny temples, proof of his descent from his grandfather, the god of the sun. Turnus was in his chariot drawn by two white horses, gripping two broad-bladed spears in his hand. From the other side, advancing from the camp, came Father Aeneas, the founder of the Roman race, with his divine armor blazing and his shield like a star. Beside him were Ascanius, 
the second hope for the future greatness of Rome, and a priest arrayed in pure white vestments, driving to the burning altars a yearling ewe, as yet unshorn and the young of a breeding sow, turning their eyes towards the rising sun, the leaders stretched out their hands with offerings of salted meal, marked the peak of their victims' foreheads with their blades and poured libations on the altars from their goblets. Then devout Aeneas drew his sword and prayed, I now called the sun to witness, and this land for which I have been able to endure such toil. I call upon the all-powerful father of the gods, and you his wife, Saturnian Juno. And I pray you, goddess, from this moment look more kindly on us, and you glorious Mars, under whose sway all wars are disposed, I call upon springs and rivers. I call upon all the divinities of high heaven and all the gods of the blue sea. If victory should chance to fall to a Sunian Turnus, it is agreed that the defeated withdraw to the city of Evander. Eulus will leave these lands, and after this the people of Aeneas will not rise again in war or bring their armies here, or disturb this kingdom with the sword. But if victory grants the day to us and to our arms, as I believe she will, and may the gods so rule, I shall not order Italians to obey Trojans, nor do I seek royal power for myself. Both nations shall move forward into an everlasting treaty, undefeated, and equal before the law. I shall give the sacraments and the gods. Letinus, the father of my bride, will have the armies and the solemn authority in the state. For me, the Trojans will build the walls of a city, and Lavinia will give it her name. So prayed Aeneas, and Latinus followed him, looking up and stretching his right hand towards the sky, I too swear, Aeneas, by the same, by earth and sea and stars, by the two children of Latona and by two-browed Janus, by the divine powers beneath the earth and the holy house of unyielding Dis, and let the Father himself, who sanctions treaties by the flash of his lightning, hear these my words, I touch his altar. I call to witness the gods and the fires that stand between us. The day shall not come when men of Italy shall violate this treaty or break this peace, whatever chance will bring. This is my will and no power will set it aside. Not if it dissolve the earth in flood and pour it into the sea. Not if it melt the sky into Tartarus. Just as this scepter that moment he was holding his scepter in his hand, will never sprout green or cast a shadow from delicate leaves. Now that it has been cut from the base of its trunk of the forest, leaving its mother tree and losing its limbs and treefy tresses to the steel. What was once a tree, skilled hands have now clad in the beauty of bronze and given to the fathers of Latium to bear. With such words, they sealed the treaty between them in full view of the leaders of the peoples. Then, taking the duly consecrated victims, they cut their throats on the altar fires and, tearing the entrails from them while they still lived, they heaped the altars from laden platters. But it had long seemed to the Rutilians that this was not an even contest, and their hearts were still more confused and dismayed when the two men appeared before their eyes, and they saw at close range the difference in their strength. Their fears were increased by the sight of Turnus stepping forward quietly with downcast eyes to worship at the altar like a supplicant. His cheeks were like a boy's, and there was a pallor over all his youthful body. As soon as his sister, Juturna, saw that such talk was spreading and the men's minds were weakening and wavering, 
she came into the battle lines in the guise of Camers, whose family had been great from his earliest ancestors, whose father had won fame for his courage, and who had himself was the boldest of the bold in the use of arms. Into the middle of the battle line she advanced, well knowing what she had to do. And these were his words she sowed the seeds of many different rumors. It is not a disgrace, Rutilians, to sacrifice the life of one man for all of us. Are we not their equals in numbers and in strength? Look, these few here are all they have, the Trojans, the Arcadians, and the army sent by fate, the Etruscans who hate Turnus. We are short of enemies, even if only half our number were to engage him in battle. As things are, the fame of Turnus will rise to the gods on whose altars he now dedicates himself. And he will live on the lips of men. But if we lose our native land, we shall be forced to obey proud masters who now sit here idling in our fields. By such words, she more and more inflamed the minds of the warriors and murmurs crept through their ranks. Even the Laurentines had a change of heart, even the Latins, and men who a moment ago were longing for a fight, a rest from fighting and safety for the people, now wanted their weapons and prayed. By such words, she more and more inflamed the minds of the warriors and murmurs crept through their ranks. Even the Laurentines had a change of heart, even the Latins and men who a moment ago were longing for a rest from fighting and safety for their people, now wanted their weapons and prayed that the treaty would come to nothing, pitying Turnus and the injustice of his fate. At this moment, Juturna did even more and showed a sign high in the sky, the most powerful portent that ever confused and misled men of Italy. The tawny eagle of Jupiter was flying in the red sky of morning putting to clamorous flight the winged armies of birds along the shore, when he suddenly swooped down to the waves and seized the noble swan in his pitiless talons. The men of Italy thrilled at the sight. The birds all shrieked, and, a wonder to behold, they wheeled in their flight, darkening the heavens with their wings, and formed a cloud to mob their enemy high in the air until, exhausted by their attacks and the weight of his prey, he gave way, dropping it out of his talons into the river below and taking flight far away into the clouds. The Rutilians greeted the portent with a shout and their hands were quick to their swords. Ptolemaeus, the augur, was the first to speak. At last, he cried, at last, this is what I have so often prayed to see. I accept the omen and acknowledge the gods. It is I who will lead you. Now take up your arms, O my poor countrymen, into whose hearts the pitiless stranger strikes the terror of war. You are like the feeble birds, and he is attacking and plundering your shores. He will take to flight and sail far over the sea. But you must all be of one mind. Mash your forces into one flock and fight to defend your king whom he has seized. When he had spoken, he ran forward and hurled his Cornell wood spear at the enemy standing opposite. It whirled through the air and flew unerringly. And that moment, a great shout arose. And that moment, all the ranks drawn up in wedge formation were thrown into disorder. And in the confusion, men's hearts blazed with sudden passion. The spear flew on. By chance, nine splendid brothers had taken their stand opposite Ptolemaeus, all of them sons born by the faithful Trahena to her Arcadian husband, Gallippus. It struck one of these in the waist where the swan sewn belt 
the spear flew on. By chance, nine splendid brothers had taken their stand opposite Ptolemyus, all of them sons born by the faithful Trehenna to her Arcadian husband, Gallippus. It struck one of these in a waist where the sewn belt chafed the belly and the buckle bit the side straps. He was noble in his looks and in the brilliance of his armor, and a spear drove through his ribs and stretched him on the yellow sand. Burning with grief, his brothers, all flanks of spirited warriors, drew their swords or snatched up their throwing spears and rushed blindly forward. The ranks of the Laurentines ran to meet them, while from the other side the massed Trojans came flooding up with Etruscans from Agella and Arcadians in their brightly colored armor. One single passion drove them on to settle the matter by the sword. They tore down the altars and a wild storm of missiles filled the whole sky and fell in a rain of steel. The mixing bowls and brassiers were removed and now that the treaty had come to nothing, even Latinus took to flight with his rejected gods. Some bridled the teams of their chariots, some leapt on their horses and stood at the ready with swords drawn. Mesippus, eager to wreck the treaty, rode straight at the Etruscan, Alestus, a king wearing the insignia of a king, and the charging horse drove him back in terror. He fell as he retreated and crashed violently, head and shoulders into the altar behind him, riding furiously, Mesopus flew to him and, towering over him with a lance as long as a house beam, he struck him his death blow, even as he poured out prayers for mercy. So much for Oslestus, cried Mesopus. This is a better victim to offer to the great gods. And the men of Italy ran to strip the body while it was still warm. Corineus came to meet them, snatching a half-burnt torch from an altar. Ebesus made for him, but before he could strike a blow, Corneus filled his face with fire. His great beard flared up and gave off a stench as it burned. Corneus pressed his attack and, clutching the hair of his helpless enemy in his left hand, he forced him to the ground, kneeling on him with all his weight and sunk the hard steel in his flank. Meanwhile, Podolrius had been following the shepherd, Alsus, as he rushed through the hail of missiles in the front line of battle and was now poised over him with the naked sword. But drawing back his axe, Alsus struck him full in the middle of the forehead and split it to the chin, bathing all his armor in a shower of blood. It was a cruel rest then for Polydarius. An iron sleep bore down upon him and closed his eyes in everlasting light. An iron sleep bore down upon him and closed his eyes in everlasting night. But true to his vow, Aeneas, unhelmeted, stretched out his weaponless right hand and called to his allies, Where are you rushing? What is this sudden discord rising among you? Control your anger. The treaty is already struck and its terms agreed. I alone have the right of conflict. Leave me to fight and forget your fears. We have a treaty and my right hand will make it good. The rituals we have performed have made Turnus mine. While he was still speaking, while words like these were still passing his lips, an arrow came whirring in its flight and struck him. Unknown the hand that shot it and the force that spun it to its target. Unknown what chance or what god brought such honor to the Rutilians. The shining glory of the deed is lost in darkness, and no man boasted that he had wounded Aeneas. 
When Turnus saw him leaving the field and the leaders of the allies in dismay, a sudden fire of hope kindled in his heart. Horses and arms, he demanded both at once. And in a flash, he leapt on his chariot with spirits soaring and gathered up the reins. Then many a brave hero he sent down to death as he flew along. And many half-dead bodies he sent rolling on the ground, crushing whole columns of men under his chariot wheels as he caught up their spears and showered them on those who had taken to flight. Just as Mars, spattered with blood, charges along the banks of the icy river Hebrus, clashing sword on shield and giving full rein to his furious horses as he stirs up war, they fly across the open plain before the winds of the south and the west till Thrace roars to its furthest reaches with the drumming of their hooves as his escort gallops all round him. Rage, treachery, and the dark faces of fear. Just so did Bull Turnish lash his horses through the thick of battle till they smoked with sweat. And as he trampled the pitiable bodies of his dead enemies, the flying hooves scattering a dew of blood and churned the gore into the sand. Sethanalus, he sent to his death with a throw from long range. Then Thamorus and Phallus, both in close combat. From long range too he struck, and Brassus himself had brought up in Lycia. From long range too he struck down in Brasidae, Glaucus and Latus, whom their father and Brassus himself had brought up in Lycia, and gave them armor that equipped them either to do battle or to outstrip the winds on horseback. In another part of the field, Umedus was charging into the fray. He was a famous warrior, son of old Dolan, bearing his grandfather's name, but his spirit and his hand for war were his father's. It was Dolan who dared to ask for the chariot of Achilles as a reward for going to spy on the camp of the Greeks. But Diomed provided a different reward for his daring, and he soon ceased to aspire to the horses of Achilles. When Turnus caught sight of Umedus, far off on the open plain, he struck him first with a light javelin thrown over the vast space that lay between. Then, Halting the two horses that drew this chariot, he leaped down and stood over his dying enemy with his foot on his neck. He wrenched the sword out of Umeda's hand, and it flashed as he dipped it deep in his throat, saying, There they are, Trojan. These are the fields of Hesperia you tried to take by war. Lie there and measure them. This is my reward for those who test me by the sword. This is how they build their cities. Next, with a throw of his javelin, he sent Aspidus to join him. Then Chloris, Sabrius, Darius, Therisoclus, and Thymotis, whose horse had fallen and thrown him over its head. Just as when the breath of Thracian Boreas sounds upon the deep Aegean as he pursues the waves to the shore, and wherever the winds put out their strength, the clouds take to flight across the sky. Just so, wherever Turnus cut his path, the enemy gave way before him, the ranks breaking and running, and his own impetus carrying him forward with the plumes on his helmet tossing as he drove his chariot into the wind. Phegus could not endure this onslaught of Turnus and his wild shouting, but leaped in front of the chariot and pulled round the horses' heads as they galloped at him, foaming at their bits. Then, as he was dragged along, hanging from the yoke, the broad blade of Turnus' lance struck his unprotected side, piercing and breaking a double mesh of his breastplate and grazing the skin of his body. 
He put up his shield and was twisting round to face his enemy when he fell and was caught by the flying wheel and axle and stretched out on the ground. Turnus, following up, struck him between the bottom of the helmet and the top edge of the breastplate, cutting off his head and leaving the trunk on the sand. With the victorious Turnus was dealing death. While the victorious Turnus was dealing death on the plain, Aeneas was taken into the camp of Mentheus and faithful Achates. Ascanius was with them. Aeneas was bleeding and leaning on his long spear at every other step. He was in a fury tugging at the arrowhead broken in the wound and demanding that they should take the quickest way of helping him, make a broad cut with the blade of a sword, slice open the flesh where the arrow was embedded and get him back into battle. But now there came Iapsix, son of Isis, whom Phoebus Apollo loved above all other men, overcome by their his fierce love, Overcome by this fierce love, Apollo had long since offered freely and joyfully to give him all his arts and all his powers, prophecy, the lyre, the swift arrow. But in order to prolong, but in order to prolong the life of his dying father, Ipix chose rather to ply a mute in glorious art and know the virtues of herbs and the practice of healing. There with the grieving Ulysses in the middle of a great crowd of warriors stood Aeneas, growling savagely, leaning on his great spear and unmoved by their tears. The old man, with his robe caught up and tied behind him after the fashion of Apollo Pion, tried anxiously and tried in vain all he could do with his healing hands and the potent herbs of Apollo. In vain his right hand worked at the dart. In vain the forceps gripped the steel. Fortune did not show the way, and his patron Apollo gave no help. And all the time the horror of battle grew fiercer and fiercer on the plain, and nearer and nearer drew the danger. They soon could see a wall of dust in the sky. The cavalry rode up, and the showers of missiles were falling into the middle of the camp. A hideous noise of shouting rose to the heavens as young men fought and fell under the iron hand of Mars. At this, Venus, dismayed by her son's undeserved suffering, picked some dittany on Mount Ida in Crete. The stalk of this plant had a vigorous growth of leaves, and its head is crowned with a purple flower. It is a herb which wild goats know well, and feed on when arrows have flown and stuck in their backs. This Venus brought down, veiled in a blinding cloud, and with it tinctured the river water they had poured into shining bowls, impregnating it secretly and sprinkling in it fragrant panacea, and the health-giving juices of ambrosia. Such was the water with which old Epiax, without knowing it, bathed the wound. And suddenly, in that moment, all the pain left Aeneas's body, and the blood was staunched in the depths of the wound. Of its own accord, the arrow came away in the hands of Epiax, and fresh strain flowing into Aeneas, restoring him to his former state. It was Ipiax who was the first to fire their spirits to face the enemy. Bring the warrior his arms, and quickly, he cried. Why stand there? This cure is not affected by human power, nor by the guidance of art. It is not my right hand that saved you, Aeneas. Some greater power, some God is driving you and sending you back to greater deeds. Aeneas was hungry for battle. He had already sheathed his calves in his golden greaves and was brandishing his flashy spear, impatient of delay. When the shield was fitted to his side and the breastplate to his back, he took Ascanius 
in his armed embrace and kissed him lightly through the helmet, saying, From me, my son, you can learn courage and hard toil. Others will teach you about fortune. My hand will now defend you in war and lead you where the prizes are great. I charge you, when in due course your years ripen and you become a man, do not forget that as you go over in your mind the examples of your kinsmen, let your spirit rise at the thought of your father Aeneas and your uncle Hector. When he had finished speaking, he moved through the gates in all his massive might, brandishing his huge spear. And there rushed with him in serried ranks Antheus and Menetheus, and all his escort streaming from the camp. A blinding dust then darkened the plain. The very earth was stirred and trembled under the drumming of their feet. As they advanced, Turnus saw them from the rampart opposite. The men of Ossinia also saw them, and cold tremors of fear ran through the marrow of their bones. But before all the Latins, Juturna heard the sound and knew its meaning. She fled, trembling, but Aeneas came swiftly on, leading his dark army over the open plain. Just as when a cloud blots out the sun and brings to move from mid-ocean towards the land, long-suffering farmers see it in the far distance and shudder to the heart, knowing what it will bring, the ruin of trees, the slaughter of their crops, and destruction everywhere. The flying winds come first, and their sound is first to reach the sore. Just so the Trojan leader from Roitium drove his army forward against the enemy in wedge formation, each man shoulder to shoulder with his neighbor. Fierce Osiris was struck by the sword of Thrambrius. Menestheus cut down Arcytius, Achaetus Apulo, and Gaius Ufens. Ptolemyus himself fell the augur who had been the first to hurl a spear against his enemies. The shouting rose to the sky, and now it was the Rutilians who turned and fled over the fields, rising to dust on their backs. Aeneas did not think fit to cut down men who had turned away from him, nor did he go after those who stood to meet him in equal combat or carried spears. He was looking for Turnus, and only Turnus, tracking him through the thick murk. Turnus was the only man he asked to fight. Seeing this and being stricken with fear, the warrior maiden Juturna threw out Metisicus, the driver of Turnus' chariot, from between the reins and left him lying where he fell, far from the chariot pole. She herself took over the reins and whipped them up to make them ripple. The very image of Metiscus in voice and form and armor, like a black swallow flying through the great house of some wealthy man and collecting tiny scraps of food and dainties of her young chattering on the nest. Sometimes her tweetering is heard in empty colonnades, sometimes round marshy pools. Just so did Juturna ride through the middle of the enemy and the swift chariot flew over the field. Now, here, now there, she gave glimpses of her brother in triumph, but then she would fly off and not allow him to join in the battle. But Aeneas was no less determined to meet him and followed his every twist and turn, tracking him and calling his name at the top of his voice all through the scattered lines of battle. Every time he caught sight of his enemy, he tried to match the speed of his wing-footed horses. And every time Juturna swung the chariot around and took to flight. What was Aeneas to do? Conflicting tides seethed in his mind, but no answer came, and different passions drove him to opposing thoughts. Then the nimble Mesippus 
who was running with two pliant steel-tipped javelins in his left hand, aimed one of them at Aeneas and hurled it true. Aeneas checked himself and crouched on one knee behind his shield, but the flying spear sheared off the peak of his helmet and carried away the plumes from the top of it. At this, his anger rose. Treachery had given him no choice. When he saw Turnus' horses pull the chariots round and withdraw, again and again he called upon Jupiter and the altars of the broken treaty. And then, and not till then, he plunged into the middle of his enemies. He was terrible in his might, and Mars was aiding him. Sparing no man, he roused himself to savage slaughter and gave full rein to his anger. What God could unfold all of his bitter suffering for me? What God could express in song all the different ways of death for men and for their leaders, driven back and forth across the plain, now by Turnus, now by Trojan Aeneas? Was it your will, O Jupiter, that peoples who were to live at peace for all time should clasp so violently in war? Aeneas met Sucro, the Rutilian. This was the first clash to check the Trojans' charge. But Circo did not detain them long. Aeneas caught him in the side and drove the raw steel through the cage of the ribs to the breast, where death comes quickest. Turnus, now on foot, met Diorus and his brother, Amicus, who had been unhorsed. As Diorus rode at him, he struck him with his long spear. Amicus he dispatched with the sword. Then, cutting off both their heads, he hung them from his chariot and carried them along with him, dripping their dew of blood. Aeneas sent Talos and Tineus and brave Cathigus to their deaths, all three in one encounter. Then the gloomy Onidas, who bore a name linked with Achaean of Thebes, and whose mother was Peridia, Turnus killed the brothers who came from the fields of Apollo in Lycia, then young Minotius, who hated war, but that did not save him. He was an Arcadian who had plied his art all round the rivers of Lerna, rich in fish. His home was poor, and he never knew the munificence of the great. His father sowed his crops on hired land. Like fires started in different places in a dry wood or in thickets of crackling laurel, or like foaming rivers roaring as they run down in spate from the high mountains to the sea, sweeping away everything that lies in their path. No more sluggish were Aeneas and Turnus as they rushed over the field of battle. Now if ever did the anger seed within them, now burst their unconquerable hearts and every wound they gave, they gave with all their might. Moranus was sounding the names of their father's fathers and their fathers before them, his whole lineage through all the kings of Latium. When Aeneas knocked him flying from his chariot with a rock, a huge boulder he sent whirling at him and stretched him out on the ground. The wheels rolled him forward in a tangle of yoke and reins with his galloping horses had no thought for their masters. They trampled him under their clattering hooves. Hillis made a wild charge, roaring hideously, but Turnus ran to meet him and spun a javelin at his gilded forehead. Through the helmet it went and stuck in his brain. As for you, Crithius, bravest of the Greeks, your right hand did not rescue you from Turnus, nor was Copicinus protected by his gods when Aeneas came near. But his breast met the steel, and the bronze shield did not hold back the moment of his death. You too, Iolus. The Laurentine plain saw you fall, and your back covering a broad measure of the ground. The Greek battalions could not bring you down, nor could Achilles, who overturned the king of Priam, 
but here you lie. This was the finishing line of your life. Your home was in the hills below Mount Ida, a home in the hills of Lunasus. But your grave is in Laurentine soil. The two armies were now wholly turned to face one another. All the Latins and all the Trojans, Menisthus and bold Suristus, Massapus, tamer of horses, and brave Asilus, the battalion of the Etruscans and the Arcadian squadron of Evander were striving each man with all his resources of strength and will, waging this immense conflict with no rest and no respite. At that moment, Aeneas' mother, loveliest of the goddesses, put into his mind to go to the city, to lead his army instantly against the walls and throw the Latins into confusion at this sudden calamity. Turning his eyes this way and that as he tracked down Turnus through all the different battle lines, he noticed the city, untouched by this great war, quiet and unharmed and his spirit was fired by the sudden thought of a greater battle he could fight. Calling the leaders of the Trojans together, Menestheus, Sergestus, and the brave Serestus, he took up position on some rising ground, and the whole of the Trojan legion joined them there in close formation without laying down their shields or spears. Aeneas addressed them, standing in the middle of a high mound of earth. There must be no delay in carrying out my commands. Jupiter is on our side. No man must go to work half-heartedly, because my plan is new to him. The city is the cause of this war. It is the very kingdom of Latinus. And if they do not this day agree to submit to the yoke, to accept defeat and to obey, I shall root it out and level its smoking roofs to the ground. Am I to wait until Turnus thinks fit to stand up to me in battle and consents to meet the man who has already defeated him? Oh, my fellow citizens, this city is the head and heart of this wicked war. Bring your torches now and we shall claim our treaty with fire. When he had finished speaking, they formed a wedge, all of them striving with equal resolve in their hearts, and moved toward the walls in a solid mass. Ladders suddenly appeared. Fire came to hand. They rushed the gates and cut to pieces the first guards that met them. They spun their javelins and darkened the heavens with steel. Aeneas himself, standing among the leaders under the city wall with his right hand outstretched, lifted up his voice to accuse Latinus, calling the gods to witness that this was the second time he had been forced into battle. Twice already the Italians had shown themselves to be his enemies. This was not the first treaty they had violated. Alarm and discord rose among the citizens. Some wanted the city to be opened up and gates thrown wide to receive the Trojans and they even dragged the king himself onto the ramparts. Others caught up their weapons and rushed to defend the walls, just as when a shepherd tracks some bees to their home, shut well away inside a porous rock, and fills it with acrid smoke. The bees, alarmed for their safety, rush in all directions through their wax-built camp, sharpening their wrath and buzzing fiercely. Then... As the black stench rolls through their chambers, the inside of the rock booms with their blind complaints and the smoke flies to the empty winds. Weary as they were, a new misfortune now befell the Latins and shook their whole city to its foundations with grief. As soon as the queen, standing on the palace roof, saw the enemy approaching the city, the walls under attack, fire flying up to the roofs. No Rutilian army anywhere to confront the enemy and no sign of Turnus' columns. She thought in her misery that he had been killed in the cut and thrust of battle. 
In that instant, her mind was deranged with grief and she screamed that she was the cause, the guilty one, the fountainhead of all these evils. Pouring her heart out in sorrow and madness, she resolved to die. Her hand rent her purple robes and she died a hideous death in a noose of a rope tied to a high beam. When the unhappy women of Latium heard of this, her daughter Lavinia was the first to tear her golden hair and rosy cheeks. The whole household was wild with grief around her and their lamentations rang all through the palace. From there the report spread through the whole city and gloom was everywhere. Latinus went with his garments torn, dazed by the death of his wife and the downfall of the city, fouling his gray hair with handfuls of dirt and dust. Meanwhile, on a distant part of the plain, the warrior Turnus was chasing a few stragglers. He was less vigorous now, and less and less delighted with the triumphant progress of his horses. When the wind carried to him this sound of shouting and of unexplained terror, he pricked up his ears. It was a confused noise from the city, a murmuring with no hint of joy in it. What is this? He cried in wild dismay, pulling on the reins to stop the chariot. Why such grief and distress on the walls and all this clamor streaming from every part of the city? His sister, who was driving the chariot in the shape of Metiscus and had control of the horses and the reins, protested. This way, Turnus, let us go after these Trojans. This is where our first victory showed us the way. There are others whose hands can defend the city. Aeneas is bearing hard on the Italians in all the confusion of the battle. We too can deal out death without pity to Trojans. You will kill as many as he does and not fall short in the honors of war. Turnus made his reply. Oh, my sister, I recognized you some time ago when first you shared the treaty with your scheming and engaged in this war. And you do not deceive me now, pretending not to be a goddess. But whose will is it that you have been sent down from Olympus to endure this agony? Was it all to see the cruel death of your pitiable brother? For what am I to do? What stroke of fortune could grant me safety now? No one is left whom I love as much as I love, Moranus, and I have seen him before my own eyes calling for me as he fell, a mighty warrior laid low by a mighty wound. The luckless Ufens had died rather than look on my disgrace. And the Trojans have his body and his arms. Shall I stand by and see our homes destroyed? This is the one indignity that remained. And shall I not lift my hand to refute the words of Drancis? Shall I turn tail? Will this land of Italy see Turnus on the run? Is it so bad a thing to die? Be gracious to me, you gods of the underworld, since the gods above have turned their faces from me. My spirit will come down to you unstained, knowing nothing of such dishonor and worthy of my great ancestors to the end. Scarcely had he finished speaking when Sekas suddenly came galloping up on his foaming horse, having ridden through the middle of the enemy with an arrow wound full in his face. On he rushed, calling the name of Turnus and imploring him, you are our last hope of safety, Turnus. You must take pity on your people. The sword and spear of Aeneas are like the lightning, and he is threatening to throw down the highest citadels of Italy and give them over to destruction. Firebrands are already flying to the roofs, 
Every Latin face, every Latin eye is turned to you. The king himself is at a loss. Whom should he choose to marry our daughters? What treaty should he turn to? And then the queen who placed all her trust in you has taken her own life. Fear overcame her and she fled the light of day. Alone in front of the gates of Misipus and bold Atinus are holding the line and all round them on every side stand the battalions of the enemy in serried ranks. Their drawn swords are a crop of steel bristling in the fields and you are out here wheeling your chariot in the deserted grasslands. Turnus was thunderstruck, bewildered by the changing shape of his fortune, and stood there dumb and staring. In that one heart of his there seethed a bitter shame, a grief shot through with madness, love driven on by fury, and a consciousness of his own courage. As soon as the shadows lifted from his mind and light returned, he forced his burning eyes round towards the walls, looking back in deep dismay from his chariot at the great city. There, between the stories of a tower, came a tongue of flame, rolling and billowing to the sky. It was taking hold of the tower, which he had built himself, putting the wheels under it and fitting the long gangways. Sister, he said, the time has come at last. The fates are too strong. You must not delay them any longer. Let us go where God and cruel fortune call me. I am resolved to meet Aeneas in battle. I am resolved to suffer what bitterness there is in death. You will not see me put to shame again. This is madness, but before I die, I beg of you, let me be mad. No sooner had he spoken than he leapt to the ground from his chariot and dashed through all his enemies and their weapons, leaving his sister behind him to grieve as his charge broke through the middle of their ranks. Just as a boulder comes crashing down from the top of a mountain, torn out by gales, washed out by flood water, or loosened by the stealthy passing of years, it comes down the sheer face with terrific force, an evil mountain of rock, and bounds over the plain, rolling with its woods and flocks and men. So did Turnus crash through the shattered ranks of his enemies toward the walls of the city where all the ground was wet with shed blood and the air sang with flying spears. There he made a sign with his hand. And in the same moment, he called out in a loud voice, Enough, Rutilians, put up your weapons, and you too, Latins. Whatever fortune brings is mine. It is better that I should be the one man who atones for this treaty for all of you and settles the matter with the sword. At these words, the armies parted and left a clear space in the middle between them. But when Father Aeneas heard the name of Turnus, he abandoned the walls and the lofty citadel, sweeping aside all delay and breaking off all his works of war. He leapt for joy and clashed his armor with a noise as terrible as thunder. Huge he was as Mount Athos, or Mount Eryx, or Father Epineus, himself roaring when the whole oak shimmer on his flanks and delighting to raise his snowy head into the winds. Now at last, the Rutilians and the Trojans and all the men of Italy, the defenders guarding the high ramparts and the besiegers pounding the base of the walls with their rams, they all turned their eyes eagerly to see and took the armor off their shoulders. King Latinus himself was amazed at the sight of these two huge heroes 
born at opposite sides of the earth, coming together to decide the issue by the sword. There, on a piece of open ground, on the plain, they threw their spears at long range as they charged. And when they clashed, the bronze of their shields rang out and the earth groaned. Blow upon blow they dealt with their swords as chance and courage met and mingled in confusion. Just as two enemy bulls on the great mountain of Scylla or the top of Tabernus bring their horns to bear and charge into the battle, the herdsmen stand back in terror. The herds stand silent and afraid and the heifers low quietly together, waiting to see who is to rule a grove, who is to be the leader of the whole herd. Meanwhile, the bulls are locked together, exchanging blow upon blow, gouging horn into hide till their necks and shoulders are washed with blood, and all the grove rings with their lowing and groaning. Just so did Aeneas of Troy and Turnus, son of Danus, rushed together with shields clashing and the din filled the heavens. Then Jupiter himself lifted up a pair of scales with the tongue centered and put the lives of the two men in them to decide who would be condemned in the ordeal of battle and with whose weight death would descend. Turnus leapt forward thinking he was safe and lifting his sword raising to his full height he struck with all his strength behind him the trojans shouted and the latins cried out in their anxiety while both armies watched intently but in the height of his passion the treacherous sword broke in mid-blow and left him defenseless had he not sought help in flight Faster than the east wind he flew. When he saw his own right hand holding nothing but a sword handle, he did not recognize. The story goes that when his horses were yoked and he was mounting his chariot in headlong haste to begin the battle, he left his father's sword behind and caught up the sword of his charioteer, Metiscus. For some time, while the Trojans were scattered in flight, that was enough. But when it met the divine armor made by Vulcan, the mortal blade was brittle as an icicle and shattered on impact, leaving its fragments glittering on the golden sand. At this, Turnus fled in despair and tried to escape to another part of the plain, weaving his uncertain course now to this side, now to that. For the Trojans formed a dense barrier round him, hemming him in between a huge marsh and the high walls. Nor did Aeneas let up in his pursuit. Slowed down as he was by the arrow wound, his legs failing him sometimes and unable to run, he still was ablaze with fury and kept hard on the heels of the terrified Turnus like a hunting dog that happens to trap a stag in the bend of a river or in a ring of red feathers used as a scare, pressing him hard with his running and barking. The stag is terrified by the ambush he is caught in or by the high river bank. He runs and runs back a thousand ways, but the untiring Umbrian hound stays with him with jaws gaping. Now he has him. Now he seems to have him, and the jaw snaps shut. But he is thwarted and bites the empty air. Then, as the shouting rises louder than ever, all the river banks and pools return the sound, and the whole sky thunders with the din. As he ran, Turnus kept shouting at the Rutilians, calling each of them by name and demanding the sword he knew so well. Aeneas, on the other hand, was threatening instant death and destruction to anyone who came near. Much as that alarmed them, he terrified them even more by threatening to raise their city to the ground. And though he was wounded, he did not slacken in his pursuit. Five times round they ran in one direction. Five times they rewound the circle. For this was no small prize they were trying to win at games. 
what they were competing for was the lifeblood of Turnus. It so chanced that a bitter-leaved wild olive tree had stood on this spot, sacred to Phanus and long revered by sailors. On it, men saved from storms at sea used to nail their offerings to the Laurentine god and dedicate the clothes they had vowed for their safety. But the Trojans, making no exception for the sacred tree trunk, had removed it to clear space for the combat. In this stump, the spear of Aeneas was now embedded. The force of his throw had carried it here and lodged it fast in the tough wood of the root. He strained at it and tried to pull it out so that he could hunt with a missile the quarry who could not catch on foot. Wild now of fear, Turnus cried, Pity me, I beg of you, Faunus, and you, good Mother Earth, hold on to that spear. If I have always paid you those honors which Aeneas and his men have profaned in war. So he prayed, and he did not call for the help of the god in vain. Aeneas was long delayed, struggling with the stubborn stump, and no strength of his could prize open the bite of the wood. While he was heaving and straining with all his might, the goddess Juturna, daughter of Donus, changed once more into the shape of the charioteer Metiscus and ran for to give Turnus his sword. Venus was indignant that the nymph was allowed to be so bold. So she came and wrenched out Aeneas' spear from deep in the root. Then these glorious warriors, their weapons and their spirits restored to them, one relying on his sword, the other towering and formidable behind his spear, stood there breathing hard, ready to engage in the contest of war. Meanwhile, the king of all-powerful Olympus saw Juno watching the battle from a golden cloud and spoke these words to her. Oh, my dear wife, what will be the end of this? What is there left for you to do? You yourself know and admit that you know that Aeneas is a god of this land, that he has a right to heaven and is fated to be raised to the stars. What are you scheming? What do you hope to achieve by perching there in those chilly clouds? Was it right that a god should suffer violence and be wounded by the hand of a mortal? Was it right that Turnus should be given back the sword that was taken from him? For what could Juturna have done without your help? Why have you put strength into the arm of the defeated? The time has come at last for you to cease and give way to our entreaties. Do not let this great sorrow gnaw at your heart in silence, and do not make me listen to grief and resentment forever streaming from your sweet lips. The end has come. You have been able to harry the Trojans by sea and by land, to light the fires of an unholy war, to soil a house with sorrow, and mix the sound of mourning with the marriage song. I forbid you to go further. These were the words of Jupiter. With bowed head, the goddess Juno, daughter of Saturn, made this reply. Because I have known your will, great Jupiter, against my own wishes, I have abandoned Turnus and abandoned the earth. But for your will, you would not be seeing me sitting alone in midair on a cloud, suffering whatever has sent me to suffer. I would be clothed in fire, standing close in to the line of battle and dragging Trojans into bloody combat. It was I, I admit, who persuaded Juturna to come to help of her unfortunate brother, and with my blessing to show greater daring for the sake of his life, but not to shoot arrows, not to stretch the bow. I swear it by the implacable fountainhood of the river Styx, the one oath which binds the gods of heaven, 
And now I, Juno, yield and quit these battles which I so detest. But I entreat you for the sake of Latium and the honor of your own kin to allow what the law of fate does not forbid. When at last their marriages are blessed, I offer no obstruction. When at last they come together in peace and make their laws and treaties together, do not command the Latins to change their ancient name in their own land, to become Trojans and be called Teucrians. They are men. Do not make them change their voice or native dress. Let there be Latium. Let the Alban kings live on from generation to generation, and the stock of Rome be made mighty by the manly courage of Italy. Troy has fallen. Let it lie Troy and the name of Troy. He who devised mankind and all the world smiled and replied, You are the true sister of Jupiter and the second child of Saturn. Such waves of anger do you set rolling from deep in your heart. But come now, lay aside this fury that arose in vain. I grant what you wish. I yield. I relent of my own free will. The people of Ausonia will keep the tongue of their fathers and their ancient ways. As their name is, so shall it remain. The Trojans will join them in body only and will then be submerged. Ritual I will give and the modes of worship and I will make them all Latins, speaking one tongue. You will see that the people have arise from this admixture of Ausonian blood will be above all men, above the gods, in devotion, and no other race will be their equals in paying you honor. Juno nodded in assent. She rejoiced and forced her mind to change, leaving the cloud behind her and withdrawing from the sky. This done, the father of the gods pondered another task in his mind and prepared to dismiss Juturna from her brother's side. There are two monsters named Gurie, born to the goddess of the dead of night in one and the same litter with Magiera of Tartarus. The heads of all three she bound with coiling snakes and gave them wings to ride the wind. These attend the throne of savage Jupiter in his royal palace and sharpen the fears of suffering mortals whenever the king of the gods sets plagues or hideous deaths in motion or terrifies guilty cities by the visitation of war. One of these Jupiter's sent swiftly down from the heights of heavens with orders to confront Juturna as an omen. She flew to earth, carried in a swift whirlwind, like an arrow going through a cloud, spun from the bowstring of a Parthian who has armed the barb with a virulent poison for which there is no cure, a Parthian or a Cretan from Sidonia, and it whirls as it flies unseen through the swift darkness. So flew the daughter of night, making for the earth. When she saw the Trojan battle lines and the army of Turnus, she took in an instant the shape of the little bird which perched on tombs and the gables of empty houses and sings light its ill-omened song among the shades of the night. In this guise, the monster flew again and again at Turnus' face, screeching and beating his shield with her wings. A strange numbness came over him and his bones melted with fear. His hair stood on end and the voice stuck in his throat. His sister, Junturna, recognized the deer from a long way off by the whirring of her wings and grieved. She loosed and tore her hair. She scratched her face and beat her breast, crying, What can your sister do to help you now, Turnus? Much have I endured, but nothing now remains for me. I have no art that could prolong your life. How can I set myself against such a portent? At last, at last, I leave the battle. 
Do not fright me, you birds of evil omen. I am already afraid. I know the beating of your wings and the sound of death. I do not fail to understand the proud commands of great-hearted Jupiter. Is this his reward for my lost virginity? For what purpose has he granted me eternal life? Why has he deprived me of the state of death? But for that I could at least have put an end to my suffering and borne my poor brother company through the shades. So this is immortality. Will anything that is mine be sweet to me without you, my brother? Is there no abyss that can open deep enough to take a goddess down to the deepest of the shades? At these words, covering her head in a blue and green veil and moaning bitterly, the goddess plunged into the depths of her own river. Aeneas kept pressing his pursuit with his huge spear flashing as long as a tree. And these were the words he spoke in his anger. What is the delay now? Why are you still shirking, Turnus? This is not a race. It is a fight with dangerous weapons at close quarters. Turn yourself into any shape you like. Scrape together all your resources of spirit and skill. Pray to sprout wings and fly to the stars of heaven, or shut yourself up and hide in a hole in the ground. Turnus replied, shaking his head. You are fierce, Aeneas, but wild words do not frighten me. It is the gods that cause me to fear, the gods and the enmity of Jupiter. He said no more, but looked round and saw a huge rock, a huge an ancient rock which happened to be lying on the plain. A boundary stone put there to settle a dispute about land. Twelve men like those the earth now produces could scarcely lift it up onto their shoulders. But he caught it up in his trembling hands and, raising to his full height and running at speed, he hurled it at his enemy. But he had no sense of running or going, of lifting or moving the huge rock. His knees gave way. His blood chilled and froze, and the stone rolled away under its own impetus over the open ground between them. But it did not go the whole way, and it did not strike its target. Just as when we are asleep, when in the weariness of the night rest lies heavy on our eyes, we dreamed we are trying desperately to run further and not succeeding till we fall exhausted in the middle of our efforts. The tongue is useless. The strength we know we have fails our body. We have no voice, no words to obey our will. So it was with Turnus. Wherever his courage sought away, the dread goddess barred his progress. Turning these moments, the thoughts whirled in his brain. He gazed at the Rutilians and the city. He faltered with fear. He began to tremble at the death that was upon him. He could see nowhere to run, no way to come at his enemy, no chariot anywhere no sister to drive it. As he faltered, the deadly spear of Aeneas flashed. His eyes had picked the spot and he threw from long range with all his weight behind the throw. Stones hurled by siege artillery never roar like this. The crash of the bursting thunderbolt is not so loud. Like a dark whirlwind, it flew carrying death and destruction with it piercing the outer rings of the sevenfold shield and laying open the lower rim of the breastplate. It went whistling through the middle of the thigh. When the blow struck, down went great Turnus, bending his knee to the ground. The Rutilians rose with a groan which echoed round the whole mountain 
and far and wide the high forest sent back the sound of their voices. He lowered his eyes and stretched out his right hand to beg as a suppliant. I have brought this upon myself, he said, and for myself I ask nothing. Make use of what fortune has given you, but if any thought of my unhappy father can touch you, I beg of you. And you too had such a father in Anchises. Take pity on the old age of Donus and give me back to my people, or if you prefer it, give them back my dead body. You have defeated me, and the men of Alcinea have seen me defeated and stretching out my hand to you. Lavinia is yours. Do not carry your hatred any further. There stood Aeneas, deadly in his armor, rolling his eyes, but he checked his hands, hesitating more and more as the words of Turnus began to move him, when suddenly his eyes caught the fatal baldric of the boy Pallas high on Turnus' shoulder with the glittering studs he knew so well. Turnus had defeated and wounded him and then killed him. Now he was wearing his belt on his shoulder as a battle honor taken from an enemy. Aeneas feasted his eyes on the sight of this spoil, this reminder of his own wild grief. Then, burning with mad passion and terrible in his wrath, he cried, Are you to escape me now, wearing the spoil stripped from the body of those I loved? By this wound which I now give, it is Pallas who makes sacrifice of you. It is Pallas who exacts the penalty in your guilty blood. Blazing with rage, he plunged the steel full into his enemy's breast. The limbs of Turnus were dissolved and cold, and his life left him with a groan, fleeing in anger down to the shades. <laughs>